distinguished guests, respected excellencies, dear ladies and gentlemen, it is my great pleasure to wish you a warm welcome to Skopje, to Balkan Economic Forum 2022, the first high-level conference of the Balkans, which is organized with the purpose of creating a more sustainable impact on the promotion of economic growth, regional, regional collaboration, peace and security throughout the Balkan countries. Balkan Economic Forum 2022 organizing committee is confident that by the end of this day, the audience shall significantly contribute to the meeting goal, which is to discuss and debate on issues related with the biggest economic challenges that need to be dealt with and overcome. It is my pleasure to see here today respectable leaders from the Balkans and around the globe, academics, students, and other prominent figures from the public and the private sector. Being honored and privileged to host you today, I have the pleasure to invite you to give your attention to Mr. Konstantin Alexander, President Emeritus of the Balkan Economic Forum. He will address us online. Mr. Konstantin Alexander, the floor is yours. Uh, you can start. Greetings from Skopje. You are on the screen. Okay. Dear guests, thank you for your patience. Just in a second, we are starting with Mr. Alexander. In order to spend your time, dear guests, we will have uh, Mr. Konstantin Alexander's speech a little bit later. Now I have the pleasure of inviting Mr. Sasha Kyosev, PhD President of the Balkan Economic Forum, to wish you a warm welcome. Welcome, Mr. Kyosev, please. Dear Prime Minister Kovacevsky, dear Deputy Prime Minister Fatmir Bitic, dear Madam Shuica, Vice President of the European Commission, dear Mr. Varhelei, EU Commissioner for Enlargement and Neighborhood Policy, dear Ambassador Gier, dear Austrian Ambassador Vucas, dear supporters, dear knowledge science partners, dear sponsors, dear guests, colleagues and friends, ladies and gentlemen. I must admit, I must confess, I am really happy seeing in this hall an impressive number of people who are interested in taking part, active part, in the first Balkan Economic Forum 2022. The Association for Regional Development Balkan Economic Forum operates with an inclusive approach that respects universal human rights and recognizes the potential of every individual 
to actively contribute to the achievement of tangible economic development for the social welfare of the Balkan region. With our advisory board members from each and every Balkan country, Balkan Economic Forum focuses, uh, our focus is on the development and implementation of innovative solutions and strategies to the current economic challenges facing the Balkan countries in order to stimulate, to stimulate economic growth, which in turn strengthens regional cooperation, peace and security. Our ultimate goal is the Balkan Economic Forum to become a regional platform where leaders from the Balkans and around the globe will gather together and share ideas and suggestions about the biggest economic, economic challenges requiring to be addressed and overcome in the Balkan region. We are pretty much sure that together we can build a brighter future for the Balkan region. I wish you a productive work supporting the creation and implementation of innovative strategies and effective solutions to the current socioeconomic and environmental difficulties faced by the Balkan countries. I really do believe that at the end of the day, we will have plenty of uh, useful suggestions that can be used, that can be used and implemented by our political lead leaders in the Balkan region. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Mr. Joseph. Now, if we fix the problem with the Mr. Konstantin Alexander, can we hear his speech? Please, attention. You can start. Yeah. Good morning. I'm delighted to welcome you to the Balkan Economic Forum 2022 conference. I founded this nonprofit organization in 2014 for the purpose of bringing together some of the most talented and motivated individuals from government, industry, and academia in the Balkan countries. The Balkan Economic Forum members represent the very essence of what the Irish poet William Butler Yeats described more than a century ago when he said, in dreams begin responsibilities. Every one of our members represents organizations and institutions that are making enormous contributions to the development of our economies, the protection of our natural resources on which our economies depend, and the ever widening Balkan business network. My dream envisions a Balkan peninsula with good governance, responsible economic growth, sustainable employment, environmentally sustainable development, regional cooperation, and widening educational opportunities. To achieve these goals, the pathway to the future is sustainable development for our region. It offers a framework to generate economic growth, achieve social justice, exercise environmental stewardship, and strengthen accountability. Since the first Balkan Economic Forum conference, all Balkan states have made significant strides towards achieving this goal. But just as our economies look to growth recovery beyond the pandemic, a new set of challenges confronted the region. Output for the Balkans as a whole has now surpassed pre-pandemic levels, but the response to COVID-19 has resulted in higher public debt and has left lasting scars. The war in Ukraine is sending shockwaves across the region, particularly through higher energy and food prices, but also via disruption to trade and investment flows, putting the region's recovery at risk. As central banks struggle to control inflation, the Eastern Mediterranean is once again filled with provocative language as a regional superpower is trying to flex its muscle and dominate the geopolitical field. It's not long ago that our region was associated with vulnerability and political upheaval. We proved to the world that out of our vulnerabilities came our strength to commit to peace and commit to a united future within the political and institutional framework of the European Union the future couldn't really look brighter than it does right now. 
Our organization represents the opportunity for a wonderful voyage of discovery, as together we uncover the riches of our region and are strengthened by our differences as well as what binds us together as a people in one of the most diverse regions of Europe. We are all driven by the same dreams and aspirations. And what began here as a dream evolved into reality as our organization became infused with a collective energy from which sprang new ideas. In this voyage, I have been blessed in making new friends and deriving inspiration from some incredible minds that share our vision and our hopes. Professor Sasha Tozer is one of these people. At the end of my tenure, Professor Tozer was elected as our new president with the enthusiastic support of our board of directors. We are very proud of his work and vision for our organization. And we know that with the support of every member, the Balkan Economic Forum will maintain its elevated position as a forum of intellectual minds. Together, we can collaborate toward an even brighter future, as long as we remain mindful of history, which has shown us that there will be no future if we remain divided. We are all made of the same clay, spirit and dreams, and now we can all work for our common future. Regional exchange can be a source of growth and development and of enhancing good governance. An old African proverb says, if you want to go fast, go alone, but if you want to go far, go together. What started as a dream a few years ago, today celebrates a second gathering of motivated individuals committed to the sustainable economic development of the Balkan nations. This movement will succeed for those who embrace it and become part of it. We live in the most culturally diverse and naturally gifted part of Europe. Our strength lies in our diversity and in our determination to be part of the European family of democratic nations. It's a great honor for me to declare this Balkan Economic Forum open. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Alexander, who is the President Emeritus of the Balkan Economic Forum. Now it's, it's my pleasure to invite you to give your attention to Mr. Nicolas Kiriakidas, PhD President of Cyprus Forum, who is also going to address us via the digital screen. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, fellow speakers, and distinguished guests of the Balkan Economic Forum. It is with great pleasure to finally see this initiative being launched. The aim was to create an annual event taking place in a different Balkan country every year, where policy issues are discussed between policymakers, technocrats, academics, active citizens, and the media. I am hopeful that in the coming years, this forum will become a point of reference for policymaking in the Balkans and Eastern Europe in general, and will have a significant positive impact. I would like to, con to congratulate my colleague, Sasha Kozev and his team for taking the lead to organize such an outstanding conference. We had started our own initiative, the Cyprus Forum, three years ago, and Sasha approached me to co-organize something in a similar style for the Balkans building on the work that Sasha and his team have been doing in the previous years. And I'm very glad that he did, because for us, it's the first international initiative that we officially support. I believe that we're building up together on our common efforts to put positive pressure on policymakers, as well as government bodies, in order to see a positive change towards a more transparent and participatory democracy. In Cyprus, we have been working on various projects apart from the Cyprus Forum, which, by the way, is the largest policymaking conference in the country. We have launched an online parliamentary observatory called NOMO Platform to push towards open parliament. We're also working towards transparent lobbying, effective public consultations, and new petitions. We believe that this ecosystem of tools can eventually fix democracy and create more qualitative and timely legislation. 
we, not merely as active citizens of our home countries, but of Europe and the world, should unite through conference diplomacy and discuss sustainable and effective solutions to the pre predominant global issues like security and peace, socioeconomic stability, protection of natural resources, and public health. Although we encountered different challenges, both on a social and economic level in the last years, I trust that we can look to the future with cautious optimism if we choose to work together to rebuild the future we wish to live in. I wish everyone a constructive day of discussions and networking. As Cyprus Forum, we shall continue working with the Balkan Economic Forum team for a brighter future. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kyriakidas. United in diversity is well-known motto of the European Union. Today, we also have the pleasure of having the presence of EU officials who come from several EU institutions. What follows next are the official addresses of Ms. Dubravka Shuica, Vice President of the European Commission, and Mr. Oliver Varhey, European Commissioner for Neighborhood and Enlargement. Dear ladies and gentlemen, I am particularly pleased to greet you at this first annual Balkan Economic Forum. Thank you very much for the invitation to join you today. I'm sorry I cannot be with you in person. I hope to join you on another occasion. As European Commission Vice President for Democracy and Demography, I am pleased to introduce some of the most important achievements in this portfolio since the beginning of my mandate. Bearing in mind that this is the first time that a portfolio on democracy and demography exists at the European Union level. In our approach to democracy and demography, we are not lacking in challenges nor in the ambition to tackle them. Democracy and demography do not exist in a vacuum. They are cross-cutting and complementary. And my task is to strengthen the links between people and the democratic institutions that serve them, to narrow the gap between expectations and reality. We must find different ways to get to know our citizens better and to establish trust, to foster solidarity. If we gather information, observe the trends and analyze the impacts of demographic change carefully, we can make a real difference in the kind of policy that we present and the manner in which we implement it, notably by giving appropriate weight to those factors at all levels, local, regional, national, and European. A key part of my work has been the Conference on the Future of Europe. Deliberations on the future of the European Union took place across borders, generations, and languages, across cultures and histories, with citizens at the very heart of the conference process. And I was pleased that we could also listen to the voice of the Western Balkans in this process. We face the same generation-defining challenges, be it on climate, economy, or on social policy. The conference has delivered concrete proposals. The Commission is responding directly to citizens' calls. Our communication of June this year is one of several responses to citizens' proposals. Inspired by the conference, European citizens' panels are becoming a permanent part of the way we make policy to make recommendations before we present key proposals. The first panel will address the issue of food waste. We are currently recruiting citizens through random selection inspired by the methodology that we used in the conference. Next year's Commission work program is driven by the outcome of the conference, and 35 out of 43 initiatives are linked to the conference final report. We are also organizing together with the European Parliament and the Council a feedback event on the 2nd of December. Dear ladies and gentlemen, my work covers the whole life cycle. The 2020 report on the impact of demographic change laid the foundations of our work on the Green Paper on Aging for the ongoing long-term vision for rural areas and our upcoming communication on harnessing talent in Europe's regions. Since the launch of the report, we have faced many new challenges. It is time for an update, which we plan to publish in early next year. 
We must address the megatrend of aging that is impacting our entire continent. An aging population and a decreasing working age population has significant consequences for our society and for our economy. To build on the debate launched under the Green Paper on Aging, we adopted in September a European care strategy. It sets an agenda for care services that have people at their heart, both those needing care and those providing care. The aim is to meet current and future needs for care while also improving their quality, affordability and accessibility. At the other end of the life cycle, we work to ensure an effective protection of children's rights across the European Union. In March last year, we adopted the first ever comprehensive strategy on the rights of the child in order to strengthen the protection and the promotion of children's rights at the European Union level. At the same time, the European Commission launched the European Child Guarantee to promote equal opportunities by guaranteeing access to a set of key services for children in need. Over half of the Member States have now submitted national plans to do this. Last month, on the 4th of October, the European Union launched its first ever Youth Action Plan in European Union External Action. With this initiative, we want to ensure that children and young people living in our partner countries are also involved in shaping the European Union's international partnerships. I am also particularly pleased to say that I am a member of college with the highest number of women ever. Through this example, the European Commission points to the paramount importance of women's participation in politics, in public debates and in decision-making. Since the beginning of my, my mandate, this European Commission has been working intensively on equality. We have adopted the European Union Gender Equality Strategy in March 2020. I always seek to give prominence to this in all my work. For instance, half of the composition of the conference panels were women. And the care strategy was very much centered on the fact that women bear a disproportionate burden in care responsibilities. Dear ladies and gentlemen, we are witnessing a new momentum in European Union enlargement policy. First, the application from Ukraine, Georgia and Moldova in the context of Russia's unprovoked and unjustified invasion of Ukraine send a clear message that these states have made a deliberate choice. Secondly, the European Union's response to these applications shows that the European Union assumes its responsibility and proves the central role that the European Union plays in ensuring peace and stability on our continent. There have been significant steps in the past months. In July this year, the first intergovernmental conference with North Macedonia was a historic moment. This was a clear recognition of the enduring commitment, reform achievements and resilience of the country in moving forward on their European Union path. And President von der Leyen stated in her State of the Union speech in September that the Western Balkans is part of our family. The Western Balkans' future is an integral part of the European Union's future. And thank you, and I wish you every success today. Dear participants, I welcome the opportunity to address you today at the first annual Balkan Economic Forum 2022. And I hope more will follow, because our common aim is to bring the region into the European Union, to speed up the real integration of the Western Balkans. To put it simply, our common aim is to bring growth and jobs to the region at a much faster and larger scale. To reach this goal, this Commission supports the region's economic integration, and in parallel, we help our partners to strengthen and progress in the areas of rule of law, public finance management, and public administration reforms. The Western Balkans belong to the European Union, and it is already part of our family. We saw the latest demonstration of this support just two weeks ago at the Berlin Process Summit. You could also see how we stand in solidarity with our Western Balkan partners as they deal with the consequences of Russia's war against Ukraine 
especially when it comes to its impact on the energy supply and prices. Our latest commitment is that the EU will provide the region with 1 billion euros of energy support package. Since there is a clear need for immediate support to address the impact of high energy prices for citizens and businesses of the Western Balkans, we will provide you with 500 million euros in budget support. We are also looking to boost the longer term resilience of the Western Balkans. Thus, we will also provide a further half a billion euros in grants for investments in the short and medium term to support the energy transition and independence. We are boosting gas and electricity interconnectors, including LNG terminals, and supporting the construction of renewable energy projects, upgrading energy transmission systems, district heating, and systems for energy efficiency for the old blocks of flats. In Berlin, we also saw a breakthrough concerning the common regional market where leaders of the Western Balkans signed three agreements facilitating travel, study and work across the region. These agreements are a significant part of boosting the economy and opening up new opportunities for growth and jobs. The success of the region's economic integration will also speed up the implementation of our dedicated 30 billion euros economic and investment plan for the Western Balkans. We launched the economic and investment plan two years ago. Since then, we endorsed 24 flagship projects with a total investment value of 3.4 billion euros. These projects speed up the reduction of the apparent socio-economic gap between the EU and the region. And they are key to improve transport, digital and energy connectivity and security of the Western Balkans. Today, we are committed to accelerate implementation of these projects on energy independence, energy efficiency and energy transition. In the past year alone, for example, six renewable energy projects were approved for financing. These investments will push the region forward. Dear participants, you can count on our commitment and support to the Western Balkans. And I'm sure this forum will also bring many new business ideas on the way forward for the region. I wish you fruitful discussions. Special thanks to Ms. Schwitza and Mr. Varhey. In this official opening ceremony, we are also honored to hear His Excellency, Dr. Georg Vutsas, Austrian Ambassador to Republic of Macedonia. Your Excellency, please take the floor. Good morning. Does it work? Yeah. Good morning, um, Commissioners Schwitzer and Varheli, Deputy Prime Minister Vitici, Excellencies, Presidents of the Balkan Economic Forum and the Cyprus Forum, distinguished guests present here and online. I need to be brief. We are already uh, a bit uh, behind schedule. Um, Definitely, the Balkans is on the move. The start of accession negotiations with Albania and North Macedonia brings new momentum for the entire region. The Berlin process has been reactivated. New forms of regional cooperation are emerging, not least under the pressure of migration. The point is, that the countries in the Balkans need to move closer together, regardless of where they are in the integration process. Let's not forget that even member states of the European Union, like Croatia, Bulgaria and Romania, have not yet completed the EU integration process, if I just remind you of Schengen and Eurozones. The crisis of recent years have subjected our national economies to a stress test. One lesson learned was and is that we are stronger together. 
I am therefore pleased that the Balkan Economic Forum by itself has set such goal of cooperation in the field of economy and that Austria may support of what I hope a series of Balkan economic fora to support this launch and not least through the participation of experts from Austria. I wish all participants a successful day with plenty of new and innovative ideas and visions and above all, very fruitful networking. May the forum make a substantial and lasting contribution to a brighter future for us all in the Balkans and in all of Europe. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ambassador Wutsas. What gives the first Balkan Economic Forum conference a true added value are its speakers and also official supporters. Namely, uh, this year conference is organized under the auspices of the government of the Republic of Macedonia. It is my pleasure to welcome Mr. Fatmir Bitici, Deputy Prime Minister in charge of economic affairs. Mr. Deputy Prime Minister, you are welcome to address the forum audience. Dear organizers from the Balkan Economic Forum, Your Excellencies, respected guests, it's an honor to be at opening this first Balkan Economic Forum here in Skopje. And to set the tone that uh, I will address the topic on this forum for a brighter future, we need unity collaboration, and straightening our competitiveness. The future belongs to us all, and it can and will be bright if we go forward together. In these unprecedented con conditions, we have an extraordinary possibility to jointly discuss the vision of, for our region in the following years. And we have to, the resilience to do something together. The past three years, proved that the region can articulate its needs, show ownership and demonstrate will to work for the benefits of all citizens, even through crisis, as we had or still have. I like to think of the crisis we are going through as a challenge instead of a problem. And I think this makes a big difference because a problem seeks conflict and a challenge seeks partnership and collaboration. And that is exactly how we can turn towards real recovery. Working together creates countless opportunities. Instead of being each other's competitors, we can be partners. We can create a stronger market by joining our forces, which will lead to greater innovation, digitalization, and more investments. We are entering a new stage of economic growth and of our econo regional economic cooperation. On one hand, the EU accession process requires very solid preparation for our future participation in the EU single market. The Berlin process, as the other regional initiatives, has succeeded in moving Western Balkans in the right direction and the full integration of the Western Balkans into the EU should be a natural outcome of the reform path of the region. While facing these challenging times, we have shown that we are working together with all efforts to make the common regional market a reality in the context of preparing opportunities for bringing the whole region closer to the EU internal market. In this context, by setting out a frame and through defining concrete activities across all areas of the European Union for freedoms that are crucial for the improvements of the life of our citizens because they produce tangible results. They simplify the administrative procedures for entry, transit, and short stay within the Western Balkans using only ID cards, whereas they also contribute to a closer and better connected region. 
We are ensuring equal treatment of all citizens in the whole region and strengthening people-to-people -people relations. Our commitment to regional cooperation is a result of the jointly recognized interest, fostering our further dedication for increasing the attractiveness of the region for foreign investors. We have a solid base to use the huge potential of the region. There is a window for, of opportunity opening for our region in this post-COVID recovery period, and that is capitalizing on the full potential of nearshoring that has shown to be a necessity that surfaced in the face of the pandemics. When the far-reached international suppliers have failed to deliver, what has become obvious more than ever is the opportunity that lies in regional value chains that can generate prosperity and economical stability and growth for the Western Balkans, considering the closeness of our market to the big European market. Our potential and a chance for a bright future lies here. We should work together towards strengthening the supply chain that will build our regional competitiveness on a regional level, but as well increase our export and with that our national economies. As we work towards common regional market, a stepping stone towards the European Union single market, that will strengthen our economic integration, I took the initiative for creating a unique FDI subsidies program for Western Balkan 6, but as well creating strong regional value chain, which will enhance our competitiveness far more than any of us can do it individually. As yesterday I said in Belgrade, in one of the conferences for energy crisis, it is time to regionally overcome the energy crisis with sending out the message that it is not the time to create new dependencies, but instead create interdependencies. Regional competitiveness over regional competition. This, I believe, is our future. Through regional competitiveness, instead of regional competition, we can come out stronger and better. We are Europe. The whole Western Balkan 6 is Europe. And I strongly believe that if we talk together, we will work stronger and better. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Prime Minister Bitiki. After this opening session, the Balkan Economic Forum 2022 is ready to start to roll out through the day. The first panel that I would like to announce is titled Regional Economic Cooperation, Myth or Reality? I would like to invite the moderator of this panel, Dr. Rilind Kabashi, economist from Joint Vienna Institute, and the speakers to take their places on the stage. Mr. Kabashi will tell us some more dates about the key speakers in the following panel. Dear guests, uh, uh, dear Deputy Prime Minister, dear Ambassadors, uh, Deputy Governors, all of you joining us uh, physically or online, welcome to the first uh, panel of the Balkan Economic Forum, um, which will focus on regional economic cooperation, myth or uh, reality. Um, for about a quarter of a century now, we've had a proliferation of different kinds of regional cooperation and integration uh, forums and initiatives. Uh, we have the CEFTA, we have the Central European Initiative, uh, we have the Southeast European Cooperation Process, Regional Cooperation Council, uh, the Berlin Process, and more recently the Open uh, Balkans. 
So is this all a proof that Western Balkan countries are really, and their EU partners are really committed to enhanced cooperation on the way to EU integration? How effective has it been? Are we achieving more and deeper, meaningful uh, uh, cooperation? Or are we actually putting form ahead of um, substance? Today we have an excellent uh, group of five panelists with very diverse uh, backgrounds and very diverse responsibilities to tackle uh, these issues. And before I give uh, the floor, uh, uh, just a kind uh, request to keep uh, your interventions within maximum uh, 10 minutes so that we, um, we are in line with the agenda and we also allow some time for Q&A uh, in the end. So first I would like, uh, in, uh, in line with the agenda, I would like to give the floor to Mr. Uh, Emir Dikic, uh, Director of the CEFTA Secretariat, to take the floor. Please, Mr. Dikic. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much. Uh, it's always easier to be the, fir the first speaker, so I'm sorry if I'm gonna say something which you other people plan to say, but that's the will of the sort uh, of this morning, I mean, when, I, when, I, when we received the invitation and the title of the panel with, with, with regional cooperation, a myth, or trust. And we are living here since 2005, six, seven, without tariffs as an integrated market where the free trade agreement eliminated all the tariffs, including the agricultural product in 2010. So basically, it's not the myth, we are living it. We have the diagonal accumulation, then the, uh, then the accumulation become the PEM, offering to our businesses a lot of uh, things to do. And then it's confirmed by the figures. Basically, Visa Zeta has brought from 74% to 125%, depending on the CEFTA party, increase in GDP by the integration. But this is the basic integration. What we are discussing and where the title of the panel is very good is how deep we are ready to go. 15 years after the establishment of CEFTA in Visegrad, most of the original parties, all of the original parties, were members of the EU. But the situation changed. The situation is changing heavily. Uh, if, if we count the crisis which we had uh, since 2008 till now, we would have a crisis each two or three years. And basically one of the things which is specifically, I don't, I, will, I don't want to say good in the region, is basically that the crises are the ones who are fostering the uh, regional integration. Because each economy cannot <laughs> cannot respond itself to the crisis. If you see the start of the pandemic and the closure of the markets and everything in, the, in Europe and as well as the Western Balkans, our six Western Balkans uh, parties have established the green lanes and green corridors in, the, in a month. If the situation would, would be without the crisis, I think we would still be negotiating those things. But the crisis, has motivated the parties to start and to work. And in the months, we had everything from the idea to the implementation on the field to enable the first necessity products to arrive to all of the markets of the Western Balkans. And to be, to be, to be, huh, to be more concrete, we did it faster and better than the European Union did it itself. Now, the, the topic of the green and corridors which are established in all the Western Balkans, six, are extending to the European Union. And this is one of the first topics which, where we are testing the European Union for the, the willingness to accede to the single market if we fulfill the conditions in our markets. And this is the way to go as, as we can hear it, as all of us know that uh, in the near future, we will not become the members of the EU, uh, full-fledged members, but we would need the access to the markets. What else happened in the last couple of years since the pandemics? The region has oriented more and more 
towards e-commerce. And I think there was a conference last week or uh, two weeks ago in Skopje related to the to the e-commerce. And we are working a lot on the regional level on the establishing the practice. At the moment, if I want to buy a product from Bosnia, from Macedonia to Bosnia, especially if it's a product which is small and smaller value, I would pay it double or triple the price due to the transactions cost, transport cost, customs, and postal cost. That is not viable. At the moment, we are waiting and we are hoping that on the CEFTA week, uh, the 9th of December this, uh, this year, our party is going to adopt this decision which will enable the reduction of different costs that are, uh, that are applied. Uh, to the e-commerce in between the region. We have a new crisis in front of us. You see the fog this morning, the, the weather became a bit colder and you immediately have the fog, energy prices booming and there is no way that each of our economy can overcome this crisis alone. It, we have to be incorporated into the programs. We have to make regional programs, as Mr. Mitici said, and to uh, be incorporated in the EU programs, which is, uh, which is mentioned this morning, and uh, basically that this will help us overcome the crisis. But what is the main problem of the integration? Is the genuine political will, as the first one I would emphasize, do we really want to incorporate as a region? Do we, can we forget our political, uh, uh, small political battles and enable the economic operators to grow, not only on the regional level, but uh, on, the level of the, uh, on the level of the European value chains as well? Uh, we have the example, uh, I think the Deputy Prime Minister mentioned the near shoring. There are several, several examples of, uh, of, of factories which were moved due to the war of Ukraine to the region. But they need, they need to have their markets closer by, not only the regional market, but the European market as well. And it's very good. I can produce a product, I can supply the product, but then in this region, my truck is traveling 200 kilometers and then it's stopped on the border and it's waiting for a couple of hours. Then another 200 kilometers and then another border. And then another waiting of a couple of hours until you come at the end on the EU border where you wait not a couple of hours, but more than a couple of hours each, the economic operator will know it uh, 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 in, uh, by heart. Those are the things that we are doing in CEFTA at the moment, trying to facilitate the trade, trying to digitalize the trade between the parties. So basically, to have the, the, all the certificates digitally sent in advance to the uh, BCP CCPs in order that the customs and the relevant agencies, veterinaries or phytosanitaries, depending on the product, can do the risk assessment up front the, the coming of the truck and then letting the truck pass it by. I mean, I'm referring to the truck because 70% uh, of our trade, sadly, is still going by trucks. And uh, the study of the World Bank said a couple of years ago that the waiting on the, of the trucks is costing the economic operators on a yearly basis within the, within the Western Balkan region about 26 million, 26 million dollars. And this is all transferred to competitiveness of our economic operators on the European markets. So speedy, speedy delivery, cost and quality are the three things. Regional integration can help with all of those. And the one thing on the regional integrations which is very important is that our political goal of all the Western Balkans is to join the EU. If we want to join the EU, we have to, not only if we want to join the EU, but we all have signed the SAAs. According to them, we all have to implement all the legislation in accordance with the European acquis and to manage the procedures in accordance with the European procedures, because most of us uh, have a very big 
gap between the adoption and the implementation of the legislation. On the regional level, it's much easier. On the regional level, it represents a huger market, huger block, and better negotiation positions towards the EU. And those are the things we need to focus in order to fully take the benefits of the, of the regional integrations, which mostly at the moment we have uh, in the paper, but heavily waiting that uh, it comes to the field. Thank you very much. And of course, I would, I would love to answer the questions it's because if I go into the details about what CEFTA is doing, uh, we could spend here two hours and they, they won't give me two hours. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Jikic. Maybe we leave the questions for the end uh, after, after all panelists have, uh, have made their contributions. Uh, so now um, uh, we have uh, Ms. Susanna Kirali, uh, Deputy Secretary General of the Central European Initiative, who is uh, joining us online. So please. Uh... Thank you so much, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests. I wish to start by thanking the organizers of the Balkan Economic Forum for their kind invitation, as well as for putting together such an interesting program. I would like to introduce the Central European Initiative and its mission and uh, emphasize the importance of regional cooperation, especially in the current situation, because there is a war in our vicinity. As you might know, the membership of the CEI uh, covers a broad portion of Central, Eastern and Southeastern Europe, and uh, this broad area, extending from the Baltic to the Adriatic Ionian and the Black Seas, comprises both. EU and non-EU countries. And uh, I think this mixed composition represents an added value of our organization. The know-how transfer and the sharing of experiences between EU and non-EU countries is one of the key features of CEI-led cooperation. With uh, 17 participating countries, in fact, currently 16, because Belarus has been suspended of its rights of representation, the CEI is the largest intergovernmental organization for regional cooperation in Europe. Moreover, with the recent granting of EU candidate status to Ukraine and Moldova, and with the hope that also Bosnia and Herzegovina will follow them soon, all CEI non-EU countries are now part of the EU accession process. A new geopolitical scenario is therefore emerging in Europe with uh, more homogeneous and uh, consolidated countries uh, sharing the same European perspective. While uh, this is certainly a positive evolution, uh, we are all aware of the challenges and uh, difficulties that are and will be in front of us. Of course, our first concern is with Ukraine and its citizens. Ukraine is our member state since 1996, so I uh, will look at the dramatic situation in Ukraine with great concern, and uh, our immediate reaction was then to provide humanitarian aid to the people on the ground by partnering with the International Committee of the Red Cross. Meanwhile, our member states took the unanimous decision to suspend Belarus of its rights of representation in the Central European Initiative as a consequence of the country's actions in support of the aggression against Ukraine. In parallel to these decisions, the Central European Initiative Executive Secretariat elaborated specific actions in response to the humanitarian crisis. Among these, uh, we contributed to the setup of a field hospital in the southern part of Ukraine in collaboration with two NGOs, one from Italy and one from Ukraine. We provided direct support to 400 vulnerable beneficiaries in the eastern regions of Kharkiv, Sumy and Poltava. And we contributed to a pilot project allowing displaced Ukrainian students to continue their studies in Poland. While humanitarian and security issues are the most urgent on our agendas, uh, also economic recovery requires cooperation across the borders. 
we think it's very important to focus on small and medium enterprises as uh, strategic players in the economic recovery of Europe. Our multilateral platform and uh, tools for regional cooperation uh, can be of help to kickstart joint projects and activities addressing and involving SMEs, which, in my opinion, uh, shall represent the engine of the CEI economic dimension. If we look at the last 30 years in Europe, uh, we can only notice that countries have increased their investment in regional cooperation right after significant political crisis or geopolitical developments. Following the fall of the Berlin Wall, the first attempts to promote regional cooperation in Europe were made uh, with the main goal to re-establish relations along the east-west axis. Organizations like the Central European Initiative the Black Sea Economic Cooperation and the Council of Baltic Sea States were established during those years. It's, of course, uh, difficult to predict how much countries will invest in regional cooperation also now as a reaction to the ongoing crisis in Ukraine. But for sure, over the last years, these cooperative efforts on the regional scale have helped promote the EU and its values in countries like Ukraine, Moldova, and uh, outside the sea and membership, Georgia. Therefore, I do believe that the Central European Initiative's political mission, namely regional cooperation for European integration and sustainable development, is still valid and shall be pursued now with even more confidence. A very rooted platform for multilateral diplomacy, the CEI helps reinforce cohesion between and among EU members, accession countries, and Eastern neighbors. What's happening in Ukraine now uh, reminds us that democracy and peace are not to be taken for granted and uh, that we need to defend them through multilateralism and with the support of as many institutions and stakeholders as possible, starting from the citizens of our countries. I think in this dynamic framework, CEI-supported regional cooperation can make a valuable contribution to identify joint solutions, to common challenges, and strengthen the EU as a global player. I conclude my intervention by saying that I look forward to hearing the upcoming discussions and uh, I'm sure uh, that uh, they will provide useful inputs and ideas to build new initiatives and projects upon the outcomes of the Balkan Economic Forum. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Uh, Kirali. Um, next in the agenda is uh, Dr. Richard Gribeson, Deputy Director of the Vienna Institute for um, International Economic Studies. Please, Richard. Thank you. So, um, thank you for the, for the invite. It's, uh, it's a real pleasure to, to be here and um, present. Just in these 10 minutes, I will try to just give a flavor of some of the uh, research that we in our institute have been doing on this question of regional cooperation in, in the Western Balkans, past, present, and future from an economic sense. I mean, when I thought about addressing the question of, of the panel reality or myth, I think for me, I agree. I mean, the answer is clear. It's a reality. It, it exists. I mean, it's, it's not a myth, regional economic integration in this region. But it probably hasn't taken us as far as, as we hoped or as was hoped uh, uh, 20 years ago, and it's not enough. I think this is the key message. It exists. It has achieved something but it's not enough. I mean, when we look at the different initiatives, we've done different papers um, on this. If you look at SEFTA specifically, you can see a very tangible success of, of SEFTA in terms of regional economic integration. Just as, as an example, the, val the added value is there. SEFTA increased regional trade by about a third versus what would have happened uh, otherwise. So it's a, very, it's a very clear benefit. When you go country by country, though, you see a very different pattern. So if you take Serbia out of those results, Regional trade, because of SEFTA, increased by 70%. So much, much bigger impact for the five smaller economies of the region, much less for Serbia. And you see these different patterns over the last 20 years. 
many of the smaller economies of this region remain or have even increased the share of trade within the region. For Serbia, it's the opposite. Serbia's relative share of trade is much more outside of the region. So I think we also have to take this into account with the results. Yes, we see the benefit, we see the results, but it's not the same for, for all of the countries. And I think that also then has implications for, for the future. I think what we would also say, while we acknowledge we see regional cooperation, economic cooperation is a reality, it hasn't been enough to achieve a lot of what was hoped with the whole EU strategy 20 years ago, of which regional cooperation was a very big part. If we think about the economic convergence of the region, it hasn't been especially impressive, I would say. I mean, the region has converged with, with, with the EU average, but not especially quickly, and much more slowly than the EU member states of Central and Eastern Europe. And I think that is quite a disappointment. Not to say regional cooperation is at fault for that, but it hasn't been enough to, to, to overcome that. Secondly, in terms of the development of a regional market and the attraction of FDI and the integration of global value chains, which is a big part of the reason for it and what went so well in the original SEFTA, I mean, it was a huge success of the original SEFTA. Again, it hasn't been completely satisfactory, the, the results in this region. In terms of the, I mean, the region tracks a lot of FDI relative to its GDP, but to a, to a relatively low GDP in terms of the quality of projects, the volume of FDI, it's not in any way comparable to, to the original SEFTA country. So again, we can see the results, but they're not as impressive as maybe we would have, we would have, uh, we would have hoped for. Why it didn't deliver more? I mean, this is a big focus of, of our research. And I think, again, I would agree with what you said. I mean, if we think about the some of the political and institutional prerequisites for it to have gone further, they're not there, they haven't been there, and they probably are still not there. I won't go too deep into that because I'm, I'm an economist. But on the economic side, I think also the prerequisites often have not been there. Just in a very simple terms, just the market size. I mean, we're talking about a GDP collectively roughly equivalent to Slovakia. It's a bit more than 1% of EU GDP, Western Balkan 6 G EU GDP. So even with the most successful regional cooperation initiatives, even with everything going perfectly, I think we have to be realistic about the upside. That's not to say it's not positive, that's not to say there isn't an upside, but we have to be realistic about how much this can achieve in terms of economic development on its own without, uh, without other things uh, as well. And one thing that you see, if you look again at the Visegrad countries, their really deep integration happened after they joined the EU. So exactly in 2004, that's when regional integration in the Visegrad group really took off and the, the trade within that region grew much more quickly than its trade with the rest of the EU or, or anywhere else. So in a way we are looking for something in the Western Balkans before accession which really only happened in, in the Visegrad countries uh, after accession. So that's another reason I think to be, to be realistic about what we can achieve. In terms of the new initiatives, so we have Open Balkan, we have the Berlin process, the common regional market. I think it's clear, I mean, all regional integration initiatives are, are positive. Regional integration is important and it's anyway obligatory as part of the EU uh, accession process. But I think we come back again to the same question. What is the upside of this? How much can we expect from these initiatives uh, alone? And there I think one of the things that we always want to emphasize in our studies is that any regional cooperation push and any renewed push on regional cooperation, whatever the initiative, it needs to be accompanied by a deeper EU integration push, at least in an economic sense. And the two things will only work uh, if, if they go forward together. As was mentioned already, the region has a much longer accession process, I mean, almost 20 years now and counting in the case of North Macedonia than the countries that joined 2004. Uh, to 2013, and because of that, we need to think about much more, much deeper economic integration with the much bigger EU market on the way to accession. And that can be deepening advancement of the stabilization association agreements, thinking about the DCFDAs, for example, which in some ways go, go further. Big point, I think, which, which is always important to mention, would be more access to the EU budget for uh, this region. That was a huge driver of regional integration in the Visegrad countries. Obviously, this region has attracted, has been able to get much less uh, money from, 
from the EU, from the EU budget. I mean, if you look over the whole time, Lithuania since 2004 has had more than half of its GDP in, in net flows uh, from, from the EU budget. For this region, countries through the EPA funds, it's more like 10% or, or even less. So again, a huge, a huge, huge difference. And when we, when we think about nearshoring, and you know, we also have papers on that, and I think it is a possibility for the region and something to, to be cautiously optimistic about. All of this, the, the combination of deeper regional integration with a push towards more EU integration ahead of accession, more EU funds, more upgrading of infrastructure, more access to the EU market, that's how nearshoring will really work. Because at the moment, of course, the Visegrad countries are higher on the list when German companies are thinking about nearshoring. This region is, is, is further down the list, unfortunately, for, 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 uh, for that region. reason. Final point, Ukraine, I mean, it, I think it increases the, just the urgency uh, of, of, of all of this. Um, it will affect economically this region in a very particular way. Um, the region has, I think, a lot to lose economically from, from this war, as well as, as was mentioned, with nearshoring potentially to gain. And in terms of the overall economic development of this region, we, we, in the, especially now, we cannot afford more of the state, same in this kind of semi-stasis in, in the process. So I think the urgency is, is there now more than ever. So I leave it there and I, I, I look forward to the discussion. Thank you, thanks, uh, thanks a lot, uh, uh, Richard. Um, next, according to the agenda, is Professor uh, Sandra Jednak uh, from the Faculty of Organizational Sciences in the University of uh, Belgrade. Sandra, please. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, I just want to thank you, thank you, Sasha, to ask me to uh, be here and to participate in this panel. So I'm coming from University of Belgrade, and I will just talk about something from academic side and report about Western Balkan. So when we talk about people, interaction and connectivity, people, uh, economy uh, and company and business, they are linked and uh, integrated more than uh, the, uh, uh, ever before. So those connections lead to innovation and economic progress. So for this region, this region, regional cooperation, integration is most important for us, country, uh, Western, Western Balkan, Sixth uh, Western Balkan, and also European Union integration, because the aim of this con those country is to become a member. We can't forget that the beginning of those country is not easy, so the base is not, um, not so easy, so that they have to go to, from the planning economy to market economy, provide the transition and carry out the uh, 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 carry out economic reform and also to fulfill criteria for uh, criteria if to become European Union. So the, um, uh, that beginning also that we have the legacy of 19 when we have. Um, uh, military conflict, also sanctions uh, and uh, bombings, so that all uh, uh, have consequences to this uh, part uh, of uh, Europe uh, progress slowly than other Central European country. Even though uh, this country succeeds to be candidate country, four country of West Balkan six uh, are <coughs> candidate country European Union and two are uh, potential candidate, uh, candidates of the European Union. However, we must admit that um, and emphasize that European Union has always support and gets an initiative uh, in the past uh, 20 years. So they begin with the stability pacts for Southeast Europe, stabilization and association process, where in from the 2001 till 2008 and, and nine, uh, all country of this region uh, sign agreement of stabilization and association. After that, in 2001, they became member of CEFTA, 2006, where they have free movement of trade, uh, trade liberalization, particularly in industry and agriculture product. Uh, after in 2000, 2008, we get uh, a regional council, cooperation council, and uh, now for most important is the 2040, the Berlin process uh, initiative by the government, Germany government, where renewable interest in EU, West Balkan integration 
in uh, European Union. So the focus of that process, this is the series of meeting, uh, was uh, infrastructure development, business development, and young exchange, as well as science and reconciliation. So the West Balkan country obtained sustainable economic, economic ropes, writing <laughs> infrastructure, particularly transport and energy, and also uh, efficiency use for the EU pre free assistance uh, uh, association uh, fund. Further, there are also initiatives to establish outcome of the Berlin process is established regional economic area based on the trade investment, a labor market, digital integration, all what is very important for this region and regional cooperation. Uh, implementing CEFTA additional protocol, then uh, develop regional investment agency, labor mobility, qualify, uh, recognizing qualification of labor and mo mobility and digital integration, which is very, um, very actual now and focus in, in the most uh, country, probably in Serbia, we, we have focus on that because it's part of our strategy for development. So uh, there are synchronous digital strategy, uh, roaming free, uh, free region and improving broad uh, band infrastructure. In 2018, and there are also new strategy for West Balkan, uh, and it's based on social economic development, uh, digital agenda, transport and energy con connectivity, uh, and also good neighborhood uh, relation. Last initiative uh, from the European Union 2020 common regional market where the, this market, the regional market going toward the EU single market and this is the, the market about 20 million people. So it's, uh, it's uh, big and it is based on the free movement of force, freedom, capital, pe people, good service, good and services. Then we have a regional industry and innovation area investment area and digital area. However, we have some initiative from the country, three country, in, uh, Serbia, Macedonia and Albania and Mini Schengen. They established Mini Schengen and Open Balkan. Three country of West Balkan didn't join this initiative. Uh, even the, there is uh, 12 million people there and big area because they don't they they make a question about what is different between regional common market and open open Balkan. So some of the answer is that open Balkan have deeper integration and should the other uh, West Balkan six uh, three three uh, countries should uh, invest. So all this initiative support from the European Union make progress in the, those uh, economy is country, but uh, regional connectivity remain poor, mostly on political basis, because we have unbilatory, uh, uh, bilatory unresolved uh, uh, relation. Also, we have some political instability and other, other, other facing problem. So even though uh, West Balkan six country uh, make some progress. So they have obtained, for example, they, they make all uh, trade liberalization, uh, privatize enterprise bank, they improve uh, um, business environment, but uh, and obtain the economic growth till the global economic crisis, uh, about 5%. Uh, uh, European Union has the most important trading partner for uh, this country and also because the West Balkan, can, West Balkan don't have enough capital so the foreign capital and foreign direct investment is uh, most important for development and obtaining economic growth for this part of uh, Europe. European Union was the, the main uh, source of foreign, foreign ca uh, capital. So the uh, economic today, current economic uh, uh, data is that uh, for this, uh, this year, they are estimate about economic growth for the West Balkan about 3.4%. Economic growth is based on the private uh, consumption and investment. Private consumption uh, is uh, uh, based on, on the private uh, uh, on the private credit and wage increase and remedies, while investment is mostly in infrastructure, uh, basically in mostly in energy sector in Bosnia, and on the accumulation inventory, which is on Serbia and uh, Macedonia. 
Esper, Expert Grow is also uh, uh, here uh, in Albania, Serbia and Montenegro. Employment, we have employment rise, about 46%, uh, but it's still low uh, comparing to European Union. Employment rate is also high, about 13% uh, 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 comparing to European Union. But for example, in October, uh, in Serbia, um, unemployment rate is less than 10%. So one of the factors is also not just slowly progress, but also immigration, which is a big issue for West, West, uh, West Balkan. Uh, inflation is now present everywhere. So in West Balkan also, it's at about 13% in Western Balkan. Uh, it's pushed about um, with uh, energy price and the food price. Energy price uh, is about 4% was a 4% in, uh, rise in the Albania till the 18% in, in Bosnia. But the biggest problem, bigger problem is the uh, rise of the food and introducing some, uh, some restriction about food in uh, about 20, 20 uh, countries. Also, this uh, country has a big external debt. Uh, we, for example, in Serbia, we had uh, last year 57 percent of GDP, now we have uh, 53 per percent, so this is also one of the current state in uh, West Balkan, West Balkan 6. So what is the challenges? Um, this is all small economy, so uh, because of that, the external influence is big of these economies, so post-COVID recovery is one of uh, this external environment which influence on the economic progress in West Balkan. Also Ukraine-Russian military conflict or war, inflation, which I said that um, was on energy price and food price, tight monetary policy, which uh, should reduce inflation, uh, then global supply change and slow act uh, economic activities in, in European Union, because European Union is the most um, dominant uh, influence factor in uh, economic progress uh, in this region. When we talk about the business, there are also some challenges about low productivity, uh, low access to finance and lack of the skills and competence. So what we say, what we can say that what is the main challenge and uh, problems at West Balkan, it's economic development, unemployment, uh, corruption and immigration, and the one uh, question is about European Union accession, because this question will to timeline and uh, implementation to, to become. Suggestions, um, I, I will finish. A suggestion is uh, that we can become the attractive investment destination, uh, to have a regional stability and to have a better education and other, to fulfill other initiatives which European Union uh, asks for us. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you. Thank you, Professor uh, Jednak. And uh, finally, I would like to ask uh, Ms. Tatiana Šterjova Duškovska, Secretary General of the Western Balkan 6 uh, Chamber Investment Forum, to give us her thoughts. Thank you, thank you. It is a pleasure to be part of this panel and to follow up on excellent points that have been brought out uh, during the discussions this morning. Uh, I would uh, take off from the topic uh, that is uh, the umbrella topic of, of this panel, uh, is it a myth or, or reality? And I would uh, agree with uh, the rest of the panelists, it's definitely not a myth because uh, we from the private sector, from the business associations, love to, to use the sentence that it has been the private sector, the, business, the businesses that have been opening the doors and pushing the cooperation even when uh, on bigger scale, especially on political level, things have been at uh, some points of halt. So it, we are definitely not speaking of a myth, but uh, is it the reality we want to see or is it the level of reality we, we were uh, thinking of uh, 10, 20 years ago? Definitely not, because uh, there uh, still is uh, many things that uh, need to be done in order to have the free flow of uh, goods, services, people and capital throughout the region. 
and this is a commitment or this is a reality that businesses which are beneficiaries or should be regarded as beneficiaries of this process along with the citizens from the West Balkans region uh, are uh, expecting to see accomplished and uh, achieved uh, any day sooner than, uh, than today. Um, what uh, I see as an issue that uh, we are having as, as open issue uh, is the, the problem of taking the lead in implementing uh, the regional economic agenda because um, what we are facing is the, the question of authorizations and endless processes of accepting and adopting and ratifications and then after we have the documents enacted we uh, get to the level of the real implementation of uh, achieving those benefits that are introduced in some documents on paper, uh, really achieving or reaching the businesses and the citizens working and living throughout the region on, on daily basis. So uh, the issue on, on the regional cooperation and the exports uh, has already been tackled by the economic leads in the panel. So uh, in interest of time, I wouldn't uh, get in details on the, those issues, but I would uh, concur on uh, the other point, and that is the, the new shoring potentials of the region, because apart from the exports, domestic consumption is uh, the other important aspect of uh, bringing the region closer uh, in economic terms to the European markets, and uh, that can be achieved on uh, doubling the approach uh, by attracting uh, foreign direct investments which bring higher added value. And this should be done um, in parallel to another process of continuously leveling up or, or upskilling the capacities of local companies uh, being able to uh, join the global supply chains and to be part of uh, the supply chains of uh, leading uh, multinational corporations because only in that manner we can achieve the full benefits of the processes of uh, regional uh, economic cooperation or the integration processes that uh, we have been discussing this morning. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, the businesses or the private sector have uh, undoubtedly been supporters of this, uh, these processes throughout the years and even pushing the, the regional economic agenda high on, on the top of priorities that need to be achieved. And I would uh, use uh, the opportunity this morning to briefly present some of the key findings of the report uh, we as Western Balkan Six Chamber Investment Forum uh, have been preparing. Uh, that is a report on the monitoring of the implementation of the Common Regional Market Action Plan, which is being done uh, in order to assess to what level uh, the policies or the measures that have been um, normatively regulated in some of the important uh, regional documents are really being implemented on field and the benefits they are intended to uh, be brought uh, are they really filled by the businesses in their daily operation by shortening the waiting times uh, they spent uh, on the border crossings, uh, by easing their procedure, by simply making it easier for them to do business uh, within the region. So um, the report will finally be published or officially be published next month. But some of the key findings that I would uh, stress out this morning are that uh, most of the companies uh, respond that uh, they do not see any changes regarding the, the shortening of the waiting times on the borders. They agree or uh, confirm that uh, progress has been made in the digitalization efforts uh, the SEFTA Secretariat is uh, supporting, but it is still not sufficient to uh, get to a point where we have less of 60 minutes waiting time at the border crossings. Uh, the other issue is uh, related to the removal of trade barriers that uh, have been uh, spotted or um, registered uh, throughout the six national economies from the Western Balkans region. 
uh, from our survey, it uh, resulted that 74% of the respondents uh, answered that uh, in the last year they have not um, noticed or do not have the impression that any of the trade barriers have been resolved or there has been any, any progress in, in the process of their elimination, although works have been uh, ongoing on field uh, throughout the year. Uh, what is um, maybe an encouraging result is that 77% uh, of the respondents have uh, answered that um, they have not noticed uh, new trade barriers being introduced. Meanwhile, from the last year we did the survey, which on another hand is a positive, uh, positive uh, outcome of the processes because at least we have stopped the practice of introducing new and new and new trade barriers which uh, we then spent years uh, struggling to, to remove or to uh, alleviate throughout the, the process. When it comes to the efforts of the state authorities on all levels in uh, providing support in eliminating uh, the, state, uh, the trade barriers or easing the intra-regional um, trade and uh, economic cooperation for the business entities uh, throughout the six Western Balkans economies. Uh, most of the respondents gave an average uh, score to the governments of three, that is on a scale of one to five. And uh, the most uh, satisfied, if I can call it that way, are the companies from the agriculture sector. Uh, whilst it is the companies from the uh, construction sector and services in general uh, which uh, gave the, the lowest, let's say, score on the state officials, uh, the governmental agencies in the efforts of easing the, the trade throughout the region. And one last point, because uh, I am aware that we are running out of time. Uh, it relates to the intermovability of workers throughout the region. Uh, Two-thirds of our respondents uh, stated they uh, never had the need to engage workers from any of the uh, remaining five uh, economies, which uh, in bottom line does not say that they do not need additional workforce, but that the burdens of, uh, that is administrative burdens, of uh, employing uh, workers from outside the national economy are still too big, so the businesses uh, do not even see it as, as a viable option to, to improve their, their business operations. Uh, so I would wrap up here, and I'm looking forward to the discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks a lot uh, to, to, to all of you for uh, uh, thoughtful contributions. Um, uh, I know that we are a bit behind on time, but uh, it's still good to open the floor and to uh, any questions from the, from the audience for our uh, panelists. So please, um, have any question or comment, just briefly introduce yourself and, uh, and, and ask. Hello everyone, my name is Pavlina Zdraveva, I am freelance consultant on environment and climate change. I would like to thank you for the interesting presentations, but uh, usually the less speaker gets the, the biggest attention. Um, Ms. Dushkova uh, started her addressing with a very interesting uh, point that implementation needs to be improved. Um, according to your experience, who is the one that should be responsible for enhancing the implementation? Is it the government only or the private sector has its share in this section? Thank you. Thank you. Maybe, maybe we take one more question and then we answer them uh, together. So. Okay, so let's, uh, let's take this one, please. Uh, thank you. 
I would briefly say it is the res responsibility of all stakeholders to do their part of the job within the, the whole picture. Uh, we heard this morning from the addresses from the European Commission that uh, last uh, week, that is 10 days ago, we had a, a breakthrough uh, finally after many years of, of hold in the uh, adoption of the three uh, decisions related to aspects of uh, implementation of the action plan for the common regional market. And unfortunately, they are, those three adopted decisions are only part of the maybe more than 10 that are uh, ready and uh, waiting in line to be adopted. And if you think that adoption of those decisions is uh, achievement by itself, it's not because we are not now waiting the, the process of ratification of those decisions. And after that, maybe even a year or two after that, we will be in a position as private sector to assess whether and to what extent has it really brought changes uh, in the, the work of, of businesses. This does not mean that uh, we should uh, just uh, stay from the side and, and criticize what is being or not being done, but to uh, join forces of all stakeholders in the process because the results we are, uh, or the effects we are all discussing uh, in the panel this morning uh, are for mutual benefits so, to all citizens and businesses from the whole region. Thank you, thank you, uh, Mr. Riva. Uh, any other question of the audience? Okay, okay, please, uh, can you, the microphone here. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Joan Hoey. I'm from The Economist Group in London. Um, it's a question for Richard Greveson and, and maybe any other of the panelists who'd like to take it too. Uh, so Richard was really emphasizing in his remarks the um, kind of limited returns really on what's been done so far in terms of regional integration efforts. So just wanted to ask you to expand a bit on what you think would be the then the kind of key priorities that could actually make a difference and if anybody else Mr. Uh, wants to wants to come and in on that too. So um, if there are real limits to how far this process can take us, what actually, what, which policies could really make a difference? Thanks, good question. Probably the most important question of all, I think, on, on, for this region now. I mean, so I wanted to emphasize regional integration, economic integration has brought something, but nowhere near enough. And I don't think really the blame for that is with regional economic integration. I think there were always limits because of the market size, because we're talking about a region, as I said, collectively with the GDP of, of Slovakia. Um, we have to be honest about what the, what the, what the potential of, of deeper integration is. The, the, the obvious answer, and I know this is a politically not simple at all, but the, 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 the issue has been the, the very slow moving EU accession process and the lack of EU accession of this region. I mean, if you look at any reasonable counterfactual, and I mentioned already a couple of times the Visegrad countries, I mean, why did they converge so well? Why have they attracted these really big FDI projects? Why have they integrated so well into global value chains? Uh, why have they reached a pretty high standard of, of economic development? But also, why relevance for this panel, why have they integrated so well amongst themselves? And it's all about the EU accession process. I mean, we, we have measured this in different studies. It's different things. It's the, it's the access to the budget, the upgrading of infrastructure, the access to the single market, the way that foreign investors see you differently, all of these things which have simply not happened in this region. So I think that it's not so much to say 
regional integration was a failure or, or anything like that, not, not at all. It's just that it has to be part of something bigger. And that was the idea at the start, of course, that this was a prerequisite, this was a necessary part of the EU integration process, but it's part of the EU integration process. And I think the regional integration has gone fairly far, could go further, could definitely go further, but it's gone fairly far. It's the EU accession part that hasn't. And, and as I said, I mean, we've got a country where we are sitting now, which has been almost 20 years now in the EU accession process. The longest it took for any of the existing members was 11 and a half years. So it's basically almost double here now. And I think we can say with a fair degree of confidence that unfortunately accession is, is not happening soon. So the policies I would propose are acknowledging this very different, much more protracted EU accession process and thinking about more economic integration, therefore, ahead of, of accession. And I mentioned two examples. One would be a deepening of the stabilization association agreements. And you can take things from the DCFDAs, I think, as an initial step uh, in that. And secondly, would be much more access to the, to the EU budget now. I mean, the difference in EU budget transfers for this region versus the member states in Central and Eastern Europe is enormous, about five times as much, basically cumulatively over the time. And we know that that has been a big driver of infrastructure upgrading in the region. As I said, we can even measure that, that the, the budget specifically was a driver of the, of the integration of the Visegrad economies with each other, um, which again has not, has not happened in, in, in this region. So that would be my, my, my policy. If I may Thank add. Just Thanks a lot. Yeah, sure, sure, please. Yes, uh, and there is a lot of problem of the uh, technical nature within the EU of how to overcome problems with the outdated SAS and, and, uh, uh, and to try to improve the agreements that they have with the Western Balkan 6. But another thing is, uh, this is completely correct and separate issue, but as well the studies are saying that the level of the regional integration would give up to the additional growth in GDP in the, in the region. So basically, the studies are saying that 6.7% of the additional growth could be reached by the level of the integration of the region as the, on the level of the EU. So basically, if we would integrate as the EU is integrated, we would have 7.7, uh, 7, 6.7 additional GDP points uh, or percentages of growth. As well, if we would uh, be, uh, integrated on the level of the uh, EFTA, EAA, EAA that, would, that would lead to another, uh, to, that would lead to, let's say, the level of the integration that would be uh, adding the 3% of the GDP to the region. So basically, uh, besides the, the part of the EU, there is a potential of ourselves to deeper integrate and by the, the deeper integration getting, uh, getting an additional uh, level of the development uh, which we would have, but for that there are there are some preconditions which I think we are not still ready to do, and this is where I'm saying we need to, to, to have a genuine will and, 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 and political will for the regional integration, because that would probably involve some renouncing of the uh, independence of the parties, in the, the, some mechanisms that the, from the parties would need to go to the regional level, and I don't think the parties are uh, ready to, or economies in the region are ready to do that at, at this political moment. Thank you, thank you. Uh, unless there are any other um, uh, comments, um, let me thanks, thank once again all, uh, all panelists and also the audience for some interesting uh, discussions. I think we can, we reached a satisfactory answer to the question in the title of the panel. Uh, it's not a myth, it's a reality. Uh, we touched upon the, the achievements of regional economic cooperation, some limitations uh, and some ways forward, and uh, we did touch upon the, the elephant in the room, the EU accession, and, and also some of the political factors which uh, uh, we cannot go deeper as we are focusing on the economic part. So thank you for your uh, attention and very much uh, looking forward to the, to the next panel. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Kabashi. Thank you very much, dear panelists. Before we continue with the second panel dedicated to the Balkan uh, uh, 
uh, energy challenges and perspectives, I would like to invite you all for a short minute, uh, 15 minutes break, coffee break. So let's uh, come back here at uh, 15 minutes past 11.
we are waiting for the moderator of the second panel. Okay, welcome back, dear all. I hope that you managed to refresh yourself and take a breath. The second panel that I would like to announce is the one titled Balkan Energy Prospects for Faster Energy Transition. I would like to invite the moderator of this panel, Dr. Alexander Dedinets, scientific collaborator at the Research Center for Energy and Sustainable Development at the Macedonian Academy of Sciences and Arts, and the speakers to take their places on the stage. Okay, we will try something different <laughs> because at the previous panel, the speakers were at, at, at the stage. Um, at the very beginning, dear, dear ambassadors, dear uh, guests, welcome to the second panel. Um, at the very beginning, I would like to say thank you to the organizers for inviting me to be part of today, uh, today conference. Uh, we are living in a very specific time, in a time we are going from one crisis in another crisis. The last crisis, uh, it's uh, energy crisis, called by some experts, by others say that actually it's an economic crisis. But both group of experts are on opinion that the changes are needed. Uh, this crisis, I think, that showed the bottlenecks of the system and uh, sh give us some direction how to solve the, the crisis. Uh, this is especially true, I think, for the Western Balkan countries because um, uh, they are in a very specific position and I think that now is the time to catch the train and to invest in new technology that will bring uh, development and growth. Actually, the energy and the climate are those uh, field that in the next period, in the next years or decades, will create uh, new technologies, new development, and new green jobs. Uh, today, it is my pleasure to be, to be host of the eminent speakers that are coming from different uh, organizations and different uh, uh, companies, different countries. Um, we have eight peoples uh, eight people in this in this panel. Uh, we we gonna talk about money, how the Europe is dealing with the crisis, or it, how the countries for Europe is dealing with the crisis. And after that, we have representative from the region, and they they will they will share with us uh, their opinion of the crisis. We are talking about very important uh, topic. We are talking about transition and we will see what kind of transition we want, just transition or some other transition. Um, I will start with the first speaker. We have, as I said, representative from different institutions. We're gonna start with uh, the money. So we have Gregor uh, Zelinski, the director, uh, head of energy Europe from the EBRD. Please take your seat. The second speaker is Henrik Fischer, Head of Energy and Project Finance from Erste Bank. He will join us online. The third speaker is Ante, uh, Ante Babic, is a Senior Policy Officer at European Commission. So he, he will join us also through, uh, through online. Gabor Santos, uh, manage, uh, Managing Director of the Western Balkan Green Center from Hungary. Please take your seat. We have the professor Neven Duic. He is a full professor at the Department of Energy, Power Engineering and Environment, Faculty of Mechanical Engineering and Naval Architecture, University of Zagreb. And uh, he will join us also online. Damir Militik, uh, Milevic, sorry, 
Uh, he is a member of Managing Board Sustainable Energy Transition Center from Bosnia and Herzegovina. Miloš Mladenovic, Manager Director of the Serbian Power Exchange. And the last one is the Todor Angushev, member of the Managing Board of the Chamber of Commerce of North Macedonia and President of the Renewable Energy Sources Group at the Macedonian Energy Association. I repeat several times that we are going to start with the money. <laughs> so, Mr. Gregor, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, there's so many ways of uh, starting uh, this discussion. Uh, you can be very brief and just say, well, we're going to talk about money. The money is there. Uh, so you don't have to worry about the money. But that wouldn't really extend, uh, or <clears throat> that wouldn't really give the answer to, uh, to so many questions that uh, we all do have today. Uh, now, I represent the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development, an institution which is well known in the region, and the institution that uh, supports the transition uh, of the economies in which we work. Uh, so let me start with uh, uh, highlighting that in the context of uh, transition, economic transition of, uh, of the region in which we operate, uh, the transition of uh, energy sector uh, is important, but it also has to be viewed in the context of green economy transition. So it's not just about energy, and I'm going to talk about energy at length, sorry. My, my strategy for this, uh, uh, for, for this panel is to speak for like uh, 60 minutes, and then the other gentlemen will won't have any time to, to express <laughs> their, their view, but uh, uh, I, I was told that I cannot really apply that strategy, so I'm, I'm trying to keep it to, am I, am I given 10 minutes, right? Yeah, 10 minutes. Yeah, 10 minutes. So, uh, Green economy transition is important for many reasons, but I think what I would like to do, and may not necessarily be very uh, natural for a representative of a public institution to do it, but what I would like to do is to give you an example why energy, sorry, green economy transition is important for the private sector. Now, if we think about the region and its ambitions to become more integrated in Europe, Private sector business in Europe is under huge pressure from the end consumers to reduce the carbon footprint. So anyone who delivers final goods to the European market or anyone who delivers small bits, or widgets, that are then being used for producing something bigger has to be very concerned about carbon footprint. Only those businesses who are able to produce final goods and provide services with a very small carbon footprint are going to be sustainable and are going to win the economic battle, the competition in the European market in the future. So that's the, you know, maybe that's obvious, but that's the starting point. Within that element, the energy that is, pro uh, is required for uh, you know, production, for services, for any type of economic activity, has to be green by definition, because other, otherwise it's not going to s support the goal of green uh, economy transition. So now let, let, me, let, me, let me go to something that I know best, which is, which is the, uh, the energy sector, and, uh, and what we would like to do as EBRD in the context of green energy transition. The easy answer uh, for green energy transition is, oh, we just need to uh, replace our fossil fuel-based power generation into green energy generation, and that's going to be it. Well, easily said, much more difficult to, to implement, especially today. Uh, today in the context of uh, the war in Ukraine, today in the context of uh, energy crisis, extremely high electricity prices that uh, the end consumers, the businesses uh, have to accept and that hurts everyone around. So in this context, uh, the question is what can we do now, right here, right now, and what do we need to do in a medium and longer period? I think in a medium to longer period, nothing, 
nothing, nothing has changed. So it's, uh, it's still about gradual replacement of fossil fuels power generation by renewables. It's about integration of the markets. Uh, but in the short period or short time perception, everything has changed because the economics of, uh, uh, of the energy sector have changed completely. And one big argument for not accelerating renewables in the future was the cost of renewables. Today, I think we've got the best possible arguments to, to show that it's the renewables that are the most cost competitive. They are not dependent on imported fuels. Uh, the good examples of competitive auctions from uh, the neighboring uh, Albania, which uh, EBID has a pleasure to support, have delivered super uh, competitive prices for solar PV power generation at the level below 30 euro of for uh, megawatt hour. And that's in the context of energy prices peaks where a few months ago to import electricity into the region, um, the cost of 300, 350 euros per megawatt, megawatt hour had to be paid. So uh, I, I have no hesitation that renewables are the cheapest and the most competitive way, way forward. The question is how to get them uh, constructed at scale. And here comes my second big point, which is the private sector. This transition is not going to happen without private sector involvement. Yes, we'll have uh, large incumbent state-owned companies that will do their bit. They have to do their bit in, in terms of energy, green energy transition. But to have it at large scale, we need to have a framework that would give the investment comfort uh, to uh, FDI to come in in big numbers and be able to deliver uh, construction of uh, renewable energy uh, projects across the region, again, at a large scale. One other quick point which I wanted to make, again, and something that can be done uh, today, relates back to the very famous document by the European Commission that has been delivered, delivered as the answer to uh, the energy crisis, which is the Repower EU, that talks about reduce, replace, and, and renew. Well, I've already talked about the renew in terms of renewables. Uh, replace is, uh, is mostly about replacement of Russian gas. I think it can also be seen in the context of diversification of gas supply sources for Europe as a whole, and I think for the region, and North Macedonia specifically, that's something that uh, the authorities are very much uh, aware of and uh, EBRD is supporting as well. You may know about uh, our ongoing work uh, in relation to uh, the construction of a new gas interconnector with Greece. Uh, that's something that we're going, is going to address the very, the very point. Uh, but the, the third R, the reduce, is, is something that can be done overnight, and that's about saving energy. I think there is a, there's a lot of work to be done on the side of uh, uh, passing the message to the general public about how energy can be saved, how energy is, uh, uh, has to be, has to be uh, used in, in the way that is thoughtful and uh, in the way that doesn't lead to wasting energy. Obviously, the easiest way is to put the price up. You see that when it's expensive, people don't want to pay, but that's not necessarily the most efficient way. The most efficient way is the education, education of, uh, of, of the end consumers that we all should save uh, energy. And I think uh, while my 10 minutes is not quite yet coming to the end, I've got two quick uh, other points. Um, I've talked about private sector investment and regulation, which is important, uh, but the integration, which we've heard about during the previous panel, is equally important. Now, there have been an interesting comparison of the uh, Western Balkan 6 to Slovakia. Now, I've been working for EBRD for 24 years, and in my earlier days, I was uh, concentrating on a slightly different project, uh, a slightly different region. And that region is called the Baltic states. Now, just three countries, by actually Baltic states, have been quite often compared 
to Slovakia in the context of the size of the population. Oh, we are three small countries, you know, more or less the population of, uh, uh, of Slovakia. That's what the Baltic states were used to say. They very quickly learned that if someone talks about uh, Estonia or Lithuania from the point of view and a private sector investor from the US, uh, it's just too small. And with all due respect to themselves, they said, well, we need to market ourselves as an investment destination for large private sector investors as a bigger country, as a bigger region, as a bigger investment opportunity, and we can only do it together. So I think what, we, what you've heard earlier is super important. Yes, let's, be, let's be fair. Some investors from across the point may not necessarily know the big difference between Albania and North Macedonia and Kosovo and other countries in the region. But when you market yourself together, and that can be done only upon a successful integration of the region, then that investment opportunity, the marketing opportunity, come across much stronger and much clearer to someone who is not familiar with the region. Uh, and my last point on, uh, on the just transition, because you know, I, I cannot, uh, I cannot uh, not mention the just transition. We have had so much in the past from, uh, uh, from the authorities, not just in Western Balkans, but across all of the region in which EBRD operates, that when we, when we really push hard for green energy transition, for new renewables, we are effectively uh, contributing to the loss of jobs in coal mines and coal power, power plants. Yes, this is true. But the objective of EBRD is not to uh, support green energy transition that will leave people outside jobs or without jobs. It's all about how can we create uh, new uh, opportunities. And perhaps it's a little bit a long shot, but I would like to bring to you an example of the investment that uh, EBRD supported last year in Poland. Uh, providing financing for a market-based transition bond for a company called Tauron, one of the uh, largest uh, uh, power utilities in the country. I think they've got, uh, uh, well, it doesn't matter the size. I mean, they, they, they're fairly big in the context of politics. Uh, but but, but they, they tried to raise money, which we were happy to support, on the pledge of them, A, closing a certain amount of coal-based power generation, B, investing into new renewables that will replace the decommissioned fossil fuel power generation, and C, and probably most important in the context of, uh, of, of just transition, to retrain the miners into the new jobs for installers of onshore wind farms that are going to be constructed in the country, or which are being constructed in the country. So if you think about a large-scale investment into renewables and you know, hundreds or thousands of, uh, of megawatts of installed capacity of solar uh, PV in this country and uh, hopefully dozens of gigawatts of solar PV across the Western Balkans, someone will have to do it during the construction. Yes, it's not a job for life, it's not it's, it, it's not operation, it's just a construction, but it will create new jobs. Uh, so it's not true that green energy transition is, is taking away the jobs and leaving people without uh, 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 income. Uh, it can actually deliver uh, new job opportunities for a brighter, greener future. So let me stop here. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, we discussed that we are going to break the rules. <laughs> so I have a very short question at the very beginning because uh, you said a lot of interesting things. And um, uh, the Western Balkan countries are now on the cross road. They don't know what to do, in which direction to go. Very short, if, some, uh, if someone from the country asks you to, to support some project from coal, let's say, for coal, are you going to finance this project? Well, the answer is, uh, is very clear, no. Uh, it's, uh, it's going to be no because uh, uh, the bank actually took a decision on its uh, strategy and policy for, for fossil fuels. Uh, we have uh, decided not to finance the new uh, fossil fuel projects, uh, uh, I'm talking coal, lignite 
and, uh, um, and oil, uh, what we managed to do is to, open, uh, to, to leave an open window for gas. We, we think that gas uh, transmission and distribution and gas-fired power generation is important for, uh, for balancing of the renewable energy intermittent uh, uh, renewable energy. Uh, but we wouldn't finance projects which are in, uh, in, in, in the upstream gas, in gas production. Uh, that's outside our, uh, our strategy. But when it comes to, to using gas as a, as a meaningful way of, uh, uh, of balancing renewables, absolutely yes. I would also add that in the Western Balkans region, uh, and I think I hope we can talk about hydro a little bit more uh, uh, later. But I think I think hydro is yeah. such a natural balancing uh, uh, instrument for intermittent uh, uh, renewables, uh, and, and it has to be used at scale in uh, in this region. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, now we will continue with the second uh, second uh, the key speaker, uh, Mr. Henrik. Fisher, as I said, he's a uh, head of energy and project uh, finance. Uh, Erste, he's coming from the Erste Banking Group. Uh, he's online. Uh, can you hear us? Yes, yes, I'm online. Okay, okay, you can start with, with your speech. Yeah, um, so uh, p first of all, thank you very much for your invitation. Uh, so uh, I, I very much appreciate this opportunity to um, introduce, uh, to the extent you don't know us uh, yet, uh, yes, the group to you as a major commercial bank group um, in the region, dedicated to the region. And uh, what we are doing, what we are contributing um, to foster uh, the transition from uh, let's say, black power to green power in the region. Uh, so, uh, if we first start, let's say, uh, with a quick introduction. So, uh, we are, let's say, the major Austrian bank group um, with, uh, uh, as said, a uh, dedicated focus on Middle Eastern Europe. So, uh, you see here all these uh, dark blue countries, um, including um, the Balkans, obviously, where we are present on the ground, um, either with uh, subsidiaries, uh, so, so, so bank subsidiaries, um, which uh, have branches all over the region, or in cooperation with the uh, um, Austrian saving banks, uh, who also have subsidiaries in the region. So, for example, in Serbia and Croatia and Montenegro, we have uh, yes, the bank itself, and uh, in other Balkan countries, uh, it's, uh, we are present through the saving banks, like in North Macedonia. So uh, we uh, have uh, more than 335 billion of assets at the moment, 40% uh, of uh, equity and uh, quite, quite a stable rating. Uh, we refinance ourselves uh, through uh, through all the de deposits, so we are not really um, dependent on the capital markets, which I think uh, is predominantly becoming uh, important again um, in uh, uncertain times. Uh, we are um, listed on the stock exchange in Vienna um, and uh, have uh, 16 million customers throughout the region. Uh, because we are in Skopje today, obviously, also to mention here North Macedonia, uh, where we are present through uh, Sparkasse North Macedonia with uh, more than 140,000 clients on the ground and uh, also uh, a major role in the corporate loan market. Um, what are we doing to um, support uh, the energy transition in the in the Balkans is uh, and elsewhere in uh, Eastern Europe, like for example in, in Poland, as one of the major markets, but of course also in our very home market, Austria, um, is uh, predominantly uh, to finance renewable energy uh, projects, which are um, in particular uh, capital in intensive, as you know. So uh, for 
one megawatt of solar, you you, you need to invest roughly uh, 800,000 euros, right? And, and for for wind power, it's even more. So it's highly capital intensive, and we are um, on a commercial bank basis providing senior debt to finance uh, 70 to 75 percent of the investments over, let's say, typically 12 to, to 15 years. Uh, but obviously, we are also covering other infrastructure, transport infrastructure. We are um, uh, a lender to uh, the uh, Budapest airport, for example. Uh, we are also uh, 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 together with our colleagues from EBRD, for example, uh, uh, financing uh, the, the Belgrade um, uh, waste energy facility and uh, other other infrastructure. So we are not talking about uh, wind power or solar power only, but but this is what I want to focus on uh, for today. Uh, I want to mention maybe three big milestones here, uh, uh, how we have uh, supported renewable energy uh, in the Balkans uh, from from uh, uh, from uh, our side um, as, as a commercial lender. So, uh, uh, for example, we have uh, financed uh, arranged financing uh, for the first um, more than 100 megawatt uh, wind project in Serbia in 2017, uh, sponsored by uh, the Israeli independent power producer Enlight, Kovacica. Uh, last year was also a major milestone. So we are one of the lenders um, to finance uh, the, uh, uh, that, that had refinanced uh, 600 megawatts of wind power in Romania that was acquired by Macquarie Group. Um, that's a project with in the region with the first first major um, uh, power purchase agreement. Um, and what I would like in particular to mention today, as we are in Skopje, uh, we have financed uh, or we are financing since last year uh, the first uh, private wind project in North Macedonia, uh, Project Bogoslovets. Um, with the official name of the project company of the borrow being Tor, uh, which is uh, sponsored by ENB Company. So I, I wanna, wanna mention in particular this project because uh, uh, usually you know, foreign direct investments comes in, which is very important of course, but has the majority of the shares and, and, the, local, and the local investor is in a minority position uh, and I think what, what we have really supported here that, uh, and this is a very good example that it could also work the other way around. So uh, we have really supported our client BNB um, to um, providing for a financing package, which, which uh, uh, I mean, supports um, the, the, the construction of this project. I mean, the, the construction is very much progressed by the way, meanwhile. Uh, so we're, we are we're very happy with this, and and here it's really the other way around that uh, the local investor has the majority of the shares uh, for a major project like like this. Uh, so we are talking about uh, 36 uh, megawatts uh, in North Macedonia, um, and obviously we are happy to support uh, further projects uh, of this kind or even bigger. Uh, I want to. Uh, speak today about uh, the challenges and uh, how we are we are um, uh, we are contributing um, as a commercial uh, bank uh, to address those. And I want to focus on uh, power price risk here uh, because uh, now we don't need any subsidiary at, at anymore, um, uh, which is really a great achievement. Uh, so it's it's no luxury anymore, let's say, or, or green luxury luxury anymore for uh, Balkan countries uh, to roll out renewables. It has become, uh, let's say, uh, uh, obviously uh, the, the future of power generation, uh, which is uh, commercially fully vi fully viable uh, currently. Um, and uh, but uh, we are, we are also facing a situation where um, of of increased uncertainty. Uh, so if we are looking, for example, uh, at power prices in Hungary uh, over the last uh, two years, then uh, I mean, we, we see here quite a quite of a bumpy rally. Uh, and the question is really, what are the sustainable factors um, driving power prices and what are temporary factors driving power prices? So, so uh, certainly, um, uh, 
the sustainable factor is the reform of uh, the uh, uh, European market for uh, emission uh, allowances, uh, carbon emission allowances. So, so uh, uh, through reforms of the EU since 2019, uh, the the, uh, the oversupply in the market has been has been reduced. Uh, so, so, so this has allowed for a recovery of power prices uh, already in 1819. Uh, I think which which has really helped uh, the rule out of renewables on a, on a, on a com in a commercial way without subsidies already then. Uh, obviously, then uh, in the meantime, we had the uh, slack of demand, uh, slump of demand uh, due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, that, that is obviously a very temporary relief factor. Uh, thanks God. Um, and then and then we have, uh, let's say now, uh, the, the, the energy crisis with the peaking gas prices. Um, Already starting, I think before the before Russia invaded uh, Ukraine, um, uh, due also to uh, increasing Asian demand of LNG, uh, which will continue. Um, but uh, as said, I mean very recently, obviously uh, due to the war, uh, which you see on the very uh, right side. So, so, so what we what what we clearly see is, which is not very surprising. Uh, that uh, gas is, is is at the moment dominating uh, the uh, the price formation on, on 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 power markets, but the question is: Is this really sustainable? So um, it's it's dominating um, power prices at the moment because uh, the marginal plant um, are usually uh, gas fired power plants, and uh, obviously gas fired power plants uh, need to. Sorry, need to, Mr. Fisher. Yeah. yeah. You have uh, two minutes to, to go to okay, the I, 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 because I we don't minutes, have yeah. a lot of time. We're running. Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay, okay. Sorry. I will, I will, I will, I will uh, uh, be quicker. So, so, so gas is is really here um, a very important factor. You see this also on a on a European scale. Um, but but what we we are seeing it's it's uh, prices gas prices will not keep uh, uh, on a, on a very high level forever. So the, you see this already um, on the future markets here, which are coming, which are already, uh, let's say, uh, showing a normalization in the next years. So the question is, how do we deal with this as a bank? I mean, we cannot obviously land against the peak. Uh, and uh, this means um, uh, to finance, uh, uh, let's say, renewables um, uh, on a private basis uh, needs to cover, needs to address uh, Power price risk in in the market. So uh, we are, whereas we we are let's say ready as a lender to allow for a certain flexibility. So we're saying okay, roughly two thirds of the of the generation in net present value terms should be covered by a power purchase agreement, and uh, I think one 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 third could could stay uh, with without covering of the power purchase agreements. Um, and there are different sorts of this. Uh, what I want to mention is. Uh, there are also secondary problems um, if you enter into a power purchase agreement um, because you are then liable, um, maybe maybe to strength this year, you are then liable uh, to the off-taker also uh, that your project is complete at a certain time. Um, you have to provide to the off-taker um, as a renewable energy producer um, performance bonds to cover your a delivery obligation, um, and we are, let's say, we are um, ready as a commercial bank um, to support this. Yeah? So we also have not only financing, but also these performance bonds as a product um, in our um, portfolio. Um, and obviously, um, you need a, uh, you need a, a bank on your side, um, which, which. Uh, which understands um, the, the issues around uh, power purchase agreements um, and uh, understands these secondary risks uh, in power purchase agreements. I mean, there, there are also other factors like uh, just mentioning it now, uh, you know, profile risk, basis risk, uh, because uh, power purchase agreements or power hedging agreement even might not fully uh, always reflect uh, the volatile power production of the um, uh, of the project. So there might be a mismatch, um, and uh, 
uh, we uh, we have the experience um, how to deal with this um, and how to look at this uh, as, as a lender. And as I said, how to support you, for example, with uh, performance bonds uh, to, uh, to fulfill your obligations under the power purchase agreement. Uh, so, uh, I mean, this is this is essentially what uh, what we are now doing. And uh, yeah, if uh, if you have uh, if you have a private investor, um, uh, a, a project currently uh, you, you would like to do, uh, so please uh, please talk to us. And uh, I mean, we, we are happy to sit together and uh, to find it uh, find find a solution for you. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Fisher. Thank you for the presentation. I would like to please you to, to keep in 10 minutes if, if it's possible in order to, to keep attention of the, of the audience. The third speaker, because uh, we have eight panelists in, the, in uh, this session. Uh, the third speaker is Ante Babic. Uh, he is um, Senior Policy Officer at European Commission. Uh, he will join us also through the screen. Mr. Babic, can you hear us? Yes, can you hear me? Okay, perfect. Yes, we can hear you perfect. Just to, to put my presentation, uh, is, is that what you are getting? Can you, can you see my presentation? No, no. Yeah, yeah, now it's okay, now it's okay. Now it's okay. Okay. Um, so, uh, a little bit cold uh, 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 greetings from Brussels, because we are having a little bit of uh, 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 colder days, uh, which, is, um, which is usually good, but uh, not in this situation, when we are lacking some issue, or issue uh, some, some uh, essential um, fuels, and um, with the situation of... Um, with uh, with Russian invasion of uh, Ukraine, it makes things worse. So, um, uh, major things that I would would like to share with you um, is that there are uh, things that we are doing uh, in terms of Europe, and as you can you can ask your uh, um, your colleagues in in Croatia and Slovenia. Uh, that's where the, the ma major decisions are, are are done and will be translated into your um, uh, legislation uh, sooner than, than later. Uh, we are focusing on uh, European Green Deal and uh, recently because of the situation of the uh, with, with, uh, with uh, energy prices in the world, energy crisis in the world and uh, Russian invasion, we have uh, accelerated, we are accelerating uh, from um, the pre present state to uh, what we are like to see uh, to be climate neutral continent in 2050. And uh, we have the European Green Deal to do it. This temporary acceleration is called uh, Repower EU and uh, our first speaker has been mentioning it. Uh, what I wanted to uh, tell you is uh, really uh, there are um, there are paths to paths to the development uh, which I'm sure that uh, all the Western Balkan countries would like to go, but there is there are paths to uh, quickly industrialize and um, get your GDP quicker up. But that uh, also uh, entails uh, raising CO2. Um, uh, the other part is which you can now choose is not to do the mistakes that uh, the Europe has done, uh, becoming uh, over independent on gas and uh, all the other fossil fuels, and to take opportunity to build uh, a new green economy, which uh, uh, as Pre, uh, previous speaker have said uh, there will be plenty of money, uh, not only uh, private money, not only EBRD money, but also public money. Um, so this is the essence of Repower EU, uh, which is a temporary th thing which is accelerating 
what we I, I'm not going to present uh, um, uh, green, uh, European Green Deal. That that is something that you have been all uh, listening to, and all our energy policies are based on this. So, uh, on contrary, uh, as we've seen uh, some uh, media uh, saying, yeah, but with this. Uh, uh, energy crisis with uh, Russian war in, in, in uh, Ukraine, probably this uh, will, will drag you from the green uh, European Green Deal. No, on the contrary, uh, we are more, more determined and we are accelerating those. So, um, as, as you can see, we are, we are trying to um, substitute in the short term uh, the gas by, uh, from, from, uh, from, from Russia by uh, increasing LNG, but that is not all that the, there is. Uh, we are increasing renewable share with uh, our recommendations on how to increase permitting and all the issues with grid connection. And these are going to be recommendations to member states and of course to you, because you as a, a Western Balkan countries and as the members of uh, um, um, energy uh, community uh, soon uh, will be um, transmitting all these um, uh, legislations from Europe on energy uh, market, energy union, uh, and uh, and and uh, climate. Uh, these are the our four flagship in initiatives uh, on roof rooftops and. Uh, Permitting, what we found out is that uh, there are some countries that have uh, uh, very advanced uh, permitting uh, rules, which we are going to recommend to the other member states and to you. Uh, second, uh, a most important thing which we are we were trying to um, uh, influence the, the countries to do is uh, to do more in energy savings because that's the biggest a single way to reduce the um, carbon and energy footprint and this is what we are uh, what, what we are focusing and of course European money public money plus uh, EIB plus EBRD plus private investors is going to be focusing on that not only that but also private banks um, there is something that we are calling taxonomy uh, we are going to focus on those, so uh, banks are, are, are not going to be uh, uh, investing so much more into fossil fuels. Uh, they will have to report on sustainability of their investments and uh, some, in, uh, some, some uh, green technologies are going to be uh, uh, more welcome than, than fossil, fossil fuels, so that's what we are having. Um, what I, I wanted to show you um, also, uh, it's a recent EU support package to West Balkan countries. It's from November 2022, very recent. Uh, uh, European uh, Commission will put forward a substantial energy support package uh, in amount of 1 billion in grants. So it's not raising the... Um, the depths of uh, depth to, to um, Western Balkan countries. 500 will be in immediate financial support for vulnerable households, uh, which will be adopted in December and available in January. And um, 500 million grants, which will be de dedicated to investments in energy infrastructure, mostly interconnectors because you are surrounded with us, uh, as you probably know, from January next year, uh, Croatia, Bulgaria, and Romania will be even in the Schengen zone. So, uh, uh, we also the the whole energy infrastructure is around you, and uh, uh, we will we will be encapsulating one another. So, um, but what I really wanted to show you, so you are you are in 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 the perfect position to choose your path. Let let us see wh where you are standing. So I'm going to s uh, show you for each and every Western Bank country the energy mix that is uh, in 2020 and electricity mix. So um, uh, you can see the, the darker it, it goes, the, the, uh, the, the, the 
dirtier it goes. So there's a, a, a coal or solid fossil fuels. Then there's a little bit of um, gas, which is blue. Uh, then oil and petroleum products, which is um, um, brown. And there's a renewables and fuel, bio, 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 biofuels, it's green. So Albania is doing something good in the electricity mix. They are, they're okay, but their uh, energy mix altogether is, um, is still needs to, 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 to do more. Uh, predominantly oil and petroleum pro products is in transport and, and there's something that we are doing also in the transport sector from European Commission. Then Bosnia and Herzegovina, um, it's predominantly black and a little bit of uh, hydropower, which is great. Uh, North Macedonia, uh, it's black and, and, and brown, a little bit of gas in electricity and, uh, and, and 28% of uh, bio, uh, renewables and biofuels in, in the electricity, electricity mix, but in the energy mix, in total energy mix, it's very, 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 very low. Um, I can tell you that uh, uh, there Sorry, are... Sorry, Mr. Babic, uh, yes? one, one minute left for, for yeah, this part. Yeah, I'll, I'll do it. Yes, I'll do it in one minute. Then, uh, in Serbia, a similar situation, black, a little bit of green, but there's black. So the title of my presentation is How to Come from Dark or from Black to Green. Montenegro is a little bit better, like Albania. Kosovo, almost totally dependent on, on coal. Um, what we are seeing here is, is uh, GHG as emissions, uh, we have reduced them. There's uh, there are targets for 2030, but you can see on the right-hand side where we need to be in 2050. And that will encapsulate you as well, uh, hoping that you will uh, join us by, by 2030 uh, in the decade. So you have to uh, look in, in those uh, uh, targets as well. Uh, increasing renewables, this is the numbers for EU27. We have modestly doing this. With Repower EU, we are going to surpass this uh, 32%, which was a lot, uh, uh, which was um, target that was previous. Now it's uh, 45, and we are going to increase it more to meet uh, the climate neutrality in 2050. And uh, as you can see, in uh, Europe, uh, industry has uh, adjusted. The only things that they are not adjusted is transports and households. So households will adjust with these higher price, uh, prices of energy, but please do not uh, open more, uh, rail, uh, more roads, more uh, ways of uh, transport, re reorganize your transport and uh, build uh, uh, solar panels. I, I'm, I'm sure that uh, there, are, there are towns in Germany that have more uh, uh, solar panels than in the whole of uh, North Macedonia. Thank you for, for your um, attention, and uh, I'm uh, hoping to get your questions in the end. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Bavic. Now we are going to the uh, fourth speaker. It's uh, Gabor Santos, I hope that I pronounced. <laughs> oh, okay, I'm very close, I suppose. <laughs> okay, uh, he is a man uh, managing director at the Western Balkan uh, Green Center of Hungary. Please. Thank you, and first of all, thank you for the invitation for today's forum. Uh, comparing to the previous speakers, uh, whom are representing truly big and well-known institutions, <coughs> first let me start with a brief introduction of uh, our company, our non-profit comp company. Uh, it's a recent initiative of the Hungarian government, only three years old uh, institution. What? Uh, who I'm, I'm representing today, uh, under the ministry, under the authority of the ministry responsible for energy and climate change. Uh, the reason to create this uh, institution was to scale up climate actions and bankability in the neighboring region of uh, strategic importance for Hungary, and this is the Western Balkans. Uh, in order to implement the goals included in the Paris Agreement and based on the decision of the Hungarian government, 
we established as a background institution to boost Hungary's participation in climate protection developments of the Balkans uh, and in the green transition of the region. Um, our institution would contribute to accelerate efforts in decarbonization, energy transition, and the concept of circular economy. Uh, the main objective is to that bankable projects prepared under a grant program and dedicated uh, financial plan uh, uh, coordinated by our, our center could turn the challenges into opportunities. And this could also help to bring regular regulatory environment, local regulatory environment in line with best international practices uh, and to help to boost the integration process of countries of the Western Balkans. Uh, the Hungarian experience showed that there is a considerable need uh, in the region for green project preparation from both the public and private sector. And this is where our institution and our uh, tool came into the picture because the flagship uh, initiative of our center is a project preparatory and capacity building grant program uh, which started two years ago and now with a total budget of uh, four and a half million euros. The purpose of this call of applications is to contribute to the achievements uh, of the nationally determined contribution of the target economies um, and but at the same time to um, help Hungarian undertakings have access to investment opportunities as well. The current portfolio of ours consists of uh, 47 projects, uh, from which six is concentrated in Macedonia. And uh, we have um, a selection of sectors in which these applications could arrive to our, in our institution in energy efficiency and renewable energy, water management and water treatment, collection treatment, recycling and recovering of solid waste, forest management and agricultural measures, urban environment adaptation and sustainability measures implemented in cities in town. Um, our program is uh, having uh, three subdivisions. First is the preparation of investment projects, uh, which could be included engineer documentation required for the investment project, obtaining permits, uh, preparation of environmental impact studies, uh, introduction of quality environment and other management system and standards. Uh, the second one is capacity building, uh, activities relating to climate protection planning, capacity building cooperation, research, educational cooperations. And the third one is business planning, feasibility studies, obtaining permits required for market introduction of the product or service, creating pilot uh, projects uh, of, for market in introduction. Another thing which could be interesting for the audience and for you as well may be that uh, we started a cooperation with a well-known uh, Vienna-based think tank, the energy community. This is a two-year-old uh, rolling pan, plan and one of the first initiatives was the so-called CARI program, which is abbreviation of the Clean Air Region Initiative. This is a municipality level uh, um, plan uh, from the beginning to raising awareness about air quality and uh, climate change to the end to come up with these municipalities a uh, uh, concrete um, uh, plan, uh, air quality plans and strategy. Um, if we are talk about, talking about energy transition and uh, um, actualities, we cannot avoid to talk about uh, the war in Ukraine and uh, subsequent economic crisis, which is looming above the European continent. Energy scarcity, which is a new reality for our wider region, even in Central Europe and the Western Balkans. Uh, and in this situation, energy sovereignty appreciates quickly, and it's a big advantage. We believe that, or we think that the Western Balkans faces a, a dilemma as well, other countries, but in the Western Balkans, uh, which has significant coal and lignite-based uh, energy production, and this, however, has an 
disadvantage on air quality and on life quality uh, and takes uh, valuable resources from, from CO2 trade as well. On the other hand, it's uh, uh, decreasing the reliance on domestic or uh, based product plants have been part of the uh, Western Balkans energy strategy. So the question remains that is it the right time to uh, decrease this kind of production by even European countries thinking the opposite. Um, energy scarcity also slow down the economy and bankrupt businesses. The smaller they are, the more they suffer. And this is what we see in Central Europe as well. Uh, so the question remains, what can be the solution for this kind of situation? We think that first is green innovation to get new and repurpose all development funds for implementing innovative energy efficient solutions for businesses. The second is insulation to regroup existing fundings and find extra sources to decrease domestic energy consumption by public sector and households. And that way the energy these sectors don't use will help businesses to breathe by the decreasing demand and at the end maybe uh, driving prices lower as well, uh, but also to uh, generate consumption or investment by saving. The third one is alternative domestic production means and import sources, and at least but uh, the junction and connectivity to integrate regional oil gas pipelines and electricity grids whenever possible and as soon as possible. Uh, from a Hungarian side, it has been noted with satisfaction that the gas transit from the Turkish stream pipeline to Bulgaria and Serbia has been interrupted in recent times. So this was our thoughts. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you to, uh, first of all, to be in time. <laughs> uh, now, I forgot to, to say at the very beginning that actually in front of you, you have a persons that are creating the energy uh, and will create the energy in the next, in the next uh, period. Uh, today with us, uh, we have also Professor Duic. He is a full professor at the Department of Energy, Power Engineering uh, and Environment, Faculty of uh, Mechanical Engineering and Naval Architecture, University of Zagreb. He spoke about uh, 100 renewables a long time ago when just few or small people believe in, in that and he always have some good idea to share with us. I hope that this time will be the same situation. Professor Duic, please. Thank you. Uh, hello from uh, Chile. Uh, I'm uh, a bit away from uh, sunny and uh, warm uh, spring place. I hope you hear me and that you see my presentation. Uh, we have um, a very important task uh, to do a very fast energy transition because the current context is uh, complicated. Uh, and uh, uh, we were, we were uh, dependent on uh, imports of uh, fossil fuels from uh, one uh, source which was not very clever and now we have to wean ourselves uh, from this source very quickly 40 percent gas consumption 27 percent of oil imports uh, 46 percent of coal tw uh, and practically 40 percent of uranium fuel was also coming uh, from russia uh, we have uh, done uh, really good work uh, uh, in uh, uh, only half a year, uh, practically replacing two thirds of Russian gas uh, before the winter time. Gas storages are full, uh, and uh, fortunately, winter is quite uh, mild. So this uh, winter we will survive uh, quite well. Uh, the experts say we can actually win off uh, from Russian gas by 25. We heard from the Commission that they plan it for 27. They know that uh, the main problem is actually permitting, and this is a huge uh, uh, task for the European Union to remove barriers to uh, faster implementation of, uh, uh, of uh, renewables. Uh, 
so uh, we can do it and we should do it very, very quickly. Uh, if we look at the price of uh, different uh, electricity, uh, already for five to ten years, uh, wind and solar are by far the cheapest sources of uh, uh, electri uh, electric electrical energy. Uh, here what we see is before the war and it's American prices of gas. Gas is actually uh, now five times more expensive in Europe at least. So wind and solar are the ways to go. Uh, also we have to electrify heating. We should start from district heating because this is very versatile, uh, very flexible uh, way of integrating uh, power uh, and heating system. Here we see uh, Danish uh, district heating, which is using electric boilers, heat pumps, and only uh, for some time they're using uh, gas CHP units uh, when the electricity price uh, is higher than the gas price. Uh, so this is the way to go. Be flexible. We need more flexibility because we will have a variable uh, renewables and the right way to provide flexibility is by electrification of heating and also tra uh, transport. Uh, we have uh, done together with uh, a Macedonian Academy of uh, Sciences uh, 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 a map of heat, uh, heat road map of uh, Macedonia and you can see all the places where it's feasible to invest in district heating uh, which could then uh, uh, play in power markets to integrate uh, variable renewables. Uh, in other places, we should go for heat pumps as a solution, smart homes, PV on each home, uh, and uh, uh, heat storage will be important part of uh, the heating system because then we can integrate more renewables. There is no future in gas boilers. When you think about gas as transition fuel, it might play some role in uh, balancing uh, renewables when you don't have enough hydro for some time, but it should be mostly CHP uh, power plants, not uh, uh, condensing power plants, and in industry before the hydrogen comes. Uh, Macedonia has excellent strategy, uh, so we should, uh, you should follow it. And all other countries in the region should actually see what, uh, how uh, a good strategy uh, is well prepared for the current situation. Uh, maybe you should just make it implemented much faster than uh, you initially planned. So electric cars are coming. Already last year, 8% of uh, global sales of cars were electric. And they will come also to the Western Balkans. Western Balkans is mainly cook, uh, buying second-hand cars from Europe, and that will uh, happen in uh, three or four, five, ti five years' time when uh, second-hand uh, cars from Western Europe will be electric. So you have to prepare yourself. Electric cars also enable, with smart charging, to increase significantly penetration of uh, variable renewables. Uh, how we see uh, the energy system in 2050, but maybe we should already start uh, working on it uh, in 2030. Uh, the red line is the legacy electricity demand. So this is a kind of time critical electricity demand. That's when we want to have electricity. If we build three times more wind and solar than we actually need, uh, to cover uh, most of this electricity demand. You can see some white spots. There's, this will be covered by hydro or by hydrogen. Uh, then we will get quite a lot of excess of wind and solar. This is on European level. So uh, wind and solar are actually baseload on the continental level because wind is blowing uh, somewhere in Europe all the time. If you look at the national level, it's not so. You have zeros. But on continental level, the wind never goes under 5%. So we just need to build uh, uh, three times, around three times more than uh, we actually need. But then we have the access that we have to valorize in the best way. And to do it, we should electrify transport and heating. And we're still going to be left with um, around 40% access, which we, we will use for uh, hydrogen, 
uh, and for uh, decarbonization of industry and production of uh, synthetic fuels uh, for heavy transport. In this way, we have fully moved to renewable energy sources and we don't need any more uh, fossil fuels. Uh, it can be done very quickly. A friend of mine who was uh, a minister of energy in Brazilian state of Rio Grande do Norte, around 4 million people, so comparable with Western Balkan countries, uh, he did it in uh, four years. He moved the penetration of wind from 20% to 260% and made Rio Grande do Norte uh, a large exporter of electricity. Uh, uh, and he is a lawyer, what is interesting. Uh, he just did it. He removed all the barriers to wind and he just did it. Engineers are there to solve the problems and they can solve the problems as it can be seen from, uh, from this uh, state. So how do we solve problems of uh, systems with high penetration of uh, variable or intermittent sources like wind and uh, solar? We need more grid interconnection uh, Western Balkans are very well connected because they were part of one system. We need to flexibilize thermal power plants. We can use old coal power plants uh, if we have them, uh, or we can uh, have gas power plants if we have time to build them uh, and to pay back for them. So this is uh, uh, something that uh, depends on each country. But we need wholesale market coupling. And this is being talked about in Western Balkans already for uh, uh, five years, but it's uh, never coming. It's a crucial uh, tool for integrating wind and solar. You need uh, their head markets into their markets and they have to be coupled with neighboring countries. Uh, we also need um, uh, to develop demand response by integration of power, heat and cooling, transport and water systems into something what we call now power to x uh, it's crucial electrification of uh, heating and transport uh, has to be done in a smart way it's coming uh, it will go very quickly so we have to prepare now we will also need some uh, dedicated electricity storage but it's expensive and we should be very careful about not putting too much on that side so in order to conclude we need solutions and we need solutions for next winter uh, we need solutions for next two years, which will be a difficult period. And then we need solutions for next five to 10 years before renewables can finally take over. Macedonian energy strategy is excellent. Just implement it and do it faster than you would do it. Uh, wind and solar, we need them as soon as possible and as much as possible. You have excellent projects in uh, Macedonia, so uh, let them go. We need to integrate power, heating, cooling, water, and transport systems, and we have to do it in a cheap and simple way in smart energy systems. And transition uh, can be done quickly. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Deutsch. I would like now to invite uh, Mr. Damir Miljevic, He's coming from, uh, he's a member of managing board. Uh, he's coming from Sustainable Energy Transition Center of Bosnia and Herzegovina. So, Mr. Damir, please. Thank you very much. First of all, uh, thank you for inviting me on this important uh, conference. Uh, I will start with one small objection. The title is how we will faster energy transition. We don't need to foster energy transition. We need to foster sustainable energy transition. And the big difference is with, between fastening energy transition, which is already going on the ground with private investors, and sustainable energy transition. We could discuss after what, is, what means sustainable energy transition. Uh, I am coming from the uh, regional think tank, which are dealing with sustainable energy transition. And uh, last year we done a big research, we call that uh, barometer of the sustainable energy transition for the uh, countries of the region, where we were very interested uh, how the governments, electricity companies, and all other stakeholders are ready 
to go really in energy transition. There was a more than 120 experts from the government, electricity companies, uh, regulators, businesses, developers were, were involved in research and giving their opinion about what is the readiness of the countries for the energy transition. Uh, I will be very short. The uh, result of the research, you could say in two words, perfect storm. And we are uh, witnessing that now, this year, unfortunately. Not because uh, we had uh, only the war in Ukraine, because the energy crisis in Europe started in September last year. That means six months before the Ukraine war. Uh, what are the main conclusions of the research? That the governments of the Western Balkans are not ready and capable to lead sustainable energy transition. And the second is that uh, big electricity companies don't have enough knowledge, skills, and financial, financial means for sustainable energy transition to go very fast in that. Why big energy companies on the Western Balkans are important? They are very important because they are producing between 80% in Bosnia and Herzegovina and 98% of all electricity in a their countries. That means it will be very hard if you are in that, in that position and you have a situation where they are not so ready to go in transition to do anything which will be effective and efficient. Okay, if governments and energy companies could not lead sustainable energy transition, who will do that? private investors. Then we are coming to the problem when the private investors are leading transition. I don't want to give any explanation about that. We saw that in the last transition in our country, that's privatization. How the private interest is sustainable when you are doing a big socio-economic change in your country. Then, in that kind of, of, of situation, what we can do? We have some recommendations for all stakeholders on the Western Balkan, and uh, there are five of them. First one, energy efficiency. When you see energy in intensity of the economy of these countries, you will see why the energy efficiency is no regret strategy. You could not make mistakes if you are putting a lot of effort in energy efficiency. The second no regret strategy is please allow citizens and local businesses to, to produce energy for their needs and they, they could sell a surplus on the market. Why that's important? Because that's sustainable. When a, a foreign investor is coming in a country he put uh, 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 capacity and then sell energy abroad. That's not sustainable. Sustainable for the country is if I am producing my energy, I'm spending a part of that energy for me, and then selling a part on the market. The third no regret strategy for sure is development of distribution and transmission network, because it will be needed anyway. The fourth one is that uh, governments have to put more attention, more effort, and more planning and actions in a coal regions in transition. Why is that no regret strategy? Because anyway you need local economic development, that regions will be for sure in very bad situation. 
maybe not in the next two, three, five years, but next 10 years for sure. And it will be good if the, the part of the focus and efforts will be on coal regions that they could start their, their transition from the coal. And uh, the last one, which is more recommendation for the EU policy than to region. I don't see any, let's say, important obstacle that uh, electricity market of Western Balkan could be immediately incorporated in EU electricity market. And also that we have to be, as the Western Balkan countries, incorporated in a EU emission trading system immediately. This will not get any harm to the EU ETS system because we are 0.8% will be as a Western Balkan countries of that system. And if we get in that system the same uh, benefits as the companies from EU get, then our companies could get 6 billion euros from that market and they could spend that in the in transition. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Damir. Very good messages. Uh, now I would like to invite Mr. Miloš Mladenovic. Uh, he is a man, managing director of uh, Serbian Power Exchange. So, please. Thank you. And thank you for this invitation. I'm really glad to be here. So now, something completely different. So we heard a lot of <laughs> things about the strategy, about from the banks, from the European Commission and so on. Now something from the real world. So, uh, first of all, uh, I'm a managing director of the first and the only one, unfortunately, operational power exchange here in the WB6 countries. And uh, we are one of the example of maybe of the, of the and good role model, example of the good practice, how some things, how the best European practice can be established also here in the region. Uh, so we have established in 2015 in the strategic partnership with Apex Spot, with the, the biggest European power exchange, and also with European commodity clearing, which is the biggest clearing house and central counterparty for all EU, EU markets, both power and, uh, and the gas markets. And in that time, that was some kind of science, you know, science, science fiction story. So, and uh, we got, how I say, with this ambition, market design, we got a huge support from the Serbian stakeholders. We changed the VAT law, we changed energy law, we changed a lot of practices of the National Bank, and we have really implemented best European practice in our country for the, from the point of view of the spot market and the, the ahead market. Uh, after that, of course, we offer this best practice to all neighbors on the ATES forum in the presence of the European Commission 2016-17. We offer, how I say, close cooperation, strategic partnership to, to, to open our door for all the neighboring countries to, to, to join in our shareholder structure, of course. But in that time, from the, I don't know, some strange political reasons, it was not accepted. So currently we are facing a situation that still there is no any other operational power exchange. And uh, currently, how I say, there is some power exchanges which will, we will provide them to service within our new ADEX infrastructure. So in the meantime, we have established cooperation with the neighbors from the EU, from the Central East European power exchanges. And very soon, we will have new spectacular result that the first cross-regional power exchange will be established. So we are very close to finalist closing with the, with the Slovenian power exchange, BSP. And I hope that at the beginning of next year, we will establish single business infrastructure. So for the Serbian and Slovenian power exchange, and I hope also for some other neighboring Central East European power exchange in the future. So I'm telling this just to show that uh, even with uh, some uh, bottom-up approach, it is also possible to reach some European standards because story of the EU accession from my point of view is a story uh, to achieve these standards and not ultimately to join EU as a, some kind of, I don't know, paradigm or, or, or high, high envisaged goal in, the, in the some bright future. Uh, and uh, I'm telling this why the power exchanges are so important in this green transition. So 
beside this traditional role to provide reference price for some other market segments like bilateral market, balancing market, and so on, and to provide this secure marketplace through the center counterparty role, clearing services to mitigate the risk, counterparty risk. Currently, in this new environment, uh, now we are facing that this honeymoon, feed-in tariff honeymoon is over. There is no any more pays produced, how you say, uh, PPAs with some, some state utilities. Currently, the power exchange and the reference price from the day ahead market is a crucial point in order to even to think about the green transition, because all future uh, tools and all future uh, approach to the, to the new renewable investment is related either to the, some kind of premium, premium contracts, which is also a contract for differences based on the, on the reference price for the power exchange, or which will prevail very soon, some kind of merchant or industrial PPAs or corporate PPAs, which is usually fina also financial contracts, also based on the, on the reference price from the power exchange. Without reliable, liquid, and robust power exchange price, it is not possible even to think about new, new renewable projects. This is one side of the story. Another side, we, we are fa unfortunately, we are facing now, which is not mentioned today, but currently the biggest problem in the power sector is not high prices, is illiquidity of the sector, illiquidity of the futures market, now currently due to these very high prices and even volatile settlement price on the EX futures market, now we are facing situation that these uh, requirements for the margin calls on the, on the futures markets are very high and currently, practically you cannot find currently some, some provider of the merchant PPA, not just in our region, but even, even in the Europe. And uh, I have started this discussion with, with the banks also in Serbia on some conference and so on. And I think that one of the very important message uh, uh, and the lesson learned from this crisis is that also, especially these big, big banks, institutional financial institutions, they have to enlarge uh, this value change value chain in the, in, the, in the new renewable project because currently it is mostly related to, to finance the, the project itself, maybe to finance some infrastructure which is uh, necessary to connect this project to the transmission or distribution network. But in this new, new environment, it is also necessary to think about the financing value chain related to the hedging products, uh, to the merchant PPA, and even also participation of the, some, some important uh, hedging provider also on EX futures markets. So this is something which is, you know, sometimes a reality in business is even faster than the politics and some, some uh, strategy made by, by the politician. And currently we are really facing this as the biggest problem in the, in the sector. And you can see also that on the, even on the German futures market currently, you cannot find uh, sufficient liquidity in three years period, only for the first one year you have sufficient liquidity in the region. Uh, for your information, I forgot to mention, but uh, we also established in the meantime first financial derivatives in the region, Serbian futures project, which are listed on the, on the German EX market, which was uh, how you see information which is not uh, so, so uh, how you say, maybe advertised enough, but also with this we are providing full framework for the new investment in Serbia, but as I mentioned, or even in more liquid Hungarian market, you can find some, some certain liquidity on the futures market only for, for one year in ahead, and you know for the bankability you need at least three to five a year's uh, merchant PPA merchant PPA contract, and even with some some more more flexible policy, which is which is introduced in the past few years from the from the bankers' uh, point of view. Uh, so uh, more or less. Uh, so I will not go. I hope that I, I'm on, I'm on time. And just uh, one once again to mention that uh, uh, we will do our best also even with this new ADEX infrastructure to attract the regional stakeholders to join. And uh, we all know that, uh, you know, power exchange story, this is a pure and simple uh, how is the example of the economy of scale. You cannot establish liquid spot market. You cannot establish relevant reference price in such a small market like it is uh, it's a regional, regional one. Even our market, which is the biggest one in WB6 country, we already reach almost 3.5 terawatt hours on the day ahead market, but we are you know, facing reality, and because of this, we are, we are moving towards integration and uh, cooperation with the, with the neighbors. 
And I hope also that within this new, maybe some, some new wind are blowing now, and we heard yesterday that was also this very promising event in Belgrade. And uh, I hope also, I would like to mention this very important milestone which is coming in, in December this year, that on the Ministerial Council of the Energy Community, uh, the, the most important natural codes and EU regulation related to the, to the integration of power markets will be, I hope, uh, transposed in the region, which is one of the, how I say, very clearly uh, emphasized uh, requirements from the European Commission for the regional, regional markets to, to join and to be, to be harmonized and to be in integrated in the in the integral EU market. So after this December, I hope that CEPEX will also be once again eligible for the coupling. And uh, also in, this, in that sense, I hope that we will be front runner for the region, but also we are really open for all the regional countries, for the neighbors also to maybe to share our know-how and I hope to, to together to join to the, to the integral, integral spot, spot market of the EU. Thank you. Thank you very much. You're on time. Uh, and uh, the last speaker in the second panel is uh, Mr. Todor Angushev. He is a member of the Managing Board of the Chamber of Commerce and President of the Renewable Energy Sources Group at the Macedonian Energy Association. So, Mr. Todor, please. Thank you very much. First of all, good day to all of you. Congratulations for the nice organization and uh, thank you very much for invitation to be part of this event. I, I want to, to discuss, to speak about the, how is the situation now with the renewable energy in Macedonia and how uh, I look the future for the, how is, which direction we should to go. Now situation, it's our country, it's, it's bad. This is not something new. <laughs> Everyone now did that, that because uh, 33% from the electricity, from the consumption, it's we cover from the import. 20, it's only for renewable energy. That means that uh, about uh, 47, it's we cover from production from the uh, power plants, which uh, they have emission, a lot of emission from the CO2. That means it's uh, from the coal, from the uh, oil, uh, gas, and uh, liquid coal and this is not good. Uh, how, how is the future? Uh, we, uh, can we continue with this, uh, with this kind of the production? It's not possible because first we don't have more coal in our country. We, we depend from the import from the, from the oil and the gas. Uh, and if we want to have the create the, the price of the electricity, which is very important uh, impact of the of the, of the economy in Macedonia, we must to be independent. And also, uh, the all uh, power plants in Macedonia, it's a uh, it's very bad condition. They are very old. They are more than 30, 40 years old. And we cannot reconstruct that because uh, nobody now give the loan for the building of the power plants who will produce the electricity from the coal. Also, if, if you want in the future to, to continue, we should to, to pay the penalties for that because we will uh, product electricity with a huge emission of the CO2. That means our future is uh, with our own production. Uh, our own production can be possible only if we develop the renewable energy. Unfortunately, now we, uh, we are in the, again in the wrong direction now because uh, uh, we we going only in one production, this is the photovoltaic. And that can be very, very, very dangerous because uh, only photovoltaic panels cannot uh, give us a stable energy system. Also, if we, if we build a lot of photovoltaic power plants, which happened now at the moment, we will have the b second big uh, monument project in Macedonia, that the name of that project will be photo white monument and uh, substations. Uh, that means that uh, in this moment uh, we, we have uh, huge requirements from our distribution and uh, transmission company for the building of the photovoltaic panels, that is several gigawatts. And if uh, somebody doesn't control that, we will be very dangerous. Danger. 
will be danger for the for the investors because a lot of investors in Macedonian. Uh, I know that very well because every day we are EPC contract company. We build a lot of uh, renewable energy, hydropower plants, biogas, and photovoltaic. A lot of investors they don't know that the uh, trading of the electricity is per hour, not per day. They see how much is the price per day. They have the land. They have the overhand uh, line uh, in the, on the land. They think that they have the successful story. They will build very, very fast the photovoltaic plants, and they, very soon they will be rich. But uh, what, what, what will be on the end after several years? A lot of uh, power plants will be stopped it because uh, in, in that period where they produce the electricity, nobody will, will have the requirements for production. The price will be very, 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 very low. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of uh, investors will be bankrupt, and uh, the private investors will be also bankrupt because they take the, the loan the, from the bank, and but they put the the lands, the houses, everything, what all saving, what we have in the life, they put in that project. And uh, also, uh, will be will be will be very 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 big problem for the our distribution and transmission networks, because that project will requirements a, a huge uh, update and. Uh, Building the new line and new transmission lines, and uh, also that that will be the big the, the big problem. So maybe it's the good business if uh, somebody uh, very fast uh, implemented this project, and uh, I think uh, it's uh, it's good direction. It's uh, every company to build on the roof the the photovoltaic power plants, and uh, they to to cover the 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 electricity for home supply. Uh, in this situation, the country must to recognize this because in the future we will have the, the, the problems. Uh, they should to recognize that uh, they should to give some limits of the, of the building, the, the power plants for photovoltaic. And uh, we, it's not necessary to be very clever because uh, our um, engineers, our uh, professor of university, and our, uh, uh, how to say, Academy for the Sciences and Art in Macedonian, they, they prepare some study and we should follow on with that study. What, what right in that study? What right in the study that uh, we should to build all possible hydropower plants? Uh, because if we want to have renewable energy and we want to have the, the stable uh, system, uh, the first is the, is the, is the hydro. After that, we should to build several biogas plant because, but we should be also careful because if we build a lot of biogas plant, in this situation, we will, we will use a lot of lands and uh, maybe we will not have enough lands for the agriculture. Uh, we should to build, should to build, should build uh, more uh, wind parks, but uh, also to be very careful for the stable of the, our, of the power cycle of the system because we are a small country and we have to balance the system. And of course, photovoltaic, but uh, we, we have to have the limit for photovoltaic, and uh, somebody should to explain <laughs> uh, how much is the limit and uh, to, 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 stop to, give, to stop to give the permits for, for, for that. Uh, in the, the future, it's also, uh, we need uh, some, uh, some base uh, electricity, if, if we want to have the, the stable uh, uh, electricity system, in that situation we need uh, production maybe from, from gas, but uh, I'm, I'm a little bit strange why nobody say that from production from gas also is emission of the CO2, is the how from the emission of the coil, so this is also not, uh, not how to say green energy. In that, in that situation, maybe I don't, I'm not so so big uh, expert for that. Maybe we should to join some uh, good uh, project with uh, with nuclear energy, nuclear power plants. We are we will be the part of the, that project. Where this will be some kind of the of the of the base uh, electricity and to build all possible and uh, contribute uh, renewable energy. Okay, that's. That's all I want to, to, to 
to say. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now I would like to open the floor for questions from the audience. Okay, I can see there one hand, another one. Uh, first, I would like to ask how m much time we have for two minutes, just two minutes. A no, twenty. Ah, okay, so we can. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, hello. Is it on? Yeah. Yeah, it's working. Okay. Um, first of all, thank you for the presentation. I really enjoyed it. Uh, my name is Bojana. I'm a student at the American University of Europe FON. And uh, my question is about uh, energy efficient windows. I don't know if you've been informed about this product because none of you mentioned them and if you think they can be implemented in the Western Balkans and in this strategy of transitioning. Uh, for those of you who don't know or haven't been informed about this product, uh, these windows work uh, in a way that they trap like 96% uh, of the heat from coming inside the building or the house. And in the summertime and in the winter, they trap the heat inside. So this helps lower down energy bills. And these windows are primarily sold in the US, especially in Florida, because they combine them with hurricane resistance and they sell out a lot. But they are not sold out in the Western Balkans. For example, if we take out the characteristics of hurricane resistant, I think they can really um, lower down the costs, which is something all of you mentioned. So my question is, do you think these windows, if they were sold out here, would be would contribute to this strategy? Sorry, the question is for? Whoever wants to answer. <laughs> OK. Who will, who will answer on, on this question? Oh, I'm happy to go first. Uh, ju just because uh, EBID covers so many different sectors, not just power production. I think your, uh, your question uh, links to something that can be described as a cross-sectoral solution, because on the one hand you've got uh, a product that is being used for uh, construction of passing, passive homes, uh, energy, efficiency, uh, energy efficient homes. On, on the other hand, you can use that as a source of power generation for, or energy generation, heating generation for, for homes at a greater and integrated scale, also for whole communities. This is a very new technology and the application of that, as you've said, is at the very early stage, including in the US. However, already in Europe and in our countries of operation, we, we are aware of manufacturers of windows of this type. There's a company called Pressglass that EBID is talking very actively too, and they actually are uh, thinking about uh, local production of the windows of this uh, type. And let me just add that EBID also for, uh, covers uh, energy efficiency area for, for construction business. So there, there is financing available for this type of, uh, uh, of products. Uh, let me stop here. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Please. Uh, uh, maybe I can add something so I didn't hear about this project, but just to mention, because this is good, how I say intro maybe for this topic, beside this 3R, there is also 3D, which is currently, I think, one of the pillars of this transition. This is the digitalization, decentralization, and even, if you allow me to say, democratization of economy. So they have much broader context that the rest energy transition. This has also socio-philosophical concept, even you know, this collapse of Fukuyama thesis on the end of the history and so on. There is not enough time to elaborate it, but how you say this topic of decentralization is also one of the pillars of the new rest transition because we have this uh, so-called prosumer concept, which is without any doubt the most useful concept for this transition because you you uh, spend energy in the in the in the place when you are produce it on the other side you have also this demand side response which is uh, the biggest current reserve from the point of view of the balancing of the system and you have this so called digitalization of the overall system currently maybe you are not aware but uh, recently european commission also released some new uh, digital strategy for the new new power system and this is 
uh, one of the, how you say, one way how to maybe uh, uh, make some bridge between this real world and this digital economy, which is all over, over uh, all around us, in fact. So all this uh, preparation for this digital twin, for the some also on our side as a front runner, we are also planning to very soon to launch some cooperation with the blockchain community in Belgrade to try to find some some most uh, optimal way, most efficient way also to implement demand side response for the flexibility market. And we didn't tackle this, but flexibility market future will be very important for this market integration of renewables. Currently, we didn't discuss this, but from my point of view, it's not all about money. So this is something that is about the physics of the system. But this is not, how I say, scope for this panel, but just to support this initiative as some kind of how you say, decentralization and democratization of, of, of economy. Thank you. Uh, there was another question from there. Please, the microphone. And Thank you, thank you for the old panelists for the really nice uh, discussion. I'm Yadranka Ivanova. I'm a legal environmental expert and expert for reintegration for Chapter 27, currently working in Albania. My question is uh, to um, uh, Mr. Duic regarding the analysis that you have made. Uh, I have read that the current production of electricity for the country in the region provides quite uh, sustainable or steady income to the national budget. By increasing the opportunity for the household to produce renewable energy using solar panel, uh, uh, so, uh, solar energy, uh, this income to the national budget will decrease. So there are even some, uh, some, uh, some analysis are made that the gap can be significant. So have you taken this into analysis and how this gap maybe can be replaced and any recommendation on this side have you made? Thank you. Uh, first of all, we have to know that uh, only Bosnia and Herzegovina is not importing electricity. All other countries are net importers of the electricity. In situation when, I'm not talking about this crazy prices now, but let's say it's a calm, prices are going down and uh, from economic point of view, if you could substitute your import with your production, it's always good. Especially in Macedonia, cares that you are importing 30, 40 percent of. 30, yes. Yeah, 30, depending from hydrology. 30 percent of, of electricity. Uh, that's a win win situation because uh, citizens and businesses through the models as prosumers, uh, citizen energy communities, and uh, communities of renewable energies and so on, are producing their energy, spending a part of the energy for themselves. If I produce something and I and I consume something I don't know what that have with the government budget. Nothing. Uh, if government want revenues, the government will get revenues from the part of the electricity which I could sell if I am producing 100 kilowatt hours and I am uh, spending 50, then I will sell 50. And that 50 government will get some some revenues. That means uh, from typically economic point of view, that's a no regret strategy. And of course, for citizens and uh, local businesses, it's uh, cheaper to produce their own energy than to buy energy, because when they are buying the energy, they are depending on the market price. When they have their energy, they know exactly how much that cost. That means I don't see any, any big, big problem in, in that sense. In the, in the other sense, when we talk about energy transition, if you will wait big companies to decarbonize themselves, 
You will not have energy anymore. Because they are very slow. You could not lay on them. Even if you want to lay on them to go to be uh, 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 leaders of the energy transition, you know what's happened in the last two years. They are running out of the money. They don't have a problem of the, what they are producing. Now they have a serious problem with liquidity, operational liquidity. Don't talk about the money for the, for the development. Even in my country, which is net exporter, we are net exporting around 30% of the energy which we produce. We expected that th this year, big energy companies will be in big surplus. Unfortunately, two of them will be in a minus, and we are expecting that the third one will be in a, in a minus. Because they sell energy where it was uh, cheap, then they have a problem with thermal power plants, technical problems. They had to import for 500, 600, 800 euros per megawatt that, and they announced that they are in losses. This means from that side you could not count that you, you could have faster energy transition. From the other side, private investors are willing to invest, and they have to invest. I, I am not saying that I am against private investors. But let's make some rules about it. You have a country which is dying without electricity, and at the same time, all investors are exporting. I could tell you at least three of our six countries which is happening that. This means it has to be some rules. If you want to invest in my country, in renewable sources, it has to be some rules because that's my resource. And also, which is very important, that's a public good, which we forget always. That's a public good. We have to take care about that. Uh, but then you have private investors, which are coming, and they will develop renewable sources without any problems, and you could count on your citizens and your businesses. If you want to have faster energy transition and to be sustainable, if we will wait for, for this silver and magic bullets, which are okay, no problem, we will build nuclear power plant. Who will build nuclear power plant? Where is the money first? Okay, maybe there is a money. Who will run that? You don't have people and knowledge to run that kind of the, of the capacity. That means, you know, if politicians always is trying to look at the silver bullet solutions. You have very complicated problem which will take years to resolve, and they are looking for solution, you know, how we could resolve that with one, with one bullet. In real life, in your life and my life, if you want to achieve something, you are not waiting for the silver bullet, that everything comes together, and you do that. You just start to walk. And that's the reason why I think that uh, no regret strategies. We have to be pushed and supported as fast as possible. Because there are no, no regrets. You could not make a mistake with this kind of, of the strategies. Other strategies, let's discuss how we will decarbonize our electricity companies, what will be conditions under, under which private investors could invest, and so on, so on. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Damir. Uh, I think that there was one more question. Vlina. Thank you. Me again. 
so uh, we were talking a lot today about uh, sustainable and faster energy transition and I'm grateful to all the speakers for excellent uh, presentation and facts that they um, said today. However, I think that um, uh, everyone agreed that this transition is not happening as fast as it should be. So going back to the uh, initial building blocks, um, uh, I have been um, for many, many years been engaged in an international organization and supported development of national climate change policies. So while developing the Macedonian enhanced NDC that Mr. Santo referred to, the NDCs, we have developed a very important document that is called the Risking Investments of Renewables in North Macedonia. So uh, identifying specific risks and strategies roadmap how to enhance them. What was striking is that uh, the initial risks were about uh, basics, about project startup and development about uh, financial institutions, meaning banks not having enough capacity. So we discussed a lot about, about um, lack of capacities in other sectors, but not in financial institutions. And uh, another risk was about scaling up investments. So um, I have two questions uh, for the first two speakers. I am not sure if the speaker from the Erste Bank is still online. And can maybe here. answer. Do we have the speaker from the Erste Bank? No, he is not. Okay, then just one question then. <laughs> okay. For Mr. Uh, Zelinsky, is EBRD uh, considering uh, uh, a smart investment, uh, supporting the countries in um, developing of investment ready or mature projects in preparing the uh, project documentations and similar things or just additional investments afterwards towards renewables themselves. Thank you for the question. Uh, I'm going to be very brief. Uh, EBRD is providing financing, but also facilitating the change, and that facilitation can be done in the context of advising the new regulations. It can only be done in the context of technical assistance for project preparation. So the answer, the question, sorry, the answer to your question is absolutely yes. We tend to provide donor money for project preparation for public sector clients, uh, but from time to time there might be a good reason also to do it uh, for a private sector client, uh, provided that's not putting them in an advantageous position vis-a-vis -vis other competitors. Uh, but the answer is yes. Okay, thank you very much. Any other question? We have, I think, time for one more question. If, okay, please, Mr. Z um, Last but not least, uh, going back to what Mr. Mladenovic was talking about, illiquidity and unpredictability, um, my question is addressed to, um, um, to EBRD. What are the prospects uh, to finance IPP projects in, in, uh, under the current environment versus uh, investments uh, in public utilities? Thank you. Um, as you've mentioned, the liquidity issue, let me just say that in the context of war on Ukraine, EBRD came up with the so-called livelihood and resilience framework. It's a package that was dedicated for financing for Ukraine, but also the neighboring country. And, and as part of that financing, we were aware of the liquidity issues of electricity traders, as exactly about the issues of uh, liquidity challenge for uh, margin calls for future, electricity futures. And you know, th th this is a type of financing that EBID is able to provide and actually is providing to the qualifying countries. Uh, fortunately or unfortunately, these qualifying countries were only the countries that, have, uh, uh, that are neighboring uh, to Ukraine. Because the first idea was, well, there's, a, there's an influx of refugees, who is most affected? So uh, uh, perhaps we need to revisit uh, that definition. But uh, what I want to say is that financing of liquidity is available in the context of the current situation. Your second question, or your main question, is really about the IPPs, producers. Now, this is, this is how we see a potential for acceleration of renewables. Is what, 
you know, we would work with anyone. We would work with public sector uh, companies, we would work with incumbent uh, energy, uh, fully integrated companies. We would definitely work with private sector investors. But there is a group of uh, well-experienced renewable energy developers whose business models was to go from country to country, develop the project, get all the permits, and sell them to a financial investor or sector investor. Those developers very quickly realize that not all of the projects that they are selling are of exactly the same quality. But only they know which are really the true jewels in the crown. And therefore, they don't want to sell them because someone on the buying side will not recognize the full potential of those projects. And for that reason, they quite often want to keep them. And that's a natural push for renewable energy developers to actually think about, oh, do I want to become an IPP? And, and we see that. In fact, last year, EBRD has uh, approved a 100 million um, envelope for matured developer backslash early stage IPPs that want to finance the project. Obviously, they've got an issue with availability of equity. You need equity to finance new projects. So uh, that envelope is available. It has been utilized mostly in Central Europe, in Czech Republic, in Hungary, in Poland, not in, in Western Balkans yet, but I think it's just a matter of time. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we don't have a time for another question, but I would like to summarize what was said during the panel. I hope that the panel was uh, very good. Uh, I, I, would, uh, I would finish with something that uh, I said at the beginning, that the it is obvious that the transition is needed, but it should be green transition, the transition that will reduce the carbon footprint and the transition in which private investors will be involved. In this transition, we have to put more, the government actually should pour, put more attention of the coal region. And the transition, unfortunately for now, is leading by the private investors. We have to change that. We have to invest not just in PV, but we have to invest in other renewable technologies solar, uh, sorry, uh, wind and hydro, biogas and other technologies. Um, we have to integrate the sectors, not just electricity. We have to integrate the electricity with the heat sector, with the transport sector. The integration of, is very important. And uh, also for the transition, the citizens are very important. We have to give more floor to them to invest in solar on their roofs. Uh, we have experience with that because according to the latest statistical data at the country level, around 70,000 uh, 70, of people already installed solar thermal collectors of their rooftops. So we have experience and we can, uh, we can do that. And at the end, I would like to finish with something that was said at the very beginning from the uh, emeritus uh, president uh, of, the, of the conference. Uh, he said that, um, he said that uh, if you want to go fast, we can go, alone, we can go alone, but if you want to go far, we can go together. So I think that in the transition we have, we have to go together. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Moderator. Thank you very much, dear panelists. Thank you very much, participants. I'm sure that all of you would like to summarize the impression by now, as well to refresh yourself. So uh, I invite you for a short uh, 30 minutes snack uh, break in the hotel lobby. And uh, let's coming back here in the conference hall, 10 minutes to two. Thank you.
test, test. Okay, welcome back, dear all. I hope that you enjoyed the lunch. We are continuing with the third panel under the title Financing, Development and Regional Cooperation. The moderator of this session will be Dr. Nikola Popovsky, former Minister of Finance and current non-executive member of the Council of the National Bank of Macedonia. I would like to invite the moderator and the speakers to take their places to the stage for a fruitful debate. Mr. Popovsky, please. Mr. Popovsky will uh, announce the other uh, panelists, please. please. Thank you. Thank you, Goran. I think we can proceed. Yes, okay. Welcome on the third panel. This panel will be a little bit better than the previous one because we are not hungry. And the previous one, the energy was all male. This will be all female speakers. <laughs> <laughs> Development and financing are subject of female attention. Okay. Uh, let me say a few words, and then the speakers will be uh, will take the floor. A few days ago, the World Bank Group President David Malpas attending the G20. Leaders Summit in Indonesia on the beautiful island of Bali stated, I'm citing, the developing world needs much greater resources. Not greater, much greater resources. I will not guessing what he was thinking, but I think that in his opinion, all six and other Balkan countries are, except one, developing countries, because which are, they are not in a high-income countries. Today we are living in a world which is very divided from the point of view of development, who is thinking and discussing about the need to help and build a greener economy, more sustainable economy, more just economy, and even more predictable economy, because we are living in a period of three or four years where predictability is very lower. There is no any predictability, non, not on, only because of the economic factors, but because of the non-economic factors, mainly health or war factors, etc. Also, when we discuss about cooperation, we are living in the period when even on, even on theoretical and also on practical level, we are discussing what is going on with globalization and deglobalization. In our case, it will be cooperation or non-cooperation because the linkages are weak. Are we speaking for a growth or we are influenced by the, this sustainable and green development which somebody connect with the word which is non-common for us or non-acceptable but still exists opposite to growth, to have degrowth. Then to have green development or greener development. To have less or more fair distribution of the income. Nobody says we're against, but somebody says that we need 
more somebody says less fair distribution of income as well as distribution of the wealth in the world. On the top of this, we are facing some relatively bad factors which are flowing in the, in, on the international level. I will cite the Professor Kenneth Rogoff, Nobel Prize winner, well known, a few months ago says, the odds of recession in Europe, the United States and China are significant and increasing. And the collapse in one region will raise the odds of collapse in the others. The risk of global recession trifecta is rising by the day. This word trifecta, I didn't know in English, but probably is very logically trifecta. Since the beginning of this year, calendar year, mainly because of these processes and the war in Ukraine, there is a rapid deterioration of growth, pro growth prospects in the world and in the region, coupled with rising inflation, also in the region, tightening financial conditions and financing conditions, and they ignited a debate about the possibility of avoiding a global recession and contraction in global, in global per capita GDP, as well as contraction in possibilities to finance the growth. In one word, scenarios for the global economy and for the regional economy over the period of 2022 and up to 24 are not very prosperous, let's say. In this bigger picture, where is the Balkan region? What are the opportunities for the financing of near-term development and near-term regional cooperation? On this issue, we will ask these nice five ladies to give us some answer or answers during the debate. I will introduce you them, although you have on the screen. Mrs. Joan Hay, Regional Director for Europe and the Editor, Economist Intelligence Unit, UK. Sandra Svalek, Svalek Deputy Governor of, of Croatian National Bank, congratulate on your recent accession to Eurozone in a month or two. Rosalia Karczynska Vasilevska, MPPM, Regional Economic Growth Specialist and Deputy Project Manager, USAID, North Macedonia. Katerina Boshevska, Managing Director, EOS, Matrix, North Macedonia and Kosovo. And Heriola Spahiu, CEO, NOA, Albania. So I will give a floor in the same order as I read. So, uh, please, Mrs. Joan Hay, Regional Director, you have the floor from Economist Intelligence Unit. Well, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much uh, for the invitation to be here. It's a pleasure to be back in Skopje and to participate in this very important uh, gathering. Uh, so I'm on a panel talking about financing growth and development as an outsider. I'm the only outsider on the panel. And uh, my job, I think, is to talk about the role of foreign capital in uh, foreign capital inflows of all types. Uh, in contributing to growth and development. Now, my, I should say at the start that my own very strong view, based on 30 years of covering this region and the wider transition region, but particularly the Balkans region, east and west, and also based on the wider empirical evidence and the literature, is that bringing about political and economic change and development in this region depends not on outsiders or foreign capital of any type, 
uh, but very much on the governments and business people and citizens of the Western Balkans. Neither democracy nor growth, which this region needs very much, growth I'm talking about, I'm very pro-growth, um, neither democracy nor growth can be brought about through the intervention of outsiders, whether the EU or international organizations such as the IMF or the World Bank, which is not to say that they do not have a role to play, um, but that is not the most decisive thing that is going to change things in this part of the world. The most important thing is that countries in the Western Balkans uh, develop their own national strategies, their own thoughts about the most sensible course of national development, um, and, and, and develop a sense of national self-purpose um, uh, that will enable them to make a difference to the lives of citizens living uh, in this region. Um, and I think after 30 years of this transition, we need to have a proper accounting of the role and impact of external influence and external capital. And there's a lot of research and work still to be done. This is something that we've written and talked a lot about at the EIU over the past 30 years in my team um, among the Eastern Europe panelists. Uh, and I think it's something obviously that the um, um, Balkan Economic Forum can contribute to as well. So just some observations from our own work. Um, you know, the question, the, the major challenge for this region, I think, is um, uh, how to achieve faster catch-up growth um, and, 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 and sustain that. Um, and I think that can also help to deal with some of the region's other problems, political vulnerability. Somebody once said that, um, I think more in relation to you know, comparing what happened in Russia and uh, the rest of Eastern Europe, that growth can pay for the transition and in the sense that it can mitigate some of the pain and difficulties. And I think there really is something in that. So can foreign aid and uh, foreign capital flows help? Um, so by foreign capital flows, we, uh, you know, we mean um, aid, uh, development aid, uh, portfolio flows, bank loans as well, uh, and foreign direct investment. I'm gonna talk about aid and FDI just very briefly. Uh, as somebody said this phrase already in the last uh, session, magic bullet, none of these is a magic bullet. Um, they cannot compensate for other underlying growth deficits, and some can even be an impediment uh, to growth, I would say. Um, and, you know, we've seen how problematic it's been in times of crisis, you know, portfolio inflows causing lots of problems and then outflows. Um, but just to, to start with aid, um, the empirical record of external assistance to the Balkans shows considerable official funding has been extended to this region. Now, the OECD publishes data on this. They publish a huge report that runs to nearly, I think, 1,000 pages, uh, which tracks all forms of aid and development assist assistance. So it's possible, with some effort, to compile the cumulative totals for each of the Western Balkan uh, uh, countries. And it runs into many tens of billions over the past uh, three decades. Now, depending on which uh, kind of concept, there are different concepts, we can't debate that now, uh, but depending on which concept is used, assistance to the Balkan countries uh, over the, these three transition decades has amounted to between something like 2.2 and 2.3 percent of recipient GDP. That's that exchange rate and PPP converted GDP. Um, now, that would compare in relative terms with the Marshall Plan aid, which I think averaged about 2.5% of West European recipients' GDP in the post-war period. Um, and you know, I was just looking at the figures for 2019 and 2020, which is the latest data, um, and, and it's this region, apart from Ukraine, um, uh, this region is among the top recipients, obviously, of aid in Europe. 
uh, according to the OECD. The EU institutions are the main donor. They account for about 41% of the total. Germany accounts for 14%, the US 10%, the UK 5%, Turkey 5%. Uh, so where's this money been going? And what's been the impact uh, on growth and development in, in the region? I don't think I've got time now to talk about some of the differences between this type, this type of aid, development aid to the region, and the Marshall Plan, but I think the differences are important. First of all, a lot of this aid has not gone directly to economic support. A lot of it went in humanitarian assistance, obviously in the early um, uh, years of the 90s, early 2000s, after the breakup and war. Um, so it's, it's not... Um, uh, been uh, economic aid. It's, a lot of it's gone into social, educational, health, crisis relief and, and other areas. Importantly, a lot of this aid has not been extended as part of a coordinated development programme. A good percentage has been spent on Western advisors and personnel. Another difference is that 90% of the Marshall Plan aid was in the form of grants. A significant a proportion of official funding to the Western Balkans has been on the basis of commercial or only partly concessional terms. So that's, um, uh, I think, a very important difference. So the, the point I want to make is that, um, you know, look, having looked at this in some detail, there's a tendency to overestimate the positive effect of aid flows on growth. Um, and based on the empirical evidence and the vast literature on this, there's very little evidence of a significant link between development aid and growth. Um, and, and worse still, aid can encourage dependency and stunt the development of domestic enterprise. Um, so the payback is not great. Now, the contrast, the data also shows a disparity between these official aid flows uh, and the generally smaller amounts of foreign direct investment that's come into the region. Um, and uh, so kind of net FDI flows in, on balance appear to have been much lower than aid inflows, although there's been some rebalancing, particularly over the past decade. Now, um, according to all the evidence, FDI has a positive impact on growth. Um, as opposed to other types of, of foreign inflows. And FDI is especially important when domestic investment and savings are low, which has you know, been the case in this region. Now, what are the potential benefits, so the lessons, and what, you know, what should we be thinking about in terms of the future? I, I don't need to spell out to this audience, I don't think, what are some of the key benefits of FDI as a vehicle for uh, technology transfer, for managerial organisational know-how. Um, FDI can promote uh, competition in the domestic input market. Um, there's employee transfer uh, benefits, uh, contributing to human capital development in the country. Uh, profits generated by FDI contributes to host countries' tax revenue. There's some negative effects, obviously, as well, but they're usually outweighed by the positives. Um, and, and usually what happens is that FDI also helps to spur uh, domestic uh, investment as well. There are many other positive spillovers, which maybe we can talk about afterwards, because I'm going to run out of time now. Um, but what we can see is that FDI, insofar as it's come into the region, has brought about significant improvements in telecoms, banking, other sectors. Uh, uh, foreign investors have lobbied for better corporate governance, inspired improvements in tax, customs, practices, um, and, and made privatization process more transparent in, in general. Now, it's also had a very big impact on the balance of payments, and I think most importantly, the impact um, in terms of spurring export-led growth um, um, and through the creation of locally-based, internationally competitive enterprises. But the FDI inflows have not been sufficient. They peaked kind of around 2006, 2007, then slumped, came back um, a bit before the pandemic. Uh, Serbia's probably been a bit of an exception in attracting very large FDI inflows in recent years. So the, just to finish off, what is to be done um, for the future? Um, I think that, um, well, 
this, we, we don't need another Marshall Plan. We don't need more development aid. I think that what countries in the region need to do is um, do things that make sense for them, regardless of whether they attract FDI or not. Countries with very scarce resources um, need to focus on the achievable and prioritize. Um, so I think really basic things, obviously ensuring political stability is quite important. But as I said, developing a sense of national purpose, working out a development program, a national development program that works for you, regardless of the acquis and the, and the adoption of the acquis. Um, having the right balance of macro and other policies is also important. The policy framework goes beyond um, just um, FDI promotion. It's what's important is business environment reforms, and those are what are really going to spur um, growth um, and, and domestic investment, as well as attract um, FDI. Um, in terms of the role of accession, this is my final point. Um, according to the conventional wisdom, uh, EU ex accession is expected to impart a further boost to FDI into the applicant countries. Now, it's true that to some degree, um, uh, the accession process can serve as an anchor for reform, but given its very imperfect application to this region, that's been um, um, in, in question, I think. Um, but certainly in, in regard to the Visegrad countries in the past, that has been the case. But I, I think the main lesson that we've taken from the work that we've done and our research is that provided that um, as a country you have secured um, market access through trade liberalization, which this region has now, um, there's very little evidence of any further independent impact on FDI of EU of EU accession. Um, so you've gained access to uh, EU markets. Uh, if you're politically stable, if you improve your business environment um, and, and have privatization programs that encourage foreign sales, uh, you can attract significant amounts of FDI irrespective um, of geographic factors or the lack of EU accession prospects or delays to the process. So, um, thrown out a lot of things there, wasn't able to cover an awful lot, big topic, but that's my view. Thank you, John. John, you raise a lot of important issues. Some of them we can debate during the Q&A after, if there is interest. Now we proceed with uh, Mrs. Sandra. Please, you have the floor. Good? Okay. So once again, I would like to greet you on behalf of the Croatian National Bank, and I would like to uh, thank the org organizers for inviting me to this inspiring gathering. It's very nice to see all of you here, and uh, especially to see uh, as many young people uh, here. So uh, I'm very glad that you're here. Uh, today, my intention is to share with you uh, the creation experience with almost one decade of its uh, EU membership and uh, the experience uh, with the Euro accession, uh, and that is uh, well underway. Uh, since all the Western, Western Balkan countries have uh, demonstrated uh, their sincere ambition to become a uh, member of European Union, I, ha I hope that a Croatian case uh, can serve as an example. Uh, I would also like to stress the role of cooperation uh, with uh, the other countries, especially with the neighboring countries and the ones we share uh, the uh, history with and uh, we understand our languages uh, as well. And uh, I would also like to express our willingness uh, from Croatian National Bank to support and collaborate uh, with Western Balkan countries on their way to achieve the same goal. Actually, earlier in the morning, I was a little bit saddened when, when I have uh, heard that Mr. Uh, Alexander, uh, in his introductory speech, has mentioned the same proverb that I intended to mention. 
Uh, but then I decided to repeat it because I think that it conveys uh, very well the message that we should convey uh, during this gathering. And that is, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you go, want to go far, go together. So uh, I think that uh, this is something that we all share here that uh, we would like to co cooperate, collaborate, and uh, well, uh, coin our way to, to the better future together. But looking back on a decade of Croatia's uh, EU membership, it is obvious that foreign trade is one of the areas uh, in which the positive effects of joining the common market are particularly visible. Here I would like to share with you uh, some numbers, better to say the orders of magnitude, not the exact numbers, which are not uh, as important as uh, the orders of, of magnitude. And the first is that uh, in Croatian case, uh, the Euro, uh, European Union membership brought, uh, brought the growth in merchandise trade. Actually, the merchandise trade almost double from 2013 to 2021. Uh, Especially uh, the uh, volume of exports to EU countries has increased. It has actually more than doubled. It is now 114% higher than in 2013. Uh, what is also important is that trade openness increased by one quarter of the GDP. It was uh, some 59% at the beginning in 2013, and it is now 82% uh, of the GDP. It is not only that we have seen the improvement in the volumes, but we have also seen the improvement in the structure of uh, foreign trade in, and exports. Uh, so the structure of merchandise export has improved and now there is a higher share of high-tech products in total merchandise exports. Also the product concentration of goods export decreased, so we don't rely anymore on exports on uh, few, uh, few goods. Uh, the degree of inter-industry trade increased as well, especially in the categories with higher added value. The share of exporters among the companies has increased as well, and the average and median export intensity of goods, ex goods export, uh, export increased. Uh, you probably know that Croatia is a tourist country, so uh, the export of uh, services have gone up as well. So uh, the export of services was in 2019, that means before the pandemic, some 76% higher than in 2013. However, this should not only be related to the export to the tourism, so to say, because uh, also the exports of other services like telecommunication, computer, and uh, 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 IT industry went up as well. So uh, even the services excluding tourism went up by high 73% uh, within these uh, nine years. I would also like to mention one thing that is very uh, often on, on our mind when we talk about uh, entering uh, Euro, uh, uh, European Union, and that is uh, EU funds. So uh, Croatia now has access to quite substantial European Union funds, and uh, they became one of the key drivers of domestic growth. Actually, they're now the key source of financing for pub of public investments. Some 80%, four-fifths of uh, all the public investments is financed uh, through the EU funds. Uh, so net allocation of EU funds was relatively low in the first years of our EU membership. However, this percentage went up and in 2022 it was almost 4% of the GDP. That, is, that was the total size of investments funded through the EU funds in Croatia. 
Actually, the role of EU funds became even greater during the pandemic because we got access to the new instrument called new Next Generation EU, which will provide for additional 11% of the GDP uh, throughout the period of six to seven years. And uh, this, these funds uh, will also uh, enable uh, our economy uh, higher resilience because these funds will be earmarked uh, for twin transition, actually, the digitalization and climate transition. Uh, what is also important is that uh, the absorption of these fun funds is strictly tied up with ambitious reform agenda. So I have mentioned some elements that are, that are really beneficial and come as uh, the result of um, EU membership. However, there are still problems, uh, economic, societal, and other problems in Croatia. For example, we still have large regional disparities, uh, which are visible not only in the development of infrastructure, but also in the living standards. In some parts of Croatia, not the coastal part that you probably know very well, there are people that live in relatively poor conditions. So we still have quite a lot to do. However, as some have said, have said, problems are not the stop signs, there are guidelines, so we know what to do in the, in the next period. What, all, uh, what I would also like to mention is uh, our uh, 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 very soon Eurozone accession. You have mentioned that at the beginning, so as you probably know, Croatia will become a, a Eurozone member on the 1st of January 2023. So that is the new big change for, for Croatia. Uh, as uh, we have assessed, there are uh, manifold and uh, permanent benefits of uh, our, our uh, euro accession, uh, such as the elimination of foreign exchange risks, uh, greater resilience to financial crisis, lower interest rates, lower transaction costs, and, and uh, so on. There are, of course, a uh, few costs, but in our opinion, those costs are one-off. They will happen only once, and then they will vanish, like the one-off uh, changeover costs, or the one-off impact on the price level. There are many people that fear that the very euro adoption will push infl inflation uh, 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 further, higher than it is now. So, uh, we expect some benefits from Eurozone accession. However, we, we already perceive uh, that uh, even being a candidate for Eurozone accession brings some benefits. For example, during the pandemic, uh, we have signed with uh, the European Central Bank the swap agreement, uh, which actually prevented uh, the depreciation devaluation of our exchange rate. It remained very stable throughout the pandemic. And now we also see that uh, Eurozone accession has already uh, uh, positive effect on the reduction of risk premium. We have uh, calculated, we have tried to assess at Croatian National Bank what are the possible uh, already present benefits uh, of a Eurozone accession on the reduction of risk premium, premium and it turns out that uh, our CDS spreads is currently some 60 basis point to 100 basis point lower than it would be if we were not uh, the candidate for Eurozone accession. Uh, at the end, I also wanted to mention what I have uh, 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 mentioned uh, uh, briefly at the beginning, uh, collaboration and co cooperation matters. Actually, uh, in the first decade of, or two after the Croatian independence, uh, Croatia has re received quite a substantial assistance from various international institutions and EU central banks. But gradually we have matured and now uh, we, re we receive bilateral requests for technical cooperation, mostly from the Central Bank of Western Balkans. And uh, I'm sure that um, my colleague from uh, the Central Bank of uh, 
the Republic of North Macedonia can prove that. We uh, also participate in the program for strengthening the central bank capacities uh, in the Western Balkan Balkans. Uh, we have prepared um, uh, uh, various training programs and for uh, the Central Bank of the no Northern Macedonia, we also uh, participate in uh, one bilateral me measure. Actually, uh, the, the, the first result of that measure was a document describing the roadmap map with recommendations for the bank's EU integration pro process. I hope it, it was beneficial. Uh, at the end, I want to conclude uh, with the main message, uh, both from our experience, but uh, also from the experience of the, the other countries. Um, I would like to first stress that uh, it is beneficial to become EU member. Uh, however, uh, European Union membership is not a panacea. Uh, actually, it is like all the other things in, in life, what you make out of it. And uh, my personal message would be, uh, European Union is not only about money. It's nice to have additional funds, uh, additional access to the EU funds. However, uh, it is not only the EU funds that uh, European Union membership brings with it. Uh, the second message is that there are no shortcuts to development. Uh, like always in life, uh, much hard work is needed, a lot of learning, a lot of determination, focus, and open-mindedness. Uh, third message, there is a lot to be learned from the peers, and what is quite good and uh, beneficial, the peers are willing to share them, their knowledge with you, with you. Finally, my message would be that uh, collaboration gained uh, even higher importance uh, that, than it, it had now. I would, uh, I would also mention one word that was coined in the private sector, and that is competition. So, even the private sector has recognized the importance of collaboration and does not only uh, compete now, but also uh, strives to learn from cooperation and collaboration. Collaboration is especially important in the current er era, that is the era that we are entering now, and that is the era of increased complexity, increased interdependence, increased risks and uncertainties that you have mentioned at the beginning, not only coupled with the geopolitical crisis, with uh, climate change, but all the other uh, crises that might uh, happen in the future. And collaboration is even more important in the era of uh, the constant change. And maybe, if I can mention that, uh, if we from this region, from Vessel Balkans, Balkans, are good at something, we are good at coping with the change because we have lived through so many changes throughout our lives. So let us make the best out of this, this talent and this experience. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Sandra, for your interesting speech. Probably the most used words was cooperation and collaboration. Yeah. There is a lot of people from governmental institutions here, National Bank, Academia, Chamber of Commerce, and others in financial sector, influence people. So I hope they remembered those two <laughs> magic words from your experience. Okay, thank you. Uh, we go further. Now the floor is open for Mrs. Rosalia from USAID. Rosalia, please. Thank you. I would like to use the opportunity to uh, thank to the organizer of this uh, event for the possibility to present some of our programs. Um, I'm, I'm just again seeing my name and actually it's uh, 
not only representing USAID in North Macedonia, I'm more representing the Regional Bureau for Europe and Euro-Asia, because what I'm going to, um, to present you now are the regional programs, which means that programs that are covering Western Balkans 6 and even broader region from Euro-Asia. So thank you again, and I will ask these kind gentlemen behind the IT techniques, if possible, to use the, to put the presentation on. Uh, we were debating with uh, the professor, should I uh, put the presentation on, but there are some graphics and some bullet points, which I think believe that are uh, speaking more for themselves uh, and counting with some, uh, you know, usual statistics. If there is a 27 pictures in the, in this presentation means that I'm going to save almost three hours in speaking and explaining. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, please, next slide. And next slide. Okay. So, uh, why uh, USAID as International Agency for Development is focusing on the regional programs beside the bilateral programs that we are all more um, hearing uh, that are present in the, especially in the Western Balkan five countries because Montenegro is uh, having no presence of the USAID. Uh, because regional programs send, are bringing uh, the regional economic integration as a topic, as one of the main driver for the development of the region. As according to the World Bank statistics and estimates, it shows that if we are working and collaborating Western Balkan countries, we can generate additional 6.7 GDP growth, and that should be reaching the level of integration of the EU single market. Then economic, uh, regional economic integration, it is actually very natural when we are speaking about the Western Balkan region, region that we can capitalize on including the common cultural, historical patterns, the low labor force, the legacy uh, relationships that are coming from the previous Yugoslavian Federation. And this is more implying on the industrial sectors as a textile, then tourism as a nat naturally regional um, industry where we are also taping. Um, one of the regional programs, uh, programs as well is um, very well working in the trade facilitation. When we are talking about the trade, it is obviously that its regional approach is uh, something that is must. And then again, I will mention that um, it is for investors. I was listening the first speaker uh, when we are relying on the FDI investment. It is much more attractive to see the region as a region of 22 million inhabitants rather than around 2 million inhabitants. So next slide, please. As I said, um, the regional programs of the USAID are based on these uh, benefits of the regionalization, and we are all agree today that collaboration and regional integration should be something that most of our countries are actually designing to, to achieve. Um, we can skip this one and go on the next one. So currently there are two programs, regional programs of USAID that are running on. One is shortly known as EDGE, that is Economic Development and Governance Program. It is a five-year program, 21 millions, and, and I mentioned that this program is mainly working on a trade facilitation, collaborating with SEFTA and with other regional institutions that are facilitating this. Then uh, uh, another uh, components of this program are working with the competitiveness of the small and medium enterprises in a tourism, agri-sector, vegetable processing, wood and textile, and cross-cutting digitalization. Um, the program is in the fourth year of its implementation, but we are hoping, as this is the flagship program of the uh, Bureau for the Europe and Euro-Asia, that something similar will come. Um, 
For me, um, I would like more uh, to focus today on the second program, which is actually access to finance, and this program is so-called Engines of Growth. Um, it is, again, a four-year project, and the budget is near to 10 million US dollars. We have three objectives which are uh, underway, and um, I will present you on the next slide some of the results. So the first objective, so-called Window 1, is working on the mobilizing private capital to the SMEs who are impacted by the COVID uh, recession and uh, recently the invasion on the Ukraine. The second one objective, uh, which we are calling Window 2, is a facilitating alternative financing to the SMEs. And I will uh, um, focus on this little bit on, um, can you, uh, can you turn back the, the previous slide, please? Okay. Um, and I will um, explain a little bit what is going on under the window two. And the window three, because um, not only access to finance, but as well the companies are looking how to improve their access to the markets. And we are supporting and helping access to Markets mainly means foreign markets, as the U.S. markets and other markets that they are targeting. We can go on the next slide now. So here are some uh, brief uh, presentation on the data. And these data are only for North Macedonia, so we are taking out of the pool of the regional data. Some of these which are saying that um, in North Macedonia we have... Uh, almost in the pandemic, in the COVID time, um, interest from the companies to take the loan and the grants from the financial institutions. Because the project assumed that not only the banks are uh, places where the companies are going and asking for uh, um, finances, they have also included and worked with the Fund for Innovation and Technological Development and some European programs and grants which are also very desirable. Um, I would like to mention that smaller companies uh, mainly are focusing more on the grants, so they would like to receive uh, finances which they, they should not turn back later. Next slide, please. So Windows 2 is something that we are um, uh, considering as a core of the project because it is actually facilitating the alternative sources of financing. What that means? That we have, um, through the co-design process, opened the call for the institutions and companies who are dealing with this um, topic in their uh, portfolios to apply and together with us to work on what will be alternative sources of financing. Considering that in almost all six uh, Western Balkan countries, the bank policies are pretty much restrictive and strict when it comes to the collateral, to the how to secure the, uh, the, uh, the credit, the loan, uh, these nine um, companies, organizations, institutions collaborate in the uh, two or three months uh, co-design process and come up with the alternative financing mechanism. Some of them being like a private equity fund. Another is uh, equity partners who is supporting and developing the pipelines or pipeline of SMEs. Then we have reverse factoring, meaning that uh, the short term uh, debts are covered by the factoring company, Petrokov. Then we have alternative um, um, and online platforms which are easier in the banking procedure for the companies. We have some of them being present today here with me, and that is NOAA, microfinance organization from uh, Albania, from Tirana, who is supporting um, small producers uh, in order to cover their uh, need for finances. I will mention that also in Bosnia and Herzegovina, we have very alternative uh, organizations who are applying for the venture capital, establishing venture capital in the digital and telemedicine. 
Some of them are also uh, mentioned here. And um, the last, which are uh, bulleted on the, our uh, uh, right side, are those who are uh, helping companies to establish easier access to markets. Next slide, please. So what have the results shown so far? I'm talking about this regional program, NGs of Go Growth, which is access to finance. It shows that the companies, even in the time of the pandemic, when nobody was sure what will be the next day happening, they were looking for the loans and credits to invest. So we have, in the first two years, which we didn't believe, we have achieved the one-third of the projected goals. It means that 88 companies uh, successfully access 110 million US dollars through the grants and loans. And this, I believe that it's amazing result, having again in consideration that 2021 was still pandemic year and that the companies were, many of the companies were not sure if they are going to survive or not. But some of them use the opportunity and consider this crisis as an opportunity for growth. And we have as well established these eight, nine new financial products and services which are available to the all Western Balkan six countries. And I will finish with the next slide, please. This is, these are one of the activities in tourism, in custom administration. And next one, next slide, please. And we can skip this one because we have talked. I just would like to mention the two new projects, original prog uh, projects that are coming up. One will be in the investment transparency. The first is the landscape analysis and the assessment, how and uh, what are the procedures for the investments to be established in one country. And the second one, which I believe that it is critical and very important. It is the future of the workforce development. And here I will stop. The next slide is only to show that these regional programs have a bunch of collaborators, partners in the region with whom we collaborate because not only for the countries, the donors are also aware that need to collaborate and coordinate their efforts and to do what is the best for the country and for the region. I will stop here, but I'm also very welcoming the questions. Thank you. Thank you, Rosalia. I hope there will be questions on this after, after, the, after we finish the, all the presentations. Now we go. Uh, the floor is open for Katerina, who is coming from EOS Matrix international company, which is FDI in Macedonia. Please, thank Katerina, you. have the floor. Thank you. Thank you to the moderator. Uh, and thank you for the opportunity provided to uh, be here and speak on this panel. Uh, I will try in my speech to focus on regional cooperation from the terms of uh, why we need it, and maybe make one concrete proposal how uh, to make it. So. Um, let me start. Um, to create uh, the appropriate uh, conditions for uh, enhancing, advancing the business environment in general, it is necessary for all institutions and all stakeholders on uh, domestic markets to step forward with uh, one integrated, systematic and multidisciplinary approach in finding new solutions. I here must, I would like to point out uh, appropriate solutions for uh, uh, per se uh, optimal functioning of internal markets. Now, uh, why uh, is it important for the uh, European Union that we have uh, operating uh, functional internal markets and internal markets to be, uh, to operate as efficiently as uh, possible? Well, um, according to my opinion, the answer is, uh, and can be as short as this, the growth and integration of the overall uh, European economy will be significantly aided if uh, we have stable internal markets of its uh, countries. Uh, so let's narrow it down. 
when uh, there is uh, unrestricted capital flow inside the market, uh, it is said that for that market to be developed and more importantly functional. Uh, when there is nation's legal framework that encourages entrepreneurship and enables it to thrive in a free market, uh, when uh, there is a system uh, that gives economic subjects, the companies in particular, a second opportunity when uh, their uh, functioning, functioning is impeded, then we have uh, functional internal markets. A stable and functional internal market um, has a number of components uh, which, if presented, enables um, for that market to be seen as uh, better integrated. In, for, the, for today, I will focus on four more, most important. The first one is the free flow of capital. I think that we touched this, uh, this topic uh, at the very beginning. For example, making provisions for the local legislative framework to encourage long-term investments. Or developing a business climate that, that, provi that provides the failed entrepreneurship a second opportunity. Uh, the second uh, one is the e-commerce sector. For example, promoting electronic trade by making payments conditions and options easier, more re reliable, and more competitive. Or maybe standardizing electronic procurement processes in government. The third component is consumer trust. And finally, the fourth one, and one of the biggest challenges uh, in the development of European internal markets in the last uh, decade for now, is the implementation of the digital component. So why, uh, why we need to pay a great attention to the degree of the development of, uh, of internal markets? Well, because over the years, the European market and therefore the markets inside of the member countries developed in a synchronized and organized manner. And with that, the conditions for joining a new member to the European Union became stricter or more difficult uh, and more complicated. So that is why I say that um, an advantage and uh, a precondition for wider regional cooperation is only, uh, is only seen through one approach towards full harmonization of local legal framework with the markets of the European Union. And for achieving this, we need first to look in our close environment. So the examples from our neighbors and countries with similar systems are an excellent uh, blueprint for us. Uh, in them, we should recognize all elements that can be applied in the domestic market, which will directly contribute to its improvement in its long-term stabilization. So um, creating one coherent and similar environment is always beneficial for the business sector. In such environment, exchange is much more um, easier Communication is much easier because understanding is on a, on, on a higher level. So consequently, opportunities uh, for cross-border uh, activities or cross-border um, uh, actions will be significantly improved. Uh, in, from that perspective, individual markets will increase and experiences uh, will be exchanged. Results from the company, for the companies will be multiplied. But um, slowly coming to the point of how, for this to happen, uh, a space for exchange of ideas and expertise is really necessary. Uh, a space which will enable constructive dialogue and um, joint creation of uh, solutions. Such example is the, is the new platform that was launched, uh, Finance Talks by EOS. Which, uh, by which we create an opportunity for systematic change uh, through transparent communication and exchange of insights, analysis and expertise on current topics of the great importance for the financial uh, world in our country. This platform was mainly inspired by the successful stories of the financial institutions in uh, Europe, among which is uh, our EOS group. The overall aim is to bring European trends and practices much closer to the financial sector, not only in our country, but in the region as well, taking the advantage of us being present uh, in all the countries in the region. We want to provide the space for the exchange of expertise and experience between distinguished professionals uh, and experts of the industry, uh, but by following the purpose of changing finances for the better. 
So we consider that the dialogue should be encouraged within the finance community. Discussions should be encouraged amongst the expert and audience. And specific but relevant topics in the finance industries should be identified and targeted. With already two events behind, this platform has proven that it provides a channel for constructive dialogue amongst the stakeholders, addressing the experience and expecting the emerging um, challenges uh, which the financial sector is facing at the moment. The structure of, of the platform relies on the local and international expertise and efforts for the application of the innovative models for financial management of the domestic terrain. What we really need is um, this opportunity for uh, better efficiency in addressing the challenges, first of all, as well as an opportunity to raise awareness towards international trends and practices which could be applicable uh, in our local financial market. We need to be put differences uh, aside and come together with a common goal in mind and to improve the market conditions not only locally but even regionally. It is becoming obvious that while navigating through these challenging times, we need to act as a system with a shared vision and goal in mind. And when great minds come together, uh, no task is impossible. So we as uh, EOS are ready and we recognize our role in the financial world and we are more than happy to take it upon ourselves to push forward this um, game-changing mindset in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you, Katerina, for focused and well-structured address on the forum. And now we go to Mrs. Spahiu from NOAA Albania. And the Ruar Zonia Spahiu, you have the floor. Um, I'm very pleased, first of all, to be present in this very interesting and important conference and um, we as um, practitioners like a financial institution in operation uh, are very grateful to participate um, uh, along with the other uh, actors of the whole ecosystem from the policy makers uh, the government uh, and also the, the our other partners because i think that only in this way um, we can definitely make it more practical um, uh, and start defining concrete action plans for transforming uh, the policies towards a green environment and green strategy, and especially when it comes to the financial development or the regional cooperation. Um, I will try to um, uh, start with, a, or let's say, I will try to, to manage it in a, in a holistic approach by uh, starting with the development, how we consider it, and what are the key factors that we consider as important, how we relate it and how we translate it in our daily job uh, within our institution. And then we can see it, uh, how doing finance uh, in a human way uh, can boost finally development. Uh, and this in turn uh, can further strengthen uh, the regional cooperation. Um, how uh, we define a, a, a good development. Uh, we see that has to be sustainable, and we have spoken throughout the whole day today about sustainable development, uh, because we are now under very um, uh, different economical conditions, and uh, under the high environmental uh, costs associated with the global warming, it's not anymore a choice, but it's becoming mandatory uh, to respect the environment and definitely to make a better use of the current resources. It has to be consistent uh, because uh, it's not enough to have a good year of economic growth uh, and the next year to be fluctuating. Um, it's good to have a small growth every year, but stable for many years in order to see it um, uh, like a, with a perspective for the future of the countries. It has to be shared, the development, uh, because it is proven uh, in many countries that we can face a development trend that translates into a GDP growth ratio, but not necessarily this is transferred to the wealth of the citizens. 
uh, and especially when the GDP components uh, are depending on high capital sectors like energy, infrastructure, mineral extractions. Unfortunately, Albania is one of these countries that we have faced for more than a decade if we exclude COVID, uh, a constant GDP growth, but we have not seen it uh, directly translated to the health of the people. It has to be replicable, the development, because if growth affects only one sector at a time and it's not uh, transferred to the, to the other sectors of the economy, we cannot call it a steady or a sustainable development. Um, we can have a great tourism <laughs> sector, but if we don't have the skills or the qualified workforce to serve, um, it will not last forever. We can have great factories, but without uh, the uh, necessary people to work within it, it cannot be called like a, like a success for, for the economy of a country. And so development of the workforce, I'm glad I saw it in one of the projects that uh, was presented for the future of uh, USAID, uh, needs to be replicable to every sector. Uh, from the infrastructure to the education to the tourism, even to the IT. Development has to be accessible. We can have growth, uh, we can have money flowing, but if the regulatory policies are very tight, if the, there are deep cultural and geographical barriers, if we have protectionism, if we have corruption, if we have hidden networks uh, that do not allow accessing of exports, uh, all these impede the normal development. So accessibility needs to be there for development to occur in adequate manner across all the levels of the society or the geography. Why we at NOAA as a financial institution try to count on these five sectors of the development and why we promote a development impact finance through a human finance and in a human way. In terms of sustainability, uh, yes, we do finance our customers and yes, uh, the installments of, the, of those loans has to be paid normally throughout the tenor of the loan and there's no science behind it, calculators do it, mathematics do it. Um, what we do is we adapt these repayments of the loans according to the life cycle of the business according to the life cycle of the farmer in order to create a sustainable economy for them and without jeopardizing their activities. And this has proven to be successful and fitted to their needs um, because these calendar flexible installments allow our customers really to be sustainable and to also manage difficult periods like pandemic uh, or like the earthquake, the earthquake that we have in November 19. Consistency. More than 22% of our customers have been in our institutions for more than two cycle of the loans, and more uh, than 7% of those, of those customers are with us for four cycles of the loans. Mm -hmm. Uh, why that? Because we have chosen to consistently support their financing need. It's not enough to support a hotel in the seaside only for uh, making, I don't know, uh, a refurbishment inside or just uh, changing the facade. These are activities that every year, every two years, needs additional investments for refurbishment. Uh, every three years, they will need an intervention in the heating and cooling system. Every four to five years, they will need an intervention for changing the uh, solar panels. Uh, and definitely, it's a continuous job that we have been engaged to sustainably and continuously finance in order not to create problems to their um, uh, everyday business. How we see it for our financings to be shared. We consider ourselves responsible when giving on financing. Res responsible to uh, the achievement of this investment for the good of the customer. And what we have done, we have developed, aside from the financing, a very uh, large range of advisory services that goes before, during, and after our financing as a package to the customer. And we are there present in order to um, uh, create the good grounds or to take care even in moments of, of difficulty. Uh, we have developed our advisory services with a high focus in agriculture because it is a specialty of NOAA, the financing of the small farmers. Uh, we have developed that recently uh, in the energy 
uh, sector because we see it uh, really a demand right now. And independently that Albania, uh, it is a um, um, uh, an 100 energy producer through the hydro plants. Uh, again, for the for the families and for the people, uh, we we see an increased demand and an increased need for uh, jumping from the uh, energy usage. Uh, uh, the electricity usage for, for their needs, especially the businesses, to be transferred to the uh, solar panel and to alternative ways of the energy for uh, managing their business needs. Uh, we have also started uh, to develop uh, advisory services in the export field, considering the fact, or starting mainly from the need after the uh, difficult situation with Ukraine when uh, we had quite a lot of difficulties and increased prices from the imported goods from uh, from Ukraine and from um, uh, uh, other countries uh, in order to see it as an alternative way to develop the, lo the local production. Replicable. Um, when we use best practices, in fact, we don't see it only as a competitive advantage of ours, but we are glad to be innovators and to bring, to bring best practices because in that way we challenge the market and we increase the barriers. So we are very, uh, very, very uh, glad to see that from 1998, the microfinance sector in Albania has been changed a lot and has been transformed from a, a traditional field microfinance now in a fintech microfinance. So trying to provide fast access uh, and a large access to the customer at their businesses and not necessarily for them to come to our offices. Um, in fact, uh, uh, by developing um, uh, the data warehouses, the analysis, the credit scorings, it has helped a lot, not ourselves only, but also the other uh, institutions operating in the same field, uh, to bring the same best practices and to invest in order to improve the customer experience finally in the market. Accessible. Uh, it's a good point now that technology has facilitated a lot the provision of the accesses uh, of the financial instruments to the customer. Uh, in Albania, we are glad that in the last five years, uh, the financial penetration uh, has been increased from uh, 60% five years ago. Now it is close to 70%. Um, so it's quite, I would say, a good, um, uh, a good jump considering that we still have 45% of our pe population in the rural areas, meaning still low education in financial products and low access for the, high, for the technology products. Um, and so we have provided with a high access either in our branches, either through our partners, either online, either through our referral networks, either through our loan officers being in the field with tablets to process the loans in order to uh, be um, a very uh, or a highly accessible institution for any financial need of our customers. And if we go to the, to the question, can we impact national development and regional cooperation? Um, is yes or and no, in fact. Sometimes we say, okay, with our good ideas we can impact. Sometimes we feel very small in the whole ecosystem and uh, including all the actors um, uh, that should work together for that. And I'm again going one by one to the same criteria on the sustainable uh, development. In fact, I was very glad that uh, our institution participated a few weeks ago in the uh, first first Ohrid Balkan uh, Blue Economy Summit. And uh, I, I like to extend also the uh, co uh, uh, congratulations for this organization to the organizers. It has been quite uh, excellent and it was um, a unique event when the discussions were uh, fully about the water, the environment, the tourism, the agriculture, and of course the sust sustainability. And it was, um, it was taken into a regional cooperation. So that was basically the best of the, of the, of the event organized. From the, other side, from the other side, for the first time, we had such event after 32 years that communism fell out of the region. And it took so much time for us to have such a regional event and speaking about the, the green economy and what we can do all together in order to boost the impact. Um, however, uh, my point in this case is twofold. Uh, sustainability has been for so long 
as we see it as, Balkan, as, a, as a Balkan country, a promotional policy rather than a concrete action plan involving also the impact-driven actors like ourselves, for example, but the other uh, financial institutions as well. And second, sustainability is a great instrument for a win-win situation in boosting the regional cooperation. Consistency. Uh, prior to Govit, in Albania, we had also another um, unfortunate event, which was in November 19, the earthquake that created a lot of problems to the uh, very small businesses uh, in the area and also to many families. Uh, at that time, um, the government um, uh, designed a guarantee fund in order to support the most vulnerable and affected businesses uh, and, and um, uh, uh, individuals in order to uh, uh, continue with the job uh, um, maintenance uh, and the employment, not, not creating interruption in the employment. Unfortunately, and uh, surpri surprisingly for us, the uh, non-bank financial institutions was, were not involved as part of this guarantee. So this guarantee was only dedicated to the banks, but not to forget that our small customers are not, are not customers of the bank, and these are the most vulnerable customers that can be immediately affected from this uh, tragic events. So, uh, taking this experience, bad experience, uh, I think that uh, at a regional level, um, we can do more. If we can create, um, let's say, um, regional uh, crisis guarantee scheme that can be of a bigger size, uh, that can be available for any of the countries that can be affected at a certain point, I believe that the impact would be greater, the impact will be better, and definitely uh, more inclusive uh, for all the uh, affected parties. Um, shared. Um, we share the Lake of Ohrid, but in parallel we share also about 30 million people, if we include the diaspora as well. So um, uh, we need to have an economy of scale uh, in order to create a stronger development for the region. Uh, for me, it took to, to come here four and a half hours drive from Tirana um, through Pristina. It's a good thing that it, the road has been shortened due to the motorway uh, in Kosovo. Uh, but from the other side, why not to have direct flights within the uh, capitals of the Western Balkan countries? It will not be more than 15 or 20 minutes flight to reach. And this can definitely intensify the business cooperation and the movement of the people. Uh, why not to have direct um, uh, railways to facilitate the movement of the people and definitely the economic exchange between the region. We have a lot to exchange. I would opt for the railway <laughs> because of the carbon footprint. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, and similarly, uh, we can share uh, financial products, we can share financial markets, financial products. In Albania, now we are um, initiating to issue a corporate bond, the first public bond, uh, in order to, crea to create liquidity for the support of the small uh, businesses. And why not the investors to be from all other Balkan countries? So companies from North Macedonia, from Montenegro, from Serbia, to invest on that. We think the ne our next bond will be the green bond dedicated to supporting the agriculture. So why not this... Uh, these uh, financial instruments not to be shared through common stock exchange markets or through other uh, common financial platforms, I believe that the impact can be greater and we can achieve more than just uh, the action plans that we try to follow within uh, our own countries individually. And um, finally, uh, replicable and accessible. We need a lot to learn from best practices. We are all the time looking who is doing better than us, what we can do better, how to bring the Western European experiences in the Balkan countries. Uh, yes, because ourselves, we do not have also the financial ability to do researches and also to do huge investments. So we try to benefit from different EU funds and grants to invest even in our softwares uh, and also to, uh, to see what is it's going better um, for the customers in the EU. And why not also to exchange the best practices that we have in the Balkan with each other? 
Um, it's not now, anymore, it's not any secret. We as no are going to uh, enter into the Kosovo market. Uh, in order to um, replicate our fintech microfinance model to that market as well. And uh, why not to do it also in the other uh, countries in the Balkan? We started with Kosovo because the market there is easily accessible for us. Language, uh, which is a barrier there that does not exist. We speak the same language. Uh, but also in terms of the uh, uh, bilateral economic agreements, there are some facilities. But we would like very much to create partners and to start with partners in other Balkan countries. And why not to create these uh, business models replicated in order to have a greater impact in financing the smaller businesses the smaller farmers with better and faster financial products. Um, at the end, I believe that uh, this, um, this event uh, will be concluded that there's no question anymore that shall we go for a regional cooperation. The question will be when we will start the actions for the regional cooperation and who will be the actors, what we need for that to start and how we can do it as fast as possible. Thank you very much. Thank you, Heriola. Now we come to an end of the presentations and addresses. I am very aware, uh, Professor Sasha, that we are running extremely out of the time, but it's not only this session. So there are two more to follow. So I propose if there are questions to be short and focused for answering to have time for the other sessions. Is there is any question? No. We have a question? Okay. No, I have uh, something uh, to Rosalia. add because I forgot it uh, in my presentation. I mentioned that one of the two regional programs that are coming will be workforce development for the future. And I would like to invite those who are, and I'm going to listen the next session, which is after this, but those who have interest uh, for this topic in January, the team from Washington will come in order to um, work on the co-design of this uh, new program, regional program. So if you have any kind of interest or topic is related somehow with your work uh, in your organization or institution, please. Let's share the context, and I'm trying to. I will try to invite you in January on the focus group discussions. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So we came to an end of the session. Thank you for your patience. Thank you. Hvala vam. Falimenderi, vi blagodaram. When everything is clear, everything is clear. Thank you, Mr. Moderator, for this fruitful debate. Thank you, Mr. Uh, panelist, all panelists. The fourth panel that I would like to announce is titled Reskilling and Upskilling of the Balkan Labor Force. I would like to invite the moderator of this panel, Mr. Zoran Martinovsky, president at Prime Point Partners Macedonia, and the speakers to take the, their places on the stage.
Dobro, dobar den, a good afternoon. Mladene, tebe čekamo. All right. So, uh, first of all, um, I want to uh, congratulate Sasha, Professor Joseph, for, uh, for this great event. Uh, congratulations, uh, uh, impressive event, and um, wish you all the best in the future with, with organizations of similar events. Now, um, uh, since we have a panel composed mostly of private sector participants, I would like to make it more dynamic. So, and it's also um, 3.30, so um, short introduction. So I'll, I'm going to cut off you know, this lengthy introduction just very quickly about myself. I'm a, I'm a development finance professional. I used to work for 20 years in this development world, and now um, uh, since a couple of years ago, uh, um, I established Prime Point Partners together with uh, uh, my colleague Biljana Markovic Tabenova. So uh, we'll be speaking from that angle, you know, private sector. Now, uh, the topic is uh, uh, about upskilling and reskilling, and I would say cross-skilling in the Balkans. Topic very well known, uh, uh, translated into Macedonia, pre-qualificatie, uh, pre doc something which has been going on for many, many years. Uh, but uh, now, you know, uh, this uh, latest technology trends are imposing different dynamic uh, and, and urgency about this topic. But speaking about skills in the Balkans, you know, uh, has its other context and um, uh, just to sort of boost your energy, I'll tell you a joke. A joke which I heard on a similar conference on a similar topic. And uh, uh, a joke or, or an anecdote, I, 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 never, I never figure out, but it goes like this. EU, we don't have any EU representatives anymore, <laughs> so we can speak freely. EU uh, decided uh, to launch a tender to send a man to the moon, you know, using sustainable energy, green, you know, green rockets. So um, only, but it was a very risky, you know, project. So only three candidates applied: uh, a German guy, a French guy, and a guy from the Balkans. And um, so um, the German guy offered one million euro. The French guy offered 2 million euro, and the Balkan guy offered 3 million euro. So they invited all the participants just to, you know, to, to better understand what's inside behind that offer. So the German guy says, look, I'm probably the best candidate, and, uh, but, uh, and I'm giving this for free uh, as my contribution to the humankind, but you know, it's a risky mission, so if I don't return back, you know, this 1 million would go to my wife. French guy says, look, the French guy was slightly behind the, you know, from a technical point of view, behind the German uh, guy, uh, guy's offer, but two million, and said, why two million? Well, you know, uh, um, I'm also giving this as a contribution to the humankind, but uh, because it's a risky mission, so this one million would go to my wife, and the other million would go to my lover. And then the Balkan guy says, then how come that you offer three million? He goes, my offer is by far technologically the most advanced, so at par with, with the others. And then why three million? Well, first of all, he says, talking to this EU guy, he says, first of all, I need one million to pay you to, uh, uh, to get the project. Um, then uh, I need one million. Um, you know, um, to pay my wife in case I don't return. And the third million, I need to pay the German guy to send him uh, to the moon. <laughs> All right, so, uh, but t today we'll speak about different skill sets, you know. We'll talk more about technology and how it changes, you know, the, um, um, the profile basically of uh, the skill sets needed uh, and that will be needed um, in the future. And uh, we have here a distinctive uh, group of panelists from, um, from Triglava to, to Vardara. <laughs> from Vardar to Triglav, you know, there is an old song. Uh, and um, we'll, we'll, um, uh, uh, we'll
will start first with Anna and Jay. Anna is the CEO of Sasha Incubator, um, good uh, um, partners and friends of, uh, of ours. She's leading one of the best business incubators in Slovenia. Uh, they are actually raising startups from zero to hero, as they say. She has uh, rich experience in the field of startups, creative thinking, and uh, connecting the startup and corporate world. Vesby platform recognized her as one of the 25 top women from VC and startup ecosystem in Slovenia. The floor is yours. Hello, everybody. Uh, first of all, I'm really happy to be here with you and presenting our story of the success which was built in our small town called Valenia. You probably all know the city by the company Gorania, which have home appliances, and it's really well known also in the Balkans. So uh, I prepared for the short introduction a short video. Uh, please, uh, so that you can feel the vibe, that uh, you can actually see what are the things that we are doing in the field of working with startups and how we actually we are upskilling and reskilling our people from the Slovenia. Like you probably noticed, uh, we are really working hard to create that energy because the energy is the thing that moves everything forward. That's why uh, we established Sasha Incubator like seven years ago. Uh, I don't know if you know, but Valenia is uh, well known as a coal mine city and a lot of people were actually working in the coal mine and in the Gorania company. That's why, because people already had the opportunity to work in these big corporational systems, small and medium enterprises didn't develop. So uh, seven years ago, uh, there was a lot of skepticism, like 
okay, and now you will do the magic. A few people believed in us, but we believe in our mission and we believe that we can create magic because we are a dream team and uh, that's how uh, we decided. So, okay, we don't have startups. We don't have a lot of small and medium companies. Okay, but we can find a solution. Okay, we don't have it, but we can raise them. So we started to work with uh, different target audiences and giving them the proper knowledges that they need for their personal and business development. So uh, first step is uh, definitely changing the mindset. And I think that working with the young people from the high school and to the universities is the really good key to the success. Because uh, we, we think that it's not necessary that a lot of these people will actually open their own business, but they will definitely have the proper mindset so that also if they be a, a really good employee. And what's the definition of a good employee? That's a person that can think outside of the box. That's a person that sees the solution for every problem and not the problem for every solution. And by doing like startup weekends, hackathons, uh, working closely with our companies, uh, we managed to develop this program and a lot of people that started to work on their business ideas and uh, going to our workshops and events, today they actually built their own companies and they're already employing our people. The second thing is, okay, now we have the people with the proper mindset, but the second stage, uh, by our opinion, is, okay, let's give them the right knowledge. And we already heard today that these are the soft skills, soft skills that we need for the people that they will be the good workers of the future. Because we don't know what the future will look like, but at this point, we are facing the fast development, the autonomous cars, artificial intelligence, but still there is a lot of jobs that technology can't do it. Technology couldn't, can be creative, but humans, we have the right energy to create some magic. So the second step is our program to give them the knowledge. So we developed the program, uh, Startup Generator and uh, Business Trampoline, in which we accept the teams, startup teams in the face of the idea and empower them with the right skills so they can learn how to think different, how to develop their business model, and in the end, how to get to the market, how to do the marketing, and we empower them and give me all the knowledge that they need to be successful. So uh, in the video, you can uh, saw this uh, startup generator, which is our third pillar, is actually accelerator program for our startup. In, uh, but they have to have uh, just the MVP or working prototype and through also structured program which lasts like two, three months, we give them the right skills. And at the end, we also with uh, the um, really strong collaboration with, uh, with our municipality of Valenia, we give them also the money, the first money so that they can actually scale and they can move fast break things and really be uh, successful. So uh, the first, the fourth thing I think that is, is uh, our program Investment Academy because we give them this first money, first, uh, first ticket that they can start. But the second thing is we must give them the opportunity through the venture capital, angel investments. So we prepare the special program in which we we are uh, connecting investors with startups and also to give them the right knowledge. So how to be a good investor on one side and for the startup, okay, so now what, how, what do I need to know and how to be prepared for the investment? Because if there's no chemistry between the investor and the startup, 
it's probably not gonna be so uh, beautiful story and it uh, will end up like dirty. And the fifth uh, pillar of our programs you already saw is the Future 4.0, which we developed because we are in industrial environment from Valenia and a lot of big corporations are having a problem how to innovate, how to be creative, how could, could be different. And on the other hand, we have startups which, have, which are fast. They're moving fast, they are innovative, they are creative, they are superpower. And uh, we developed this program where we are combining both worlds, so the startup world and the corporate world. And uh, this is like four years lasting program. Last year we also opened our flat platform, FutureX, where we are connecting startups with corporations from all the Balkan regions. So um, I think that through our programs, we found the secret formula to success because uh, during these seven years, uh, with the help of Sasha Incubator, we established 97 new companies that are innovative companies, and those companies today are uh, giving the jobs, they are employing uh, 155 people. And we are talking about Valenia. It's a really small town, and I think that we managed to get the things done, and uh, I think that the future will be bright. Thank you. Uh, really encourage you to to go to their website and, and, and check their programs. Uh, we, uh, I'm sorry, uh, uh, you know, uh, we had a chance to participate uh, on, on one of their events, and uh, probably you saw that older gentleman there, you know, the Pipistrel. Pipistrel, who knows, who knows about Pipistrel? Not Slovenians, and the others. <laughs> who knows about the Rimac? Rimac cars. All right, Pipistrel, so Rimac is electric cars, right? The, the best electric car in the world, right? And uh, Pipistrel is the largest producer of electric planes in Europe or in the world? Pipistrel. And uh, Pipistrel means uh, uh, bad, uh, uh, shishmish. Uh, <laughs> and this is how it, how it started, you know, enthusiasts who started with you know, flying these uh, Delta plants, now are the single largest producer of electric planes. And imagine that the energy that is being created around an innovation, which is changing the, the skill sets of, 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 uh, mm -hmm. of the entire country, I would say. And by the way, you know, yes, last night they told me that it got sold, and I checked the value. 242 million euros acquired by a German, a German company, right? Okay. Moving, moving over to, for the south, to, uh, to Belgrade, to Dragana. Dragana uh, is, uh, uh, Marjanovic is economic inclusion spe specialist with the world, uh, sorry, with the EBRD, European Bank for Reconstruction and Development, and um, Dragana uh, will, will tell us uh, about the EBRD's program in the Western Balkans countries. How do you support initiatives of this type and how do you support directly companies that have pursued, you know, upskilling and reskilling programs as part of their corporate strategies. Dragana, the floor is yours. Thanks. Uh, yes, well, you, I'm not the first speaker here today from the EBRD, so you've heard a little bit about our efforts when it comes to the transition to green, the green energy transition. Uh, but we also have a strong uh, interest and work very much in terms of uh, the transition to inclusive uh, society, so to say. And when we talk about inclusive societies, uh, this can mean various things. It can mean uh, access to finance, it can mean access to services, but also access to jobs. And in this case, we know uh, that skills are one of the most key uh, elements to this, uh, to this formula. Uh, but we also know this is a huge problem. I mean, we see this also if we look at, for example, uh, the uh, growth of employment and, uh, uh, and uh, other economic indicators, we can see that actually the productivity is very low in the Western Balkans, which signals, again, poor skill sets. If we look at uh, research that is conducted with employers, 
we hear over and over again, skill sets are not adequate. People, young people are coming out of the education system not possessing the skills we need. And actually, uh, many companies and researchers are citing this as you know, one of the top two to three uh, problems when it comes to uh, doing business in the, in the Western Balkans. But we also hear this when we talk to our clients, when we talk to companies that we work with, when we talk about their challenges, and this is at the core of our approach, that at the one hand side, we, we work with our companies uh, to understand their challenges when it comes to human capital and to help them resolve them in order to become more productive uh, and, and to be able to, to uh, 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 reach their potential. Uh, and on the other hand, obviously, we kind of in, uh, involve this inclusion side because by equipping young people, women or other uh, uh, people with skills that will help them find employment, we're also achieving. So the idea is that this is a win-win situation. It's, it's good for the economy as a whole. It's good for uh, the individuals as, as such. So we work with, uh, with our companies, as I mentioned, um, uh, to first identify the, the, the challenges ahead of them. And in some cases, I'm, I'm very glad actually to have at this panel with, uh, with us. Uh, uh, we'll be hearing two stories, so I won't go into them in much, in much detail, one from Serbia and one from, from Macedonia. Well, the one in Serbia, we're just on in the very initial stage. We're still to start our, our cooperation in developing this, this skills development program. Uh, but we do help our companies. In some cases, these are uh, in-house training centers that are, are developed as a kind of fast solution to, uh, to this uh, existing uh, skill challenge. In other cases, we help them uh, establish uh, partnerships with uh, education providers, also through dual education programs, which are more and more uh, uh, present in the Western Balkans. Some countries are more advanced than others in, in this type of, uh, of education. I mean, maybe for the better benefit of the public, this basically means uh, that uh, students, so usually a vocational uh, high school students, uh, would spend an equal amount of time during their education, during their formal education, uh, in the classroom uh, doing kind of, you know, theoretical learning, but also with partner companies that are partnering with the high schools to actually learn on the job in a real work environment and, and as such uh, acquire the skills that are particularly needed for the particular company and really become fully, you know, productive and independent, so to say, workers uh, uh, as they complete their education and, and enter into employment. Um, also, we, uh, we support uh, uh, and promote um, uh, structured, well-designed, and uh, uh, um, how should we put it, uh, internship programs with defined specific learning outcomes, and we work with uh, our clients to uh, equip their uh, employees with mentorship skills to be able to actually work with these young people when they come for internships, so that the internship isn't, you know, this old story, bring me a burek, bring me a coffee, but that actually you know, these young people, when they come for internships, they actually have a, a program to follow and actually uh, leave the company with, um, with some particular skills. Um, we work, I mean, here we'll hear stories of two private sector companies, but we also do this type of work with, uh, with our clients in the, in the public sector. Um, projects are developing also within the energy sector. Uh, within uh, uh, within the railway sector, so there's a there's a lot of uh, 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 stuff going on, and I mean the need is obviously huge. <laughs> so this is this is what we what we really see, and from the openness of our clients to to uh, to tackle these issues with us, uh, we see that really the the, the need is is, is tremendous. Um, we also have something in the Western Balkans which is quite specific and not uh, a typical type of uh, a typical EBRD approach, which is uh, kind of standalone, so to say, uh, uh, initiatives. We were calling the private sector youth initiative. Uh, they are currently active in North Macedonia, uh, in Kosovo, uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina. We'll be developing one also in, in Montenegro. And it all started off with an initial program in, in Croatia, uh, which is essentially a wider scale program um, to actually attract uh, uh, and improve basically the, the um, ecosystem for internships in, in the country and basically uh, uh, involve as many students, companies, faculties uh, together to actually produce and deliver uh, quality, uh, quality internships. Um, 
But I wanted to mention a third thing, which is maybe a bit outside of what, uh, what we had imagined. We discussed a bit last night about the panel, and I think it's really important to mention that apart from this work that we're doing on the kind of company level uh, and working directly with, uh, with, uh, with young people and, and uh, companies, well, not only young people, it can be various uh, uh, people that are you know, in the workforce, uh, we also believe it's really important to engage in, in, in policy dialogue that, you know, all of these efforts and uh, we can call them actually kind of, you know, exhorted solutions that, you know, a company is simply faced to set up this, you know, invest <laughs> millions in setting up a training center to, you know, train uh, uh, workers when we are at the same time, all of us from our pocket each month basically investing into the, you know, paying into the budget of our respective countries to develop an education system that should be actually somehow uh, also uh, uh, delivering on this. So we believe uh, it's really worthwhile and we uh, we do work closely with uh, with ministries of education in, in some of the countries in the, in the Western Balkans, uh, most notably in, in Serbia, but also in Albania, uh, in, in, with some of the ministries within Bosnia and Herzegovina, it's a bit less. It's it's uh, uh, the structure of the state is, is a bit particular, so they have several ministries of education in each in each canton, uh, and. I think that, you know, uh, despite, you know, uh, somehow a level of, of, of distrust that may exist, I mean, every once in a while we do run into really uh, excellent uh, uh, public servants, so to say, and people that are really trying to, to make changes in the system in this sense, and we're seeing some positive results, and in particular in relation to the dual education uh, uh, policy reform, where we're working in, in Serbia on this also, but also in Bosnia. Uh, but another uh, uh, field and approach that we think is very valuable and very useful and where we really see uh, the importance of the involvement of the, of the private sector, of employers in general, uh, uh, is actually um, what is called sector skills councils. It can be called in different ways in different countries, but the idea behind it is to really get at the same table uh, the education policy makers, the education providers, and the employers, and really have an open uh, exchange and in, in information sharing where the employers will be able to have a, a, a channel to voice their concern, their needs, and, uh, and impact directly uh, the, the development of, of uh, new education profiles, qualifications, curricula, it may be just a bit of tweet tweaking, it may be an entire new qualification that needs to be uh, uh, recognized and, uh, and developed within the education system in response to all of these technological developments and changes. So, uh, yeah, we've been supporting uh, the ministry in Serbia quite a bit already with this respect also through, you know, generation of knowledge to inform the, 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 the choices and the, de the decisions of this sector skill council uh, in terms of, you know, s skill gaps, assessments, most demanded occupations uh, in particular sectors. Uh, and recognizing that actually the biggest challenge is the involvement of the companies and actually uh, uh, I guess it's a question also of trust and breaking this, uh, this, this silos of, you know, the, the public sector and the private sector. Uh, that there is a recognition that what is lacking to make these sector skill councils really responsive and really do what they're supposed to do is better input from the, from the employer side, from the private sector. So we're actually now going to be uh, engaging in this uh, exercise to assess uh, uh, the, the structure, the way that the sector skill councils have been working up to date, and to basically provide uh, recommendations and to help them reshape these, uh, these sector skill councils so as to allow for more targeted uh, uh, input in, uh, from the side of the, of the company. So it's, it's, it's an exciting uh, journey, <laughs> so to say. But we're doing uh, similar things in, in other countries as well, but I'll stop now <laughs> and pass on to the others. Thank you, Dragana. Um, yeah, it's, um, I mean, it's really a, a, a amazing that uh, um, um, such a prominent institution like, like EBRD has recognized the need even to go to, to that, you know, granular level to, uh, to support, you know, companies apart from providing financing means, you know, lo through loans and equities and other financial instruments, really to recognize the needs to, to provide support with this I would say in-house uh, uh, upskilling and reskilling programs that would ensure the long-term competitiveness, basically, of, 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 of your clients. And we'll get back to that valuation, basically, of the skill sets, you know, uh, what, what, what uh, uh, um, 
and we've had some some incredible examples, you know, from the region. But but we'll speak more in the second round about that. Now I would like to move over to to um, Mladen um, Moisilovic. Um, Mladen comes from Čačak. Um, uh, is, is that West Serbia or West Serbia? West Serbia. Shumadia. Okay. Shumadia. Yeah. Um, a beautiful, beautiful part of Serbia, and I had the opportunity to visit Mladen a few times. And uh, I can tell you, uh, it's uh, an emerging Silicon Valley, I would say, uh, when it comes to light uh, manufacturing um, um, competencies. Um, Mladen is uh, is the founder of Stax Academy, which is an Again, an internal academy is part of uh, Stax Technology. It's a company which is um, uh, producing machines for. Um, uh, Mladen, why don't you speak about your company? You know, sure. why, why should I be doing <laughs> yeah. that? Please, sure. the floor is yours, and I'll tell my impressions uh, later on. Thank you, thank you for the kind words, Zoran. First, and uh, I would like to thank the organizer for uh, inviting me to participate in this panel as well as to the audience for sticking around. I know it's a, it's a bit of a long day. Um, I'll, I'll be talking about this topic from the perspective of traditional industry or machine manufacturing industry. So it won't be too much theory or theorizing. I will get right into real life case study that we actually did. But in, in order to do so, I, I would like to say a few words about a company so you get a better understanding of what, what we do. So Stax is basically a top tier European manufacturer of packaging machines for tissue and paper industry, as well as machines we produce conveyors and pelletizing systems, which is robotic hands and, and stuff like that. So it's, it's, a, it's a high, high technology combined with more traditional mechanical production. Um, we've been experiencing incredible growth. So uh, since, 2012 or 13, we, we started with 30 people and we ramp up to 400 as of this morning. So uh, forecast for the next two years or by the end of 2025 would be 650 to 700 people. Uh, we are also located in, a, in a Čačak, which is West Serbia or Šumadija. It's a kind of saturated labor market. A lot of small uh, companies, so it's been a fierce competition to win over the hearts and minds of the manufacturing workers predominantly, uh, which kind of got us thinking how we can find the talent. And before I move on to that, I, I would also like to note that uh, Stax has not, don't have a fortune to be involved in a serial production, which means that we produce a tailor made or custom made machines, which automatically means that we need a highly skilled workers, the, the type of workers that you cannot train in matter of weeks or, or a month, like automotive, it's, it's, it's a highly skilled workers. And then we start looking at, for example, National uh, Labor Agency. For the manufacturing workers we're looking for, which is CNC operators, welders, uh, there was zero at the time in 2019. So end of 2022, the situation hasn't changed. So for the last four years since we track it, there was zero available workers on the market. But then we look at a statistic a little bit further, and in Shumadia region, the unemployment rate is 13.7, which is a little bit higher than the national average. And which is more interesting, youth unemployment is 28.7, with even higher incidence among women and among people from rural areas, which kind of help us to define our target demographics for, the, for what we want to do. Uh, therefore, we found this tax academy. But I'll get into a bit later. So I want to, I did the analysis. I would like to mention a couple other things that we're facing, a couple other issues. The second would be outdated educational system. Uh, the, the, the graduate vocational, uh, the kids, the graduate high school, vocational high school, don't have a required skill set to, to transgress or transfer to the workplace. Just to illustrate, on, again, on a local example, in Chachak, we have two vocational schools and around 120 kids enroll each year for the profi profiles we're in need. After three or four years, depending how, how long the education lasts, zero of them are, are capable of working on, on our machines. And those 120, majority of them fall under that youth unemployment. So we can really rely on formal education. 
On the bright side for formal education, the, the new dual education, the law has been passed. So we slowly enrolling. I heard that it was done in 70s and 80s, maybe Zoran remembers, but uh, uh, this is relative, no. <laughs> but it, 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 was, it, it was a joke. So uh, it, it's done in Switzerland, Germany successfully for the last couple of decades. So the idea is to combine the paid apprenticeship in the companies, in our case tax, and typical theoretical knowledge in vocational schools. So instead of working with these kids on a reskilling project that lasts for six months, uh, and ROI for that program is 18 to 24, we can actually work with them by the age of 15 to the age of 18, and they could easily transgress to the, to the workplace. The, the second thing that we're facing, unlike the, our colleagues from different IT academies, a lack of interest for traditional careers. Uh, it's hard to expect in 21st century for a kid to wake up and say, I have a dream, I want to be a CNC operator. So uh, we had to do a lot of storytelling, a lot of employer branding, and we need to uh, kind of uh, give them a pride, give them pride of, of working at such a machine, which is tough. There's, they're not even millennials now, they're Gen Z, if I'm not mistaken, so it takes a lot. TikTok do the job, so we have the page there. Uh, the, 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 the second, the fourth thing actually is that the private sector itself is not very interested to participate in such programs. So we, we see in a local area on a couple of occasions that uh, owners of the companies would rather I don't know is that political correct term, but imports the workforce or labor force from uh, countries that are even less developed than Serbia, for example, which is Bangladesh or Thailand or India, which is a short-term and cheaper solution, but not on the long run. And perhaps the last and maybe even the biggest problem is migration. Uh, we, we see that more and more people are moving to uh, EU countries and we see that even some new regulation has been passed on how to easier obtain the work visa, especially for Germany. So, for example, in, in our company, in just last two months, we lost five people for, for that. So it's kind of hard to keep um, competing with, with more developed company and higher wages. So that's for, for introduction. And we can talk about Sex Academy later on. Thank you, Mother. Um, moving over south, usually, uh, to, uh, to Vesna Ivanovska. Vesna is the general manager of uh, a Sivus Education Center and a deputy manager of MASIT. And um, Sivus is now called differently. Aricoma Digital. Aricoma Digital. Uh, so Sivus is one of the uh, uh, great examples how a local company, similar to Pipistrel, but this is in Macedonian terms, can be um, uh, sort of uh, um, successfully exited through a strategic sale to a uh, foreign investor. Vesna, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Soran. Uh, I know it's difficult to introduce me because I'm usually wearing these multiple hats, being a, a general manager of Sibus Education Development Center, a leading training center for IT skills. Uh, also, I am a program manager of the Cebus Accelerator, first tech accelerator here. Uh, 15, company, uh, 15 years uh, with Cebus Group, one of the uh, biggest uh, software development companies uh, here in the region and now uh, hopefully internationally. Uh, but today <laughs> I'm in a, a little bit different role and it's, uh, I'm really delighted actually to, to represent Masit. Uh, ICT Chamber of Commerce, so organization that is uh, embracing the interest and uh, uh, standings of the ICT community, the most progressive, I would say, sector uh, in the country and uh, obviously elsewhere uh, in the world. So thank you for being here. I'm, um, I usually uh, live and breathe with the topic, so upskilling and uh, Reskilling is something that we are doing uh, almost every day because within Sibus Education Development Center um, in the past 12 years we've um, successfully, uh, let's say, changed lives of more than 10,000 uh, students or 10,000 beneficiaries 
of our company. We are a for-profit company, uh, but I'm especially proud that uh, this uh, uh, idea of having internal training center uh, was um, anticipated 12 years ago by a privately held company, Sivus Group. So Mladen, I was lucky to be with the company that um, indeed realized where we are going and uh, we uh, launched a spin-off company, for-profit company, so the company I'm running is for-profit company, and we uh, developed our own specialized uh, long-term, I would say, 12 months program so for everyone who would like to launch a career in IT, can come and learn from scratch. Um, I will just uh, mention one figure in order to maybe bring closer to you the, the, the performance of our training center. The employment rate of our beneficiaries is between 75 and 85 um, percent, measure, measured in three to six months after graduation of our programs. So 75% employment rate coming from non-formal education provider is, uh, I would say, stellar success, especially for this part of the region. But now let's go to uh, the, most, the more challenging uh, narrative for me. I was inspired by Anna. She said something like, the, yeah, we, the humans are creative, the technology is not creative, but I would say that technology with the help of humans could be even more creative. Thanks to AI, for example, artificial intelligence today, we can enjoy some brand new Shakespeare play, for example, and it's fully, it's, it's very, very successfully mimic the, 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 the human mind in, in that sense. Or let's move it to here, to Skopje. Uh, thanks to artificial intelligence and machine learning, we can enjoy the beautiful voice of Blaze Koneski reciting his poems. So artificial intelligence is here. I mean, it might sound futuristic yet, but it's here. And in order to <laughs> sound even more provocative, I will bring to, to this table, to this floor, a couple of, um, I would say impressive, but in the same time, frightening figures. For example, um, a World Economic Forum, uh, uh, has this uh, latest survey they, that by 2025, uh, 85 million jobs will be displaced. What does it mean to be displaced? That means that essentially the labor will be divided between machines and humans, almost 50-50, almost which is, if you ask me, really frightening. And people are always like asking the, this question, where are we going? I mean, we are definitely going into brighter future, but it will be the challenging one, definitely, because of these figures. Or again, uh, same source, by 2030, one billion, one billion jobs should be completely reinvented in that sense, because the advanced technology requires completely new skills. And um, this is something that is in the same, in the same moment, I would say, uh, as I said, impressive, but it might sound frightening. On the top of this, the second parallel narrative is that um, maybe in the near history, we are facing the most dramatic labor shortage all around the Europe. Labor shortage, which means that companies, successful companies in Germany, Austria, uh, Macedonia are struggling to, uh, to find employees that are enough skilled, that are appropriate for the jobs and for the titles they are prepared to offer. Uh, in Macedonia, in ICT, 5,000 every day. 5,000 people are lacking this morning. In Serbia, my latest Latest information is that approximately 15,000 IT professionals are um, literally nowhere to be found at this moment. And I, I believe that now uh, more than 200,000 on the European level, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, so if we are facing uh, job di displacement, if we are in the same time facing labor shortage, and on the top of that, 
unemployment, which is again, an uh, gender or women under representation. So what have we done wrong? Except for being a little bit late, I would say. So we haven't done anything wrong. It's simply the technology is developing with the speed of light, I would say. So uh, everything is really dynamic and changing. And I'm here today actually to justify one thesis, one thesis that we are proving almost every day that um, traditional roots in formal education are history. We should forget about this. It's not that the education, the formal education, um, is lacking a quality or the authorities there are lacking willingness. Willingness. It's simple. It's too fast for them because they're system and because they cannot adjust so, so fast, let's say. And um, another, I will, another, uh, another a very important um, aspect that we are hearing maybe here and there, but uh, still not um, taking seriously enough, is uh, how the workforce, now workforce um, in different industries, not only in ICT, is changing um, in sense not only, not only uh, uh, regarding the hard skills, but regarding the concepts and expectations they believe they deserve as future ex employees. Uh, let's put it this in, in a, uh, let's say, a better way. Um, the current active um, labor force are predominantly Zoomers, Z generation. So these are coming after millennials. We, we thought that they are complicated. But Zoomers, Z generation, is a generation that is expecting that you as a, an employer you will provide them a multiple roles within the same environment. So basically we don't have this strict job description or definition what exactly we need. They want to simply change hats depending on, the, on, the, on, the, on their vibe, depending on their interest. And this is why informal and non-formal education could give them very, very um, quick, very quick, let's say, uh, dose of education, of information uh, served in a very, let's say, um, hands-on based and project-based project -based way and methodology. And finally, this is my last, uh, my last point, maybe. There are a lot of things to, to, to talk about. Um, we are talking about a technological investment, but we are not putting, let's say, sufficient focus to a gender gap at workplace and underrepresentation of women in uh, progressive industry. Let's say in ICT, we all lack people in ICT, but they're fantastic, talented, modern women that could be easily requalified or reskilled. Uh, during uh, uh, through this kind of intensive programs. In our academy, for example, we are supporting um, uh, women from vulnerable groups. Uh, so we are basically providing scholarships for them in order to retrain them in the field of digital marketing. And marketing is, um, sub, let's say, supporting supporting field and supporting role in almost every business nowadays. And this is this is a fantastic opportunity for, for many, many, many women, let's say, that uh, usually are taking more traditional roles, which are less paid, of course, and this can, uh, again, help in breaching another problem or overcoming another problem in, in society. And there are many more opportunities. My final thought would be that uh, uh, let's stop playing this blame game who was not like, who, 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 who does not um, complete their job, either universities or a private sector. Um, let's embrace this um, phenomenon that um, life span, lifespan of, of, of every skill set is shrinking more and more. So basically, we, we should um, live finally and enjoy maybe the fact that we will change uh, roles, positions, interests, affections, 
industries, if we want. And uh, this is uh, what we should teach our kids, that they should change during the course of learning. And of course, that they should go to STEAM education because that's the best one at the end of the day. So uh, uh, this is all for me now. I hope I, I, I covered. Vesna, you covered a uh, <laughs> number of, uh, you know, I would say, you know, uh, crucial topics here. Quality of education system, mindsets, cultures that prevents us from, I mean, us, as professionals, us as parents, us as investors, to, to make smart decisions. I mean, just, I mean, um, um, I know that Biljana is eager to, uh, to present, uh, you, know, the, you know, basically her work in, 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 the, in this area. But I, I, would, I would only say one thing. I mean, this reminds me of the time when the, previous, I mean, when the founder of CIVUS returned from Sweden 15 years ago. When he came to us, you know, we were a group of like, you know, bankers, and when he presented the idea, we said, well, look, yeah, this is kindergarten. I guess what, in, 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 in less than 15 years, you know, it, it became a miracle. I even have another example from Serbia, you know, um, Nordeus, uh, uh, somebody heard about Nordeus? One, so, because, because you're from, from there, Nordeus, is um, um, uh, produce one product, and that's a game. Apparently, the most famous game on, on, on Facebook for, I don't even know for what, but it's a, huh? for football. Oh. Uh, Nordeus was sold last summer for 380 million euros. Those are three kids from Belgrade. And, and, and they are based in, in um, Novi Beograd, I mean, have huge building. And, and again, you know, when 10 years ago, they, they, they approached, you know, probably uh, other bankers, that, you know, uh, they received the same answer. You know, it, you know this, is, this is kindergarten. No, it's not. It's serious. Anyway, Biljana. Um, uh, Biljana Stamenova uh, 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 Markovic. Uh, Biljana is the CEO of Prime Point Partners uh, uh, and the co-founder and... Uh, um, and Biljana will present um, uh, her work in, in the area of upskilling and reskilling and, uh, and, and, um, uh, and the findings of, of the study that, that uh, was recently completed. Uh, Biljana, the floor is yours. Thank you, Zora. Can you hear me? It's working. And uh, I'm going to present the works of uh, Prime Point Partners and also some of the initiatives that we have been working on. But let me first say thanks to Professor Sasha for having us here, and uh, we are proud to be a partner uh, of uh, Balkan Eco Economic Forum uh, in this conference. Uh, obviously, the private sector and the, Europe, and the international donors are leading the way and are showing the way to everyone of how things should be done in the uh, areas of reskilling and upskilling uh, employees and, and youth. Um, we have been very lucky as a company to work uh, for the past almost three years with the EBRD on developing a flagship project in the eastern part of Macedonia together with a private uh, anchor company, Mac Progress. You know it by the brand of Vincini. Uh, this is a 700 uh, people company with um, more than exports to more than 50 countries internationally and one of the biggest uh, confectionery producers. Uh, in the region. Uh, they, together with EBRD, had envisioned this uh, training center, a uh, state-of-the-art training center in the eastern part of this small town in underdeveloped region to drive innovation, to drive economic development for the entire region. We were the implementing partner of this project that we are truly proud of. And now, at this point of time, we have two academies running there, executive management training, uh, certified one, the first certified training academy for managers in Macedonia. Uh, we have a technical training for food pro, uh, pro production specialists. Also, as of next year, it's going to be the first certified such training in the country, uh, facilitating the needs of trained staff for the, uh, in, for the emerging food producers uh, and new companies in this sector from the entire region, and a dual education uh, element to this because they have an R&D center in their premises and they're welcoming uh, students from the entire region, from the high schools, which are being trained uh, in this uh, R&D facility. Um, in addition to this uh, 
initiative, we have been working on different projects with international donors that are related to either developing skill centers or uh, internal programs for upskilling and reskilling. For instance, we have been working with the UNDP on developing or establishing two different uh, skills development centers. One is in Tetovo called Future Skills Center, focused on uh, training professionals in construction and textile industry. The other one is in Gostivar, it's called ICANN, and they're developing programs for digital skills and ICT skills to the youth of this region. And something that has recently uh, happened in Ohrid, and we are very thankful to Noah for mentioning us and coming to our event, to Rosalia as well, and to everyone here who was in Ohrid at the inaugural summit, uh, which was the kickoff of our project for upskilling and reskilling people from the Ohrid and the region in the area of um, blue technology and green technology, technologies that are needed to clean the waters and clean the lake uh, and to help the sustainable development of the region. Uh, this project is implemented together with the German uh, institution, GIS. This is something that we have done uh, so far and gained uh, insights and input from and learned uh, so much from these experiences. And also together with the Helvetos uh, uh, organization, we have developed a research, a survey in Macedonia on the level of uh, reskilling and upskilling, so the context in the country, what are the companies doing in this uh, area, and where the world is going, and what are we doing as a country to catch up with the world in this uh, segment. So let me very quickly present some of the findings from this uh, survey. Uh, generally, globally speaking, the big companies are those who all have internal um, programs for upskilling and reskilling. And they have all mentioned that these programs are helping them increase productivity, uh, employee retention, and customer satisfaction, profitability, because when you internally reskill or upskill employees, then you don't need to recruit new people. And this is something that helps you on the way to reduce the, your costs for recruitment and onboarding of a new staff. However, something has happened during the pandemic, during the COVID crisis, which initiated two different very important processes in the upskilling and reskilling areas. The first one was that uh, it, prior to COVID, upskilling and reskilling were part of HR, of this department. And during COVID crisis, they became uh, elevated on a corporate level. So the CEO and the board uh, was deciding about the strategic direction that the company needs to undertake in order to follow up with respect to upskilling and reskilling. And the second one was that, something that Vesna already mentioned, it is better to have a flexible workforce. Because with a flexible workforce, one day they can work one thing and the other day they can work on another thing, meaning that they can adjust easily to the business models that were changing during uh, the COVID crisis. Uh, flexible workforce means flexible mindset. So these are people who, are, who do not have a fixed mindset, that they have this fixed skill set, and this is what I'm doing, this is my job description. But these are people who can be easily trained to undertake additional work, so more on the open mindset uh, issue, and this is how they were able to retrain them. There is something also called cross-skilling meaning that uh, this day you're, you're going to be working on this machine, but if something happens in the other production process, you're able to cross-skill and to undertake that work as well. And we have examples of cross-skilling happening in Macedonia as well, in particular in Mac Progress, the company and this training that I mentioned. Um, Amazon, for instance, has undertaken a massive uh, reskilling program over the pandemic of uh, retraining 100,000 warehouse employees, and more than that, uh, to become coders, like basic coders. And this is an uh, electronic platform that has been working well for them, and this is how they were able to very quickly shift uh, towards different uh, business models. And now let's go back to Macedonia and to the local context. Um, instead of here innovating and developing programs to, you know, to drive change uh, and to drive and to go to the future, to look into the future, we are trying to catch up uh, with the lack of qualified staff, which has been identified as the biggest problem uh, among the companies here. For instance, uh, this year, the Economic Chamber has conducted a research uh, among the companies that are members of the Economic Chamber, and 65% of them stated that they cannot find qualified staff for their needs to cater their, their needs. Uh, the brain drain and the lack of qualified staff was something that has driven Mac Progress as well to develop these internal academies and to train their staff. So going back to the survey I mentioned before, uh, we, our team has interviewed uh, around 20 big companies 
from Macedonia uh, in the different areas such as ICT, pharmaceuticals, uh, BP outsourcing, and auto automotive. So we have diff a good sample of different industries and uh, the manufacturing also, the manufacturing industry. And 90% um, of them have internal programs for reskilling and upskilling. So this is a lot of companies having internal pro programs for upskilling and reskilling. Um, however, most of them are coaching or mentoring on the job training. And 70% of them re reported that they have instructor-led training, meaning that you have a specific, specific program led by instructor and he's training you with a certain specific uh, time frame. Uh, the reason why they needed to develop these internal programs was that they lacked the uh, technical skills of the staff coming in from universities or from different other jobs that they needed to be retrained. And upon the completion of this program, they mentioned that their productivity and, the, and uh, employee retention has increased because you're investing in your employees and they're becoming more satisfied with the work that they're doing. Um, the, there, there are problems and obstacles that these companies had faced, and I will just mention uh, three of them. The first problem mentioned by the companies, and these were mostly HR managers, they said that it was difficult, it is difficult for them to convince the CEO to invest in long-term programs for upskilling and reskilling. So there is a struggle to position this on a corporate level, on the board level. Uh, because they're expensive and you don't see the return on investment immediately, it's a long-term process and so on and so forth. So most of them do it out of necessity. We don't have people for this uh, project or this team, we need to train them now. It's not a strategic decision, unlike some very good examples that we uh, heard before. Um, the second reason and the second obstacle is that they cannot find ready and available training providers and solutions on the market that are tailored to their needs. So they need to develop these internal academies. However, to have an internal academy means that you need to have good trainers, instructors. You need to have the methodology how to do it, to do the training needs assessment, to have evaluation, monitoring, su success indicators in place, to follow up on the process. So it is a lengthy process. It's not just to provide the training. And they need uh, knowledge with respect to the content, the delivery of the training, and it's not easy to develop internal trainers to become instruct instructors. So these are the obstacles that they're facing. They need institutional support in developing this process of how to follow these internal programs for upskilling and reskilling to make them scalable, to make them successful, and to make them efficient. And at the end, to have some specific success uh, indicators that are being uh, measured. And the third one was that they all reported that if they have an e-learning e platform, it's going to be, make their life easier because um, these trainings are repetitive. And without this e-learning uh, platform or, or a digital platform, uh, it becomes more costly. This is, there is a big cost to develop this digital platform uh, at the first place, but then on the long term, it's going to be providing the benefits to everyone. Uh, however, this is uh, a matter of uh, each company to internally develop such digital platforms to assess the training needs continuously of the staff, to provide them with modules that can be viewed by the employees at their own time, not necessarily at a certain point of time, but the employees can look at these modules at any given time uh, when they have you know, uh, availability to do so, and then to follow up on their uh, progress of uh, upskilling and reskilling. So definitely, in the conclusion, the foreign companies are leading the way in this area. However, we do have some amazing Macedonian examples, such as Sivus, Mik uh, Microsum from Prelab, Mac Progress from Vinica, Alkaloid, uh, Task Force, and, uh, and so on and so forth. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Bilana. I know that you're excited and you can continue. But then I would be uh, uh, then criticized for favorizing, by giving you more time than the others. Apologies so. about that. All right. Uh, so, uh, um, Anna, uh, going back to you, uh, what were the main challenges and what are the main challenges for you uh, with respect to retraining and reskilling um, of, uh, of the people who traditionally were in, involved in um, um, industries which are disappearing? In your case, mining. Uh, I assume that these are people which are, you know, they are um, older, they are, you know, coming from the previous world, uh, so to speak. So um, 
Are these people trainable? Can you really transform them? Can you really make productive labor force from those which are, again, lacking the skills which are needed uh, in the contemporary world? I think that everything is possible, but it's definitely not easy. Because like I mentioned before, at the beginning, it was really hard to build all those programs because also our community, our city and our region wasn't ready for this. So at the beginning when we started to launch our programs, like I was really sad. There was like three people hanging there and we were just like, oh, we put so much effort to do something and now really three people? And like the first and second year was really so-so, but I, uh, I can say that don't give up because there were three and five and 10 and 20, but today when we launch a new program, we have like so much uh, applicants that we can't take them all. And uh, regarding those uh, minors, and I think that with uh, everything depends on the perspective and uh, we can say that those are the people that will work at the startup companies, but uh, together with the, with the municipality, we managed to create a model where we can scan the skills of those typical person because we are not talking like just the miners. There are also engineers sure. and uh, a lot of people, they had a lot of knowledge. And how we can now do the spin-offs regarding to their knowledges within the company and how they can actually develop their skills. Okay, because those are people that are older, maybe, but uh, there is also a lot of people that are still young. And uh, with the young people, it's definitely is easier to work with because they are more open. But with the right attitude, we manage to also encourage those people to think brighter, to think that there is, no, there is no mindset that nothing is possible. That was at the beginning when we started to talk about uh, all these changes that are coming. But today also a lot of older people are coming to our place. They are looking for help. For help. We had like 80 years old uh, men which developed their own uh, startup, some game. And at his age, he came to Sasha Incubator and we helped them to grow their, his business at the age of 80. So I think that the age is not the, any barrier. No. Amazing. Amazing. Um, um, it's amazing that, you know, again, people in their 80s are still open to, to learn new ideas and, and that uh, um, life uh, doesn't stop when, when your company goes bust and, and, and when you're um, uh, out of business, but um, so and it's, uh, another amazing thing is that the municipality of Velenia recognized that need uh, for the um, and, and they were the, the driver of that um, uh, transformative process uh, uh, of, of the workforce uh, in your municipality. But uh, Mladene, going back to your uh, statement about the real challenge, you know, to uh, to leverage basically the formal education system and, and, and to establish, I would say, more productive cooperation uh, to ensure that basically uh, uh, that that's, uh, uh, the formal education system produces the um, um, the skill sets that that you need, or at least produces the base that you can then, uh, as we discussed uh, 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 last night, you know, like um, um, the the semi-precious stones that would be brushed and, 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 and profiled by, uh, by you. What is the key challenge? Is it the professors? Is it the curriculum? Is it the education policy? Or what actually prevents the education system to adjust to, um, um, to the current technological pace? It's all of the above. <laughs> so, uh, a little bit of everything. I, uh, 
my personal opinion, I don't want to criticize them uh, that much. We're not gonna play the bl play games, blame games, but uh, it, it seems to me that it's a, it's, a, it's a rigid and stale system that is very, very hard to change. The, the, the other problem with that, even if they do change, the, the first benefits we as a, as a private sector would feel would be after three or four or five years, I, I can't tell. But uh, by that time, we already went two steps further away. So it feels they keep lagging behind and that the distance becoming wider and wider if we continue this way. The, it's, it's like any, I'm trying not to criticize too much. I'm so therefore I'm picking the words. But uh, I, I, I think the dual education might be uh, a very good start. And if the, the private sector would be, I mean, we try to cooperate in terms of bringing the machines to the school and everything, but it, it, there's no liability to there. It's not used properly and we, we don't gain anything. So the other approach is what we did, creating an internal academy and what I see happening all over the place. And basically I think it's, it's the future. If any company would like to position itself in the future labor market, I think it should establish some sort of academy or look to outsource some, that, that need to someone else. So formal education might not become obsolete. We still need it. We paid for them, like Dragana said. But I honestly, I'm a little bit pessimistic. I, I can't see it uh, being reaching the potential that we need. Uh, uh, Dragana, um, um, from um, um, from your perspective as a development finance institution, what are the things that you can uh, that can be done at the policy level to basically to to stimulate this change process, uh, both on the side of uh, our governments, which are which are uh, the creators, I would say, of education policy. Maybe Sasha would, would, would not be happy with this term, but maybe the, the time is ripe for upskilling of the, of the formal education system. And um, 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 Dragana, what's your, what's your view on this? Well, I already uh, made some, some remarks in this respect when, in, the, in the first round, but I just wanted also to follow up on, on what, um, um, what we just heard in terms of you know, the, the fact that you know, with, by the time the education system introduces some new uh, developments into the curricula, we're already two years ahead, and this is why, indeed, I think the dual education is, is really a solution to this problem for these uh, fast-paced technologies. Uh, but also, uh, and this is, this is really going to be a challenge now, uh, uh, introducing more soft skill learning, basically learning how to learn. This is what we keep you know, hearing and, and, and uh, talking about, that actually uh, the challenge and, and the, what the future workforce, what the future pupils should actually would, you know, benefit from most in school is to learn how to learn. And this, is, this really resonates with what we've heard from the, from the other speakers. Obviously, this is a step away from the traditional uh, approach approach to formal education in our in our region uh, it's uh, it's I don't I'm afraid it's not <laughs> on the on the on the menu anywhere I mean this kind of uh, ideally of course we should kind of introduce more interactive more innovative approaches to teaching and you know as uh, we were discussing also last night you were saying we spent 14 years teaching children not to think and to just you know memorize what <laughs> what you know is in the books and then we all of a sudden expect them to come you know to work and be uh, you know kind of you know full of ideas and innovative and and uh, and think uh, creatively about uh, resolving uh, pro solving problems. So, uh, but I think that you know what what we're doing. I, I think this is uh, this is uh, the only thing we can be doing now, which is really bringing together and creating platforms for uh, the the uh, education policymakers to hear what is needed and to kind of open this uh, channel of communication and of, of trust primarily uh, in, from both sides to the other. Uh, and I think this is this is one of the greatest challenges. We have, a, for example, an example in, in Jordan, my colleagues uh, were very successful in, uh, in setting up um, this kind of uh, platform for skills platform uh, uh, 
uh, in the tourism sector. It was really private sector led. So it was an EBRD client who was facing this problem, who thought, okay, let's really try to make a difference, a change in the education system, because we need, you know, different, we need, you know, qualified workers for the sector, which is, you know, providing, I don't know, which percentage of the GDP in, in Jordan as well. And they were very successful. It was painful. It was a long process. It, it's still ongoing. But they managed to, you know, from a very private sector initiative, from gathering the, you know, uh, these like-minded uh, companies uh, and uh, strengthening their voice to, to such extent that, you know, finally they uh, they managed to, to communicate and to influence the, the policymakers to actually introduce the necessary changes into the into the education system. So I think that uh, things uh, uh, can be done. Uh, it's not going to be easy. It's not going to happen overnight. But uh, this is a long-lasting <laughs> process and effort. Uh, thanks, Dragana. Vesna, uh, uh, we know, um, I mean, from reading all these reports, uh, McKinsey talks about it, you know, World Economic Forum talks about it. Techno technology is changing, you know, uh, 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 the jobs of today. And new jobs would be created. But they say we don't know what kind of jobs will be created. But we, we can anticipate what kind of skill sets people would need to have in order to be able to be competitive at the time when, 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 when these new jobs would, would appear. So those individuals that, uh, and companies which are, which are sending their people over uh, to your programs, which companies, individuals which would like to future-proof themselves, right? Um, what is the current demand, I mean, for what kind of jobs are, are uh, or what kind of training programs are in demand for what professions, for what... Uh, uh, for, for, for what types of jobs? I agree. It's really, uh, it's really difficult maybe to, to estimate, but uh, currently I try to make this very precisely. Uh, some of the most demanded uh, job roles uh, currently are, for example, web developers, data science, data analysts, so everything uh, related to data management, cloud technologies, of course, um, then we have, uh, I've already mentioned uh, the digital marketing, for example, going along with every single business today. Cybersecurity is something that is kind of threatening um, uh, data protection and data privacy. So uh, when it comes to technical skill, this is the palette of, of uh, professions. Uh, of course, this uh, is always accompanied by a new, more business tech roles, such as business analysts, uh, project managers. So project managers are really, really in demand right now. And all kinds of profiles that uh, means problem solving and inter interpersonal, let's say, uh, skills, people skills, because this is something that will eventually come uh, as the result of, of uh, this uh, explosion of new roles. Thank you, Vesna. Uh, Bilana, uh, in addition to your um, uh, work uh, in um, um, delivering these uh, programs specific to, to, uh, 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 to certain industries and, and companies, you're also te teaching as, uh, uh, leadership uh, skills. Uh, what are the soft skills which are, uh, where do you see the gaps uh, with regard to the soft skills of, uh, of, uh, um, of the workforce uh, um, in Macedonia? Yes, thanks. Uh, thanks, Zoran. That was something that I also wanted to mention uh, in respect to what we discussed before. Um, when the companies are looking for, uh, to train people, they're training them for technical skills. But when they interview them, they're looking for the soft skills. And the soft skills are prevailing at the interviews. And uh, you talked about the education system and how our, t our, our kids, uh, the pupils, how do you call them, students, in school they learn how to memorize things, how to just keep it quiet and not say anything and be quiet all the time. And they're completely killed with respect to their soft skills, which is communication and uh, presenting themselves, having self-confidence, being a leader. So we try to kill every single leadership initiative that they might have 
And at the end of the day, when they come, you know, employed at companies or you want to hire them, you're saying he doesn't have conceptual skills, he doesn't have leadership skills, he doesn't have communication skills. He, he's staring at the floor when he's talking to you. And what we did uh, in Vinica at this uh, training center, we also included the soft skills training or leadership and communication skills. And we felt this, uh, this uh, on ourselves when we were discussing with the people who were attending this uh, training. You know, their humility, uh, their lack of confidence in what they stand for, these amazing people, these amazing professionals. They were running companies of 200, 300 people, you know, trying to make it there in eastern part of the country, not having self-confidence to stand up and present themselves. And those people who do not have any kind of uh, professionalism or whatever needed to make it there, they are there and they do have the self-confidence. And this is what bothers me in our society and in our community where, you know, mm, we do not put value where it is, but we are just looking for someone of peer purposes, somebody who wants to just present themselves and you know, take photos and whatever. So we saw true value in these people who are the drivers of the economic value in the region. And now we are trying to equip them with the soft skills needed for them to really stand out there, to be the leaders that the region deserves them to be. And yes, this is the reason why I have this passion in leadership and uh, helping them with their soft skills uh, to be trained. And I sincerely believe that soft skills need to be introduced uh, as of kindergarten. This is my belief. In the kindergarten, the students, uh, kids need to be taught how to be leaders. So what is a leader and how they need to drive change, be creative and speak to a public and talk openly and express their creativity uh, out there. So it, it's up to our... Uh, education system destroying us when it, when it comes to soft skills and then the companies are needing us to have the soft skills to be able to resolve problems and the conceptual skills are those that are mostly in demand now. So you can have all the technical skills you, you can acquire but you, if you don't have conceptual skills to put everything into perspective and to see where the world is going, you will be not much uh, like just a, a simple data analyst. Thanks, Biljana. Uh, 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 um, Mladen wants to say something, but let me ask Sasha, uh, uh, how, uh, how do we stand uh, 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 wrapping up? Okay, uh, Mladen. Uh. It's just going to be real quick. It, it comes it come to my mind uh, regarding the educational system. Uh, suggestion would be enrolling quotas as well, because it seems to me that we're educating a ton of young people for the professions they're obsolete. For example, what gave me an idea? My niece uh, decided to study demographic demographics or demographic studies. And I, I wasn't lazy, so I look around. There, there is a program in Novi Sad, in Belgrade, in Kragovac, and in Pristina slash Kosovska Mitrovica. So about 80 kids a year decided to study demographic studies. How many demographs does Serbia need a year? So that's 70 of them wasted in, in a way. So that could be a, maybe an initial step for, sorry for taking. Or maybe uh, one or two questions? One, two, one, two, test. Seven, seven, eight years to see what skills they have, if they are extrovert, introvert, where they want to go. That's the personal stuff. Where they want to go in um, high school, where they want to go in college. I did a case study four years ago with career consulting. I questionnaire 500 um, young kids five months before deciding what do we want to study for college, fourth year high school. They didn't know where they are going, they didn't know nothing. Half of them, they decided two weeks prior. That's catastrophic. So career consulting, I think the way to go. Thanks. Um. <laughs> Last question. Um, this, uh, this comment inspired me about uh, 
you know, this change process, Bilana said, um, um, this culture creation should start from, uh, from kindergartens. I would also add um, the, um, that we, we need to change as, uh, as families, as, 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 uh, as, uh, as parents. Um, um, there is a guy, uh, uh, and the son of my brother, who is a Sasha, a Sasha knows him well, uh, who's um, he's 15 years old and he's uh, already making more than 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 his uh, parents, uh, and uh, but his mother is still pushing him to finish his uh, homework in Macedonian language and and, and not uh, doing what what he's doing. And I'm not going going to tell you what he's doing. And, and uh, uh, another example, uh, Bilan and I we were part of an organization called Macedonia 2025. And there, there is a guy called Chris Pavlovsky. Uh, uh, somebody heard about it? Chris Pavlovsky is, Macedon uh, uh, is a Macedonian Zuckerberg. You know, um, he owns a platform called Rumble, who, uh, uh, who got sold a couple of months ago for $2.1 uh, billion, dollars, uh, and he's listed in NASDAQ. And I remember visiting him about 10 years ago, and when he fa uh, his father told me that the guy left school when he was 17, imagine. You're a father of a super talented boy, and, and he, he tells you, I'm not going to school anymore. So, again, um, are we still, as parents, you know, looking for diplomas so, so that our, our children are, you know, uh, uh, university graduates and masters and PhDs, or we are looking for, we would expect from our kids to get the skills that would, uh, again, make them competitive, uh, skills that were make them future proof basically for, for the future. So I would end here. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. And I hope uh, you enjoy. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Martinovsky. Thank you, dear panelists. Ten minutes to five. Friday afternoon, very bad conditions outside and nobody is still sleeping. <laughs> That's confirmation that you, great, uh, you made a great job, Mr. Joseph, choosing the topics and the panels. I'm very glad to be your host today and also to be the moderator of the last final panel for today under the uh, title Policy Making Innovations in the Balkans. I will use the opportunity to take a seat on this comfortable chair, armchair, and to invite also uh, Ms. Alie Taigun from the development team of the Cyprus Forum. Ms. Taigun, please. We have only two speakers here. break, two minutes only break, in, in order to go on uh, live on the YouTube channel. Okay. Thank you very much, Sasha. Thank you very much for your patience. I promise we will not be uh, boring. We will go faster by now, but <laughs> stay with us, please. It's OK? You have, you have the presentation? Mm -hmm. I will ask you.
to find your site for the presentation, you start with Stefan, if, if it's no problem for you. Or you, will, you want to be here, but I, I need more time to, to find it. Mm -hmm. To start with you? You insist? Okay. Okay. Uh, we will start uh, with uh, Ms. Alia Taigun. And before that, I will give a short uh, introduction for the topic. The Western Balkan agenda is in, on innovation, research, education, culture, youth, and sport. By one title, uh, the Innovation Agenda outlines a comprehensive long-term strategy for cooperation with the Western Balkans. It contributes to social and economic development and regional cooperation in the Western Balkans, building on the overall EU support for a rapid restart of the region's economy and the ongoing accession process. The innovation agenda is a key element in delivering the innovation component of the economic and investment plan. In recent years, the Western Balkan countries have made some important efforts to overcome the negative consequences of the economic and poli political transition and its impact on the region's research and innovation sectors. They adopted a variety of strategies, laws and programs to improve the performance of the sector on the national level and they improved the regional cooperation in research and development, for example, by committing themselves to Western Balkan Regional Research and De Development Strategy for Innovation. However, social and political problems are still more pressing in West Balkan, Western Balkan countries than the low level of research and development investments. For example, uh, Serbia and Montenegro together spend on around 1% of GDP on research and development, while other countries in the region spend up to 0.3% of GDP of support for technology transfer activities. So there is no doubt that the importance of the education, research and innovation for the over, overall success of the European integration efforts of the Western Balkans. This is short introduction and I hope this is enough for uh, to take a, a speech, uh, please, Miss uh, uh, Taigun, take a speech. So first of all, I would like to congratulate dear Sasha for taking the initiative to organize such an excellent uh, conference and as, as Cyprus Forum, we are very glad to be part of this. Uh, so over the last decade, uh, we can observe a universal tendency towards an increased civic participation in policymaking all over the world. In terms of policymaking innovations in Cyprus, uh, we are making, uh, following other more mature democracies, we are making efforts to shift to a participatory democracy by utilizing such tools like regulated lobbying, uh, open parliament, live streaming within the plenary sessions, um, public consultations and e-petitions. And in 2019, the very first parliamentary observatory in Cyprus, a NOMA platform, was launched by Oxygono, a non-governmental organization uh, focusing on policymaking innovations in Cyprus. Uh, as a politically independent initiative, a NOMA platform aims to increase transparency by offering, the cities, by offering citizens the opportunity to be directly and validly monitor the processes carried out within the Cypriot parliament. Have the presentation for Ms. Taigun? Not yet, so within one, two minutes we will have it. One minute.
Yes. Um, so at normal platform, every citizen, in addition to having access to the procedures of the submission, discussion, and voting of pending bills, and summaries of the parliamentary debates and committees, uh, they can also receive daily news on the processes carried out within the Cypriot Parliament uh, and refer to the biographical data of each MP. We also monitor the progress of uh, all pending bills from the day they are submitted to the Parliament until the day they are put on vote by the plenary of the House. By supervising the legislative process, uh, we, be we believe that we put positive pressure on MPs and promote transparency within the legislative body of Cyprus. So, um, there are three main steps that explain how our parliamentary observatory basically works. Here, as you can see, uh, there are three steps. First one, data collection. Our team collects all the data related to the work of the parliament. Then step two, archiving. Uh, data is uploaded, archived, and indexed on our platform. And the final step is distribution, where the information becomes immediately available online to every citizen and organization. So, normal platform is also available on mobile phones via an app. Uh, through normal app and easy to use application, uh, citizens have the opportunity to be constantly informed about all legislative actions, subscribe to the newsletter and activate push notifications. So, when we look at the normal platform in numbers, uh, we have 30,000 plus users, uh, 50,000 plus uh, sessions, uh, the number of people visiting the website, uh, 120,000 plus page views, uh, the average connection duration is 2 hours and 20 minutes, uh, we have 800 plus uh, pending bills, 1,100 plus articles, 850 plus newsletter subscriptions, uh, 300 plus application downloads, uh, and as you can see, 54% uh, of our users are men, while uh, 46 are women. Three years after the launch of Noma Platform, this year we launched Noma Press. Uh, we aspire for Noma Press to be a truly independ independent political magazine in high quality standards with the aim of bringing active citizens, techno technocrats, academics, and the media closer to policymaking. And finally, uh, in addition to the existing functions, uh, the platform will eventually integrate um, some additional services, such as statistics and infographics, including the number of law proposals submitted by each MP and party, Analysis on the bills submitted by each ministry, how many of them pass, uh, trending issues, uh, what each MP votes for, etc. Uh, it also seeks to include information notes on important legislation as well as opportunities uh, to hold informational discussions, consultations and submission of recommendations. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Taigun, for presenting so your innovative normal Trump. platform and how does it work. And now I'm inviting Mr. Stefanos Lokopoulos, co-founder, director of Vuli Watch from Greece. We will have uh, his speech online. Mr. Lokopoulos, greetings from Skopje. The stage Hi. is yours. Hi. Thank you. Thank you very much for um, the kind invitation. It's my pleasure to be with you even though virtually today, unfortunately, I couldn't be there physically. So I'm, uh, I'm not an economist, neither am I involved in any way in the business sector, uh, but I know this much. A key factor to fair and uh, just economic growth and development is a stable political system. A political system which is based on solid rule of law and democratic foundations. And the key to achieving this is through the establishment of accountable and 
um, trans transparent institutions. One of these is Parliament. As you all know, Parliament is undoubtedly known as the guardian of democracy, the guardian of the, of the rights and interests of citizens. It is the amplifier that carries the often diverse voices and concerns of ordinary people all the way to the top of the decision-making pyramid. Of equal, if not greater importance, is its role as the guarantor of democratic equilibrium within a given political system. In other words, its oversight over the executive branch is, in essence, the only institutional means through which citizens can exert control over government, over the executive. So basically, parliament is what makes democracy work. Now, this was obviously an over-romanticized and embellished description, a fantasy, if you like, of, of what parliament should be. The reality, unfortunately, can sometimes be very far from this idyllic picture that I just painted. In fact, if we look um, closer, we often encounter cases where parliaments do not really legislate, but just ratify, where members of parliament prioritize the interests of the party or big business over the ones of their constituents where adherence to the party line is more important than the free will of members of parliament. We encounter parliaments whose um, political makeup or constitution impedes them from really differentiating themselves from the executive and hence jeopardize the separation of powers, therefore weakening considerably their role as, as an oversight body. So we have parliaments that are inflexible to change, technophobic, averse to openness, inclusion, and, we and weary of cooperation with civil society. Parliaments that are strangers to transparency, accountability, and integrity. For parliaments, therefore, to have a truly impactful role as an oversight and legislative institution representative of its citizens, and also for it to um, secure a stable political system and for parliaments to gain the necessary legitimacy and recognition both from the people but also other institutions it firstly needs to create the right conditions for gaining trust after all how can an institution be trusted to perform oversight when the institution itself is not trustworthy so, transparency, accountability, and openness are therefore fundamental towards gaining the legitimacy and trust of citizens, which will then most likely lead to meaningful public engagement and a more stable political environment. So, in other words, transparency, accountability, and openness foster the public's trust in parliaments as institutions. And this trust is the very foundation upon which a culture of impactful public engagement can be built. And this is exactly where parliamentary monitoring organizations, such as Nomo Platform or Vuli Watch, might come in handy. So now I'm going to briefly present you with Vuli Watch's work in Greece, which is centered around restoring legitimacy of parliament increasing its transparency and openness standards, and facilitating citizen engagement and participation. In other words, we want to save Parliament, even if sometimes Parliament doesn't really want to. And this is how um, we do it. So to be, I'm going to try and um, uh, share my screen with you now um, so that I can present you with uh, my um, work at uh, Vuli Watch. Um, just bear with me for a second. All 
All right. So. I assume that my screen is visible to everyone. Uh, if not, please do feel free to uh, interrupt me. So, um, Vuli Watch is a parliamentary monitoring organization, a watchdog, a transparency watchdog organization, which was uh, established in Athens in Greece in 2014. Our role, as I said earlier on, is to promote accountability, transparency, and trust in uh, uh, Parliament. We do all this uh, through the use of civic technology. For those of you who are not aware of the term civic technology, civic technology refers to um, uh, digital tools which are built so as to for the benefit of the people and which facilitate uh, transparency, participation and overall oversight. So it's a, it's a facilitator for a bottom-up approach in, in politics. So we, our main tool, therefore, is vuliwatch.gr, which is a platform um, which consists of a series of tools. Um, each tool has its own uh, function. For instance, here you can see um, a dynamic graph of the uh, constitution of the Greek uh, parliament. It's a dynamic graph because people can hover their mouses over the dots and uh, explore, see, get to know their members of parliament. Once um, you can also uh, filter, use a series of filters in order to um, find the parliamentary uh, member of parliament that you'd be interested in uh, exploring. Uh, filters such as the committees that he's active in, um, the party that he belongs to, the constituency that he represents and so on. So once you pick a, a, a member of parliament, what we've done is that we've created a dedicated, a dedicated profile, something like social media, for each and every one of them. In this profile, one can see all sorts of information, um, such as the graph that you can see in front of you is a uh, timeline, if you like, of uh, a politician's um, history in politics, so you can see the political parties that he's been a member of, you can see when he was elected, you can see uh, potentially any uh, ministerial or government positions that uh, they might have held. Moreover, you can uh, find his CV and also um, an analysis of their asset declarations, uh, which we digitalize and present in this format and also in more detail, but I'm not going to tire you with more uh, screens. On top of that, in the uh, profiles of each member of parliament, as you scroll down, uh, you have something of a feed, a feed where you can see the latest activity of, of a given uh, parliamentarian. Here, for instance, you can see how they voted in, in uh, some uh, bills um, that came to parliament. Also, you can um, explore uh, the parliamentarian's uh, parliamentary activity. You can see, uh, for instance, the amount of questions that he's asked over the years. You can see also the um, topics that he has been more engaging with. For instance, you can see in this case that this particular member of parliament has been particularly interested in uh, issues relevant to the economy, um, to the justice system. Um, and here we basically it's the number of questions that he's posing regarding these issues. Furthermore, and this is where the um, participatory aspect of our project comes in, we've given the chance to uh, citizens, because as you know, we live in the digital era and everyone's on their phone all the time uh, and, they're, uh, and on the internet, we've given them therefore the chance to um, uh, communicate with their members of parliament, send them questions, uh, send them policy proposals, or express uh, certain problems that uh, they face in their constituencies. So the forum that you can see in front of you facilitates citizens to determine who is the best, the most suitable actually member of parliament that they can send their question to. Again, there is a series of filter, filters that helps citizens do that. 
They can filter their MPs according to their constituency, the political party they belong to, and most importantly, the committee that they're acting on. So once this question is um, drafted by the citizen, it goes through a, uh, an internal check, if you like, um, by our team. Uh, we've got a code of conduct, and we do these checks because we don't want to, um, we want to create a safe space of dialogue, of civilized dialogue between citizens and politicians, and therefore um, we vet questions so as to avoid racist or sexist or insultive uh, comments. So once the question is uploaded, the Member of Parliament receives a notification. And on your left-hand side, you can see a question. And on the right-hand side, you can see the answer of a Member of Parliament. Both questions and answers are public and available on the profile of the Members of Parliament. And also, citizens have the right, can, through this platform, um, rate, evaluate uh, the questions, the answers, sorry, of the Members of Parliament. So this was the first main tool, facilitating the communication between citizens and MPs, but also allowing citizens to be uh, aware of what their members of parliament actually do in parliament, because it's a matter of trust, as I said in my introduction. The second aspect of our work is quite similar to NOMO Platform's work. We, in this section called Vote Watch, we uh, register all uh, bills that are voted in parliament, in this section, citizens can filter again um, the bills that they want to see uh, according to the thematic, whether it could be an economy or foreign relations or uh, uh, migration issues. And once they click on the uh, uh, bill that they're interested in, we provide them with a, um, a presentation of the main points of the bill, but also an analysis of each and every article. And mind you, Often legislation is written for lawyers, by lawyers, in legalese, what we call legalese. So what we do is we try to um, uh, make each uh, article of the bill in, uh, you know, translate it, if you like, in more layman's terms so that everyone can be aware. And we also present the uh, actual, uh, in cases of roll call votes, we, we present the actual results and we show how each member of parliament uh, voted for a particular bill. Um, or in addition, um, another important aspect of our, of our work is opening data, opening parliamentary data. So what we do here is that we uh, provide citizens with a series of time filters so that they can compare the uh, legislative work of parliament over time or um, maybe they want to analyze a specific uh, time period. So here you can see, it, for instance, for the period um, that is, um, I don't know, from October 15 to April 18, you can see um, how many bills were voted in Parliament, how many international agreements were signed, and the like. Moreover, you can see how each parliamentary group, uh, the extent to which what, uh, these parliamentary groups were active, so you can see how many questions they posed and the like, um, and also the main topics that were um, uh, in the spotlight in Parliament during that specific period. And finally, you can also see the most active, uh, the top 10 of the most active members of Parliament. The other tool that we provide citizens is called Policy Monitor, and this is a tool that is useful for, I think, um, both citizens, businesses and whoever else is interested, because what it does is that it compares the political party's positions on given um, thematics and policy areas. For instance, here um, uh, you can see um, uh, the positions of political parties regarding uh, the uh, social security system and, uh, and labor law, for instance. And you can choose the political parties that you want to compare and so that citizens can have a more complete image of what uh, to expect from the parties, but also to hold them accountable um, throughout uh, their tenure in government or presence in parliament. Thank you very much for your um, time. I hope you're still awake. Thank <clears throat> you.
Thank you very much, Mr. Lukopoulos. Please stay with us for any possible questions. Thank you also, Ms. Taigun. Uh, I would like to uh, just a short remark uh, that uh, Mr. Lukopoulos said that the base of, uh, for economic growth is stable political system and transparency in institutions. In the first line, the parliament. And he introduced the platform uh, Vuli Watch. As well, uh, Ms. Taigun uh, present uh, us no more platform, how it, how it works. So if you have uh, any questions, please, uh, it's time to, to invite the audience for any possible questions or comments for the presentation. <laughs> if there is no uh, question, we truly hope that these days for you all shall be the day to remember both from experience sharing perspective, from a variety of professionals, as well as from a life ensuring perspective, because this first Balkan Economic Forum 2022 conference had a lot of to offer. I invite the president of the Balkan Economic Forum, Mr. Sasho Kjosev, to present us the concluding remarks. Mr. Kjosev, please. Concluding remarks, I think we're still here, we're still awake, we're still pretty exhausted, and we are the heroes of the day. Uh, all I can say that is that I'm, I'm greatly thankful to Boris, to Nina, Mariana, to the great volunteers, students at the Faculty of Economics who made this uh, event great. I'm also grateful to sponsors, knowledge science partners, to the Prime Minister of the Government of North Macedonia for, for, the, for, being, uh, for being the the one who really supported us from the very beginning of the conference. Every beginning is uh, difficult. Every first step is always the most, one, the, 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 the most difficult one. We did it today. Uh, you see that I'm kind of falling apart. Uh, but I'm happy that we started, um, I would say, quote me, revolution. Why? Because uh, along or uh, opposite to Open Balkans, Prespa Dialogue, uh, Berlin, Berlin process, and all the, others, all the other political uh, uh, initiatives, we are an initiative of uh, of professionals, experts, of ordinary people who would like to have their voice heard by the politicians, by the ones who kind of uh, describe and uh, impose our destinies. So we want our voice to be heard, we want uh, to give our contribution uh, in order politicians to, let's, let's say, be able to create a um, <laughs> a happier future for us, a future that will be more suitable for our dreams, for our wishes, for our ambitious, ambitions. And uh, here I would like to announce that uh, together with uh, Cyprus Forum, we have a strategic partner, we signed a strategic partnership, and we're planning to have at uh, this first, let's say, round, uh, six, I think, five or six uh, uh, conferences like this, Balkan Economic Forum conferences every year in a different uh, Balkan country. So uh, we still didn't, uh, haven't decided yet where it will take place next year, but I'm sure that there will be plenty of uh, people, plenty of countries who will be willing to share with us uh, the willingness and ambition to, to continue our, the, 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 tradition, the tradition that we started today. Uh, I wouldn't, I, I, I will not speak too much more, so anyway, I would like at least those of you who are, who are, who are the real heroes and who are still feeling alive to join us for, um, how, how shall I call it, like early or late uh, lunch or early dinner here in the premises of the, of the hotel. So please feel free to join us. And I will, you will give me just a couple of minutes, you know, to, to take these promo materials and I will join you. But anyway, 
take your time, refresh, and then let's say meet, let's meet each other in like 10 minutes in the restaurant. Is it okay? Okay. Thank you all for your patience and really Balkans is still alive. Thank you. Thank you. Congratulations, Mr. Kiosef, again. A few words at the end. Balkan Economic Forum shall proceed and give its best to go in line with the, its constant engagement to maintain and upgrade its international recognition. This gathering today proved that the Balkan Economic Forum regional and international reputation are solid ground for the current and further actions. Thank you for your participation and see you next week, as Mr. Joseph said. Next year. Yeah. Next year. Next year. Okay.